and we're live. Okay, good afternoon again, everyone. Thank you uh, for being here for the work group to address police reform and accountability, uh, the House's work group here in Maryland. I am Delegate Vanessa Atterbury, um, chairing this work group. Other members of the work group are on. We have a very packed agenda today, um, starting out with a presentation by the Chiefs and Sheriffs Association. So first, I wanna thank you all uh, for being here. Uh, we will have a 30 minute presentation from you all and then I'll open it up uh, to questions from our members. So since we have a tight schedule, that's all I will say. Uh, and I will turn it over to Chief Morris. Good to see you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Uh, it's, it's always good to see you, ma'am, and members of the work group. I'm Chief David Morris. I'm here with my colleagues today representing the Maryland Chiefs of Police and the Maryland Sheriff's Association. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon on matters of public safety that are critically important to our community. You have our statement outlining our position and we respectfully request that each of you take the opportunity to review our position and know that we look forward to working with each of you as we have in the past. The Maryland Chiefs and Maryland Sheriff's Associations are comprised of executive level law enforcement leadership who have the honor, the privilege and the responsibility of leading the 16,000 men and women who serve as troopers, police officers and deputy sheriffs who selflessly and courageously sacrifice every day in service to their communities. These brave men and women perform a service that many won't do and even more cannot do. And daily they work hard to earn and frankly deserve our collective support and respect. I must address a comment made by an earlier presenter regarding law enforcement and the incident involving George Floyd. As a representative of the Maryland Chiefs and Maryland Sheriffs and law enforcement at large, I am confident in saying every member of law enforcement was appalled by the officer's actions involving George Floyd and agree these actions should not occur anywhere. Any insinuation to the contrary is simply untrue. Please make no mistake, we will not and do not defend the indefensible. The actions of the involved officers are inexplicable and inexcusable. We do not condone these actions, nor do we find them to be a reasonable use of force, and we remain committed to ensuring they do not occur in Maryland. Matters discussed by this work group are extremely important for the citizens of Maryland and law enforcement, and we need to ensure we get them right. The MCPA and MSA Legislative Committee has had the opportunity to work with many of you over several years. In 2015, the Chiefs, and sheriffs worked closely with all interested parties on legislation, which resulted in the passage of House Bill 1016, certainly no small feat. While some recommendations offered by the chiefs and sheriffs were accepted, it was unfortunate that the recommendations for substantive, practical, and constructive change to the LEOBR were not. These more essential recommendations, a total of six, are included in the written statement provided to the work group today, and the Maryland Chiefs and Sheriffs stand by those recommendations. We seemingly find ourselves in a position where society seeks to apply a perfect metric to a police officer while apparently excusing or at least mitigating the behavior of the individual or individuals whose criminal actions drew law enforcement to the scene. Then, as it's been suggested, we expose these officers, their departments, and probably most importantly, their families to the trash can of social media with a proposed mandated wholesale release of personnel investigative records. Even when those investigations exonerate the officer and find their actions to be lawful and justified, this creates a segregated class for one specific employee group. And yet nonetheless, last session, the chiefs and sheriffs worked with Chairman Clippinger, Vice Chair Atterbury, and members of the Judiciary Committee and other members on legislation to authorize the release of personnel and investigative records for complaints involving the discharge of a firearm, complaints involving uses of force resulting in serious bodily injury, and sustained investigative findings that involve an officer's integrity, sexual assault, 
discrimination relating to the reporting and investigation and prosecution of a crime. And although this legislation did not pass, the chiefs and sheriffs believe it would have addressed matters of transparency and improved community trust. It certainly remains our hope to improve accountability and transparency while supporting our officers and protecting due process. I offer these as examples to ensure you that the Maryland chiefs and Maryland sheriffs have been at the reform table before, and we are committed to remaining at the table to work toward common ground. A previous presenter also described the LEOBR as a straitjacket when advocating for its repeal. The LEOBR is an administrative process that provides due process employment rights for both our officers and management. The LEOBR is not the straitjacket. It is collectively bargained agreements that have created alternative hearing boards and alternative disciplinary measures that have altered the original intent of the LEOBR. We respectfully, respectfully refer each of you back to our recommendations that were previously offered as a means to ensure consistent application of the LEOBR, regardless of the jurisdiction served. Managing uses of force by police officers is one of the most difficult challenges facing law enforcement agencies. The responsibility of law enforcement officers to enforce the law, protect the public, and guard their own safety and that of innocent bystanders is very challenging. Interactions with uncooperative subjects who are physically resistant present situations that may quickly deteriorate. Ideally, officers gain cooperation in such situations through the use of verbal persuasion and other de-escalation skills. However, if physical force is necessary and officers use of force to gain control and compliance of the subject in these and other circumstances must be objectively reasonable. As guardians of our community, we expect our officers to make it their top priority to protect those whom we serve from harm while also enforcing the laws of the jurisdiction. Sometimes use of force is unavoidable. In these instances, officers must use only the amount of force that is objectively reasonable to effectively bring an incident under control while protecting the safety of the officer, innocent bystanders, victims, and to every degree possible the suspect we are trying to arrest. Officers must often within split seconds evaluate the totality of the circumstances, including the immediacy of the threat to their safety and others. And they have to do so in circumstances that are tense, uncertain, and rapidly evolving. And yes, we have to get it right if we expect to maintain the trust of those who've entrusted us with the responsibility of providing this essential service to our community. I previously stated that the men and women of Maryland law enforcement deserve our collective support and respect. What they do not deserve is the vile venom that has been spewed at them for months for something for which they were not responsible. This hateful, despicable, despicable and harmful rhetoric only serves to perpetuate an ongoing narrative of distrust that unfairly vilifies our law enforcement officers, humiliating and denigrating good men and women simply because they do the job we ask them to do, while substantially increasing risk to their personal safety and the safety of the communities who need us the most. 25 years ago, President Bill Clinton stated, and I quote, a society that makes war against its police had better learn to make friends with its criminals, end quote. Diversity is what makes our nation beautiful, and we support, defend the most important right of all, that of free speech. However, misperception about facts, especially during a time of crisis, can be extremely dangerous. We know policing is in a period of transition. Law enforcement agencies are finding it hard to recruit and good people are leaving the profession. Seattle's police chief recently resigned because the city council took budget actions without even consulting her. Anne Arundel County's police chief, Tim Altamari, recently retired because he felt he could no longer effectively lead his agency, refusing to yield to political pressure he believed endangered his officers and his community. Our law enforcement officers are good people, getting up and going to work every day, trying to make a difference, protecting their communities and hoping to come home safely to their families. We know that there is misconduct in every profession and those of us in leadership need to ensure we can deal with these acts appropriately. 
We remain thankful and appreciative to the members of this committee and our delegates and senators in the General Assembly for the opportunity this afternoon to speak candidly about the LEOBR, MPIA, use of force, body-worn cameras, recruitment, retention, training, and community engagement opportunities as it remains incumbent upon law enforcement to be transparent, responsible, and willing to dialogue. The Maryland Chiefs and Maryland Sheriff's Associations ask that you be conscientious in your work. We know that you will in taking these recommendations seriously as you develop future legislation. We commend your efforts and we look forward to being part of the discussion. Madam Chair, many thanks. Thank you. Next, Chief Hyatt. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the work group. I'm Melissa Hyatt, Chief of the Baltimore County Police Department. I'd like to start by echoing Chief Morris about the challenges of recruitment and retention. Police departments across the nation are all essentially sharing the same struggles. The pool of qualified candidates applying for careers in law enforcement is limited with multiple departments competing for a finite group of candidates. Experienced officers and commanders are retiring or resigning at increased rates, raising concerns about adequate staffing and also the experienced leadership and maybe more importantly, proper supervision that is needed to meet today's challenges. As leaders, we need to ensure that our officers are enforcing the law fairly and without bias and are held accountable if they don't. As conversations surrounding policy issues Proceed, the officers in all of our agencies are worried about whether they may be unfairly painted with a broad brush and whether they will be able to continue to do the difficult, dangerous job we ask them to do. I've been addressing these concerns with the Baltimore County Council. I've shared concerns about the unintended consequences that can occur if legislation is enacted without thorough consideration, including the collaborative work of all stakeholders. Effective laws must allow for all of the possible circumstances circumstances that we require police officers to handle. They must provide for fair treatment when policies are violated, including corrective action and appropriate discipline, and should not lock down the specific details of training and policy guidelines in areas where policing needs to continually evolve and improve. That theme of continuous improvement is important. When I was appointed chief in June of last year, I stated that my priorities would include strengthening public trust, rethinking oversight and accountability, and enhancing officer training and wellness. In the Baltimore County Police Department, since I was sworn in, we've done multiple things. We've created a director of accountability and compliance who is evaluating components and responsibilities within the organization and compiling recommendations on improvements as appropriate. He's currently assess assessing our internal affairs division. We created a director of diversity and inclusion who's currently leading our efforts to develop an internal blueprint and an external strategy for engagement within the communities we serve. We have reorganized the agency and created a professional standards bureau to strengthen oversight of internal affairs and training. We're working in conjunction with the county administration and have developed a public facing data dashboard which displays crime data and are currently building data dashboards with the number and disposition of complaints, uses of force, and traffic stop data broken down by race. And we participate in and support the work group on equitable policing created by County Executive Olszewski, which has recently expanded into an advisory group and has a focus on potential disparities in policing. Further, we have multiple projects that are underway. We're launching a nationally recognized training program on fair and impartial policing, which will be mandatory for all employees. We're conducting a staffing survey. It's been over 10 years since such an assessment's been done and we continue to operate under stale staffing, supervisory and span of control assumptions. We've also engaged an expert consultant to review our hiring and recruitment practices, including assessing possible discriminatory impacts or practices in testing and background investigations. And finally, in terms of community policing, we've obtained a federal grant for technical assistance to upgrade our use of technology and data and our newly reorganized Community and Support Services Bureau is developing a new department-wide relational policing plan. An important resource that we have in Baltimore County but that is not available to all law enforcement agencies is body-worn cameras. They are very effective at clearly documenting interactions between officers and citizens. And in many cases, they exonerate officers from allegations of wrongdoing. You will hear more from Sheriff Barry about the challenges of implementing a body-worn camera program, particularly in these difficult financial times as the costs are very significant and not all organizations are fortunate enough to be able to secure the necessary funding for this valuable initiative. Finally, I'd like to touch on our use of force policy. The body-worn cameras in our department have been instrumental in providing clear evidence and documentation 
with video and sound about incidents when force is used. The vast majority of the time, we have determined that body-worn camera evidence confirms the reports made by officers and shows commendable patience and skill by our police officers when they're responding to calls and serving the public. And in cases where there are violations of policy by officers, body-worn camera evidence is available to prove those cases as well and to hold those officers accountable. Officers in different agencies are trained to use various techniques to satisfy the best practices and standards for use of force that are issued by the Maryland Police Training and Standards Commission. In fact, in the 1980s, a force continuum approach was generally adopted by law enforcement, and now continuums are being supplemented or in many cases replaced by more effective models like the critical decision-making model, which was created by the Police Executive Research Forum. Other important training components include de-escalation training and implicit bias training. In Baltimore County, we currently incorporate a version of the use of force continuum in our policy, along with critical decision-making components. But this is actually an area that we're presently carefully reviewing to see where we can progress, improve, and strengthen our policies and training. Baltimore County has announced it will sign the Obama Foundation pledge to review and further update our use of force policy with community input. We've also added to department policies the specifically stated concepts of sanctity of life, the duty to intervene and report excessive or unnecessary use of force, and the importance of constitutional policing. While these were already our expectations and were explained in our policy manuals and reinforced in training, we now have them explicitly articulated in policy. As we continue to seek more community dialogue, I'm hopeful that this kind of formal expression will help with our goals of enhancing community trust and confidence. As professionals, our work on improving and evolving is never finished. It is important that legislation does not restrict our ability to fluidly adopt components for training and procedures as more sophisticated techniques continue to evolve for us to better serve and protect our communities. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chief Hyatt. Next, we'll hear from Chief Harrison. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the work group. Uh, thank you very much for your leadership on these important issues and I certainly appreciate the opportunity to present to you this afternoon. Today, I will be giving you an overview of the progress that we're making towards reform in the Baltimore Police Department. And number two, to talk about recommendations from a working group of which I'm a member on police reform and racial justice led by the US Conference of Mayors. We have made significant progress in my 18 months on the job here in Baltimore. Some notable achievements over that time include having implemented a new use of force and victim-centered assault policies develop new policies on stops, searches, and arrests, impartial policing, as well as behavioral health and crisis intervention. We've drafted the department's first ever community policing plan, launched training on ethical policing is courageous, our EPIC, which empowers officers to intervene when they see a colleague is unnecessarily escalating to a situation to prevent bad acts before they actually occur. These are just a few examples of the reforms we've been implementing. After, he, after this hearing, my staff will send you copies of our more comprehensive year one review of those new policies and those plans. Now, while BPD is still in the early stages of its federally mandated consent decree, I firmly believe we've come a long way from where we were just a few short years ago. For example, when a victim believed, mistakenly as it turns out, that she may have been sexually assaulted by Baltimore police officers in their patrol car, I grounded nearly the entire fleet looking for evidence. And when during a routine review of body-worn camera footage, we saw a sergeant assault and falsely arrest an individual, I personally ordered the pressing of criminal charges and had that officer arrested. And most recently was how the department responded to mass protests in reaction to the killing of George Floyd. Protesters were able to exercise their First Amendment rights safely and without major incident. We must recognize the actions of those officers and protesters who de-escalated what were at times very tense situations. Baltimore served as a contrast to other major cities that experienced much more destructive demonstrations and a stark contrast on where we were in 2015 during the protests surrounding the death of Freddie Gray. <clears throat> These are just a few examples of actions that would not and did not take place just a few years ago. I know that there are those who argue that nothing has changed, but I respectfully disagree. We are seeing major progress and it's due largely in part to the reforms we have enacted and the culture of accountability that we are instilling into this department. These reforms have also been serving as a model for other law enforcement agencies nationally. 
some of which have been adopted by the U.S. Conference of Mayors Working Group on Police Reform and Racial Justice. This group was tasked with developing recommendations on how to effectively and sustainably reform local police departments to achieve better public safety outcomes through cooperation and respect between police and the community. We have shared that report with this work group, which I hope you'll find helpful. I do wanna take a moment to call out a couple of key proposals from their recommendations that are relevant to today's session. Sanctity of life. The U.S. Conference of Mayors report recommended that every department adopt policies that reinforce an officer's duty to protect human life and physical safety and lays out a number of directives that will ground that principle in a department's approach to policing. It's important to note that the Baltimore Police Department is already following all of the principles I'm gonna lay out for you today. Departments should have a use of force policy that provides that all officers will use only the minimum amount of force necessary to respond if any force is necessary at all. Continually reassess the situation to calibrate the appropriate response, not use choke holds, strangle holds, or any other carotid restraints unless deadly force is necessary not shoot at or from moving vehicles, except when under extreme life-threatening circumstances that are not avoidable, and not use deadly force against a fleeing individual unless the individual poses an immediate threat of death or serious physical injury to another person. Departments should have a clearly stated de-escalation policy. Departments should establish a duty to intervene when a fellow officer is using excessive force or otherwise contravening law or department policy. Departments should offer first aid training to officers and require officers to provide that first aid following the use of force as appropriate. Departments should require officers to report all uses of force and then departments should train officers on crisis intervention. When it comes to transparency and accountability, to help departments achieve robust transparency and accountability, the committee recommended the following. Final disciplinary authority should be vested in the chief, the police chief. Departments should have public complaint processes that make filing a complaint open to all. Departments should have policies on officer investigations that clearly define the procedures for carrying out the investigations and seeing them through to completion, even if the officer separates from the department. Departments should regularly release to the public in accordance with relevant state laws, data on disciplinary actions and decisions, including those made by arbitrators. Departments should have policies that require supervisors to conduct ongoing reviews of stops, searches, and arrests, and uses of force. Departments should require body-worn cameras and develop policies for review, release, and preservation of footage. Departments should implement an early intervention system to identify at-risk officers to help support their well-being. The U.S. Conference of Mayors report also makes a series of recommendations regarding collective bargaining agreements. The report emphasizes that agreements must provide fair and equitable due process procedures to officers while also addressing community considerations. I urge you all to review that section of the report. In conclusion, the Baltimore Police Department is at the forefront of reform effort, three years into it to be exact. Our consent decree started the transformation of our department and we have embraced it fully because it is the right thing to do. Just like all of the other chiefs and sheriffs before you today, BPD is comprised of hardworking men and women who are dedicated to protecting residents and visitors alike. I'm grateful for their service and committed to providing them with the policies, training, technology, equipment, and support they need to provide an excellent level of customer service. I'm also equally committed to establishing the oversight and accountability needed to weed out any officers who tank the profession by acting outside of the law, policy, or training. As this work group develops its own recommendations on reform, I am certain they will run the spectrum from those that I wholeheartedly champion to those I may suggest some changes, to those that I may not be in support of given the unintended consequences. Regardless of my position on any individual proposal, you will find a willing and op open partner in me, and I believe my colleagues are willing and open, open partners as well. All of us can work together towards our mutual goals of establishing a system of fair and impartial policing and strengthening the relationship between law enforcement and the communities we serve. So thank you so much for allowing me to talk with you today and I stand ready to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Chief Harrison. Uh, next we'll have Ms. Kruger. Thank you, ma'am. Um, first one, I want to apologize. It looks like my camera's rather dark and I don't know how to make that any better. So. Um, I do apologize for that, and I hope that won't take away from my presentation, which is today 
um, to give you some information about the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, which of course we all refer to as the LEOBR. And for over 25 years, I have represented law enforcement agencies, that is management, um, in LEOBR cases at more than 20 agencies across the state. And I've had the opportunity to provide instruction on the topic to hundreds of law enforcement officers, chiefs, sheriffs, attorneys, and even citizens. During my long years of work with the LEOBR, I've come to believe it really could have been and perhaps should have been named the Law Enforcement Accountability Act. Just to give you a little historical background, it was enacted by the General Assembly in 1974 with three primary goals. The first, to standardize police discipline across the state by creating a professional review process. Second, to protect wrongfully accused officers by providing procedural due process as required by the United States and Maryland constitutions. And third, to empower management with the authority to investigate and discipline officers who commit acts of misconduct. And it is that third point that I would like to address today. Police officers are charged with a high level of responsibility and authority in our society, and they are given special powers so that they can meet those responsibilities. Thus, they are held to a higher professional standard than many public workers in carrying out their duties and not unlike other licensed professionals like doctors, attorneys, judges, social workers, and even correctional officers who benefit from the Correctional Officers Bill of Rights. In each of these professions, there are disciplinary mechanisms in place in which those who abuse power or make egregious mistakes are judged by peer professionals. If they fail to meet standards, those standards are known by those peer professionals. The LEOBR provides that officers are judged according to the professional standards with which their peers are familiar. Police officers are constantly in the public eye and so are subject to higher scrutiny and even more so when they are faced with dangerous, rapidly changing life-threatening situations. A thorough disciplinary process ensures that police officers are not unfairly used as political scapegoats or arbitrarily demonized when carrying out their difficult tasks, and that those who do not meet the standards are removed from the profession. It's critical to recognize that the LEOBR provides to management the powers and authority to regulate, investigate, and discipline officers who don't meet these professional standards. The LEOBR creates a balance between protecting wrongfully accused officers and empowering management to punish those who are justly deserving. Specifically, the LEOBR empowers management to conduct internal investigations of officers, including requiring them to participate in compelled interrogations that may be incriminating, an action that would be unconstitutional without the LEOBR, unconstitutional under the Fifth Amendment. Management may order officers to produce evidence that may be incriminating. Management is empowered to suspend the police powers of an officer and suspend him from duty where warranted in the public interest. The LEOBR gives the chief the authority to regulate secondary employment, to require an officer to be subjected to investigatory tests and examinations such as drug and alcohol tests and polygraph examinations. The LEOBR allows a chief or sheriff to investigate allegations of excessive force or criminal laws without time restrictions, to maintain a list of officers who may be subject to impeachment in court when testifying, to appoint members of a hearing board to hear charges against an officer, to issue subpoenas for such hearing and does empower the chief of police or sheriff to impose the final discipline on the officer. These are the powers granted to management by the LEOBR. And chiefs and sheriffs need these powers because the community expects the chief or sheriff to supervise and manage police employees and they must be given the authority to do so. The powers afforded by the LEOBR allow them to hold employees accountable and when used and managed judiciously, the system works. But there are those who have called for a wholesale repeal of the LEOBR. 
they perhaps have an inflated view of the rights that are provided and seem to have no knowledge of the powers that it gives to management. It is true that over the years, the LEOBR has been amended some 40 times and the balance between employee rights and management privileges has been disturbed and there are certainly modifications to be considered. But please also bear in mind when reviewing proposed modifications that you not unintentionally create more obstacles for chiefs and sheriffs to impose discipline. We should be seeking to simplify and streamline the process, not further complicate it. The six changes proposed by the chiefs and sheriffs help toward this goal, and there may be others to consider. In this work group's quest to study issues related to modern policing, I urge you to bear in mind that overly restricting the authority of police chiefs and sheriffs and of police officers themselves could have disastrous results. You may make it impossible for, for them to do their job. While they make mistakes, as we all do, the police are critical to maintaining a safe and productive society. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. And next we have Chief Sheriff, excuse me, Barry. Good afternoon, Delegate Allen Berry and members of the work group. Thank you for this opportunity to be here. I'm Sheriff Troy Berry of the Charles County Sheriff's Office, and I had the honor and the privilege to be in law enforcement 28 years. The Charles County Sheriff's Office is a full service law enforcement agency comprised of police officers, correctional officers, and civilian personnel. We nearly have 700 staff members in my organization. And today I want to talk briefly about the Charles County Sheriff's Office strategies and initiatives over the last few weeks dealing with police accountability. I also want to talk about the Law Enforcement Office Bill of Rights briefly, independent investigations of officer involved incidents, oversight of law enforcement in Maryland, and finally, uh, school resource officers program. Over the last few weeks, we have been dealing with and talking about accountability within the Charles County Sheriff's Office. And first, we were talking about body-worn cameras. It has been very uh, challenging for our agency to uh, obtain body-worn cam cameras, uh, working with our Board of County Commissioners, because this initiative is extremely expensive. To uh, start this initiative here in Charles County, we have budgeted for $1.5 to $1.7 million to get this initiative off the ground. So we're continually working with our Board of County Commissioners in that regard. Also, over the last several weeks, we are continually working with our de-escalation uh, training. We have hired an independent consultant to continue our training courses for de-escalation and also conflict re resolution and also embracing the diversity in our community. We also have done a comprehensive review and evaluation of all use of force policies focusing on the sanctity of life and also duty to intervene. They have always been in our policy, but we had, had conducted a complete retraining of our organization. We also are establishing a youth advisory council, being able to engage young people in our community, talking about policing strategies, about training that we can bring into our organization and having them as a sounding board for me to make decisions within my agency. And we also want to look towards the Youth Advisory Council for a method of recruiting, getting uh, our young people into the law enforcement environment. And since I've been chair, we've also been continually working with our elected officials our, and also our judges and our state attorney's office of talking about how can we bring about programs in our community to mitigate uh, recidivism. And one program we're working with our local officials in regards to is a pretrial services and supervision program, trying to get those individuals and work with those individuals who are on low bail, low bond inside of our detention facilities and having us have an opportunity to be able to supervise those individuals outside of our facilities. But here in Charles County, we also have a need for problem solving courts, dealing with our drug courts, having a drug court and also a mental health court, because this is not specifically to Charles County, this is a national issue where individuals are finding themselves inside of our detention facilities or inside of our courthouses as a result of mental health issues and substance abuse issues. So we want to be able to bring those particular amenities into our communities and into the state of Maryland to address those challenging issues that law enforcement face on a daily basis. 
last few weeks, we did have a law enforcement summit here in the Southern Maryland region, comprising of the Charles County Sheriff's Office, St. Mary's County Sheriff's Office, and the County, Calvert County Sheriff's Office. We have a joint academy, academy and we wanted to make sure that our police practices in regards to U.S. force were uh, addressed on a regional basis, that we make sure that we're teaching our entry-level staff members uh, be very uh, mindful of use of force issues in regards to chokeholds, head strikes, and also duty to intervene. And the second thing I'd like to address relatively quickly is talking about law enforcement officers' bill of rights when it came to repeal and replacing. As we know, and it's been stated by Ms. Kruger, is that uh, law enforcement bill of rights are, is, a, are, is a due process for our law enforcement officers in regards to discipline and termination. And there come a number of questions in regards to if we choose to uh, some repeal or replace the Law Enforcement Office Bill of Rights. The question is, what are we going to replace it with? And the other question is, what authority will police agencies have to investigate alleged misconduct if we repeal or replace a Law Enforcement Office Bill of Rights? Other questions, what ability will police agencies have to compel an officer to provide a statement if we replace Law Enforcement Office Bill of Rights? And who will have the final authority to terminate an officer if we repeal or replace the Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights? And finally, and fundamentally, we know this, that the Law, law Enforcement Bill of Rights is a system to handle employment-related issues. And those are some pretty much the topics that the work group has to work through. And in regards to independent investigation, as has been said by Ms. Kruger, that as the elected sheriff, the citizens hold me accountable for law enforcement related issues that occur in my community. I am concerned regarding an investigation occurring by an outside entity. And it rise a number of questions. Who would have the jurisdiction to prosecute that particular officer if they're involved in the incident? Would that be the local state's attorney's office or the attorney general? Another question, what governmental entity would investigate the incident? Would it be the Maryland State Police or a federal organization or how would this be structured? And moreover, there's gonna be a fiscal piece to this. How do we go about compensating staff in reference to overtime, equipment, and other resources that you have to bring to bear when you have these significant investigations that occur in your just jurisdiction? So we look forward as Maryland Chiefs and Sheriffs are having those robust conversations as we move forward. Also talking about our oversight of law enforcement, it has been talked about civilian accountability boards, civilian review boards, civilian advisory boards. Regardless of what you call those particular boards, we have to have some conversation. I think a lot of these boards want subpoena power. They want investigatory power. They want input on discipline. We have to have a conversation in regards to the law of the Law Enforcement Office Bill of Rights, as Ms. Kruger has just been talking about. But law enforcement does have civilian oversight. And it, it's kind of glossed over and says we don't have checks and balances in law enforcement, but we do. We work, work very closely with our state's attorney's office. And the civilian oversight that we have in our communities is called grand jury. If there are issues in regards to our use of force practices, those inf information is passed along to our state's attorney's office. And they can take said evidence and present it to a grand jury, which is made of us citizens in our community. And they can determine if our staff members are op operating outside the scope of their authority. So we do at some point have civilian oversight through the grand jury process. And finally, I wanted to talk about our school resource pro program here in Charles County and also other programs that are in Maryland. Here in Charles County, we have 28,000 students enrolled in our Charles County Public Schools. And I did some statistical information. Over the last four years, the Charles County Sheriff's Office has handled 2,000 arrestable incidents in our schools. And these incidents range from uh, disturbing school activities, possession of guns, drugs, sexual later offense, among other crimes. And during looking at those statistics, only two thirds of those incidents, over, over two thirds of those incidents were handled within the school system. And that meaning that an officer did not have to make an arrest. Based on statistics that I pulled over a four year period here in Charles County, is that 1% of students had an interaction with an officer, which resulted in arrest. 
the school sit, the school resource office program here in Charles County definitely supports our teachers. They support our administrators. They support the parents. They help aid and mentor young children. School resource office program in Charles County, and they hold basketball camps and baseball camps and football camps. They even hold a summer youth achievement camp for young people trying to provide structure in their lives for more at-risk children. And we even host a lady leadership soccer camp encouraging strong leadership among our young ladies. So the school resource officer program definitely has some value in our school system. In fact, during the President Obama administration, members of the Department of Justice shadowed several of our school resource officers to learn what they do on a daily basis. And after that particular review by the Department of Justice, they committed time and time and again how impressed they were with our school resource officer program and the role that they play in our school system. And they went on to say that the school resource program that we have in Ch Charles County should be emulated throughout the country. I just wanna say that school resource officers had some value in our public school systems. So we want to be able to, as we move forward, the Maryland chiefs and the sheriff look forward to working with this work group to uh, address some of the concerns in our community. Thank you, uh, everyone, and thank you for your presentation. We do have uh, several questions from members, and I, I'm going to start off, I think, though, with some questions and um, some, some comments, quite frankly. Um, first, I, I just want to say I think this is the beginning of, of a dialogue. I think it's critically important, and I think that the speaker believes it's critically important that you are part of the conversation. The community is part of the conversation. Um, and, you know, the police, whether you're in management or not in management, are part of this conversation because there is not one answer. One person uh, doesn't know everything. Um, and, and I think it's also important for me to say to you, because a lot of you don't know me, that, you know, I have a great deal of respect for police. My, my lovely 91 year old grandma was a sheriff in, in Wayne County right outside of Detroit. Um, and so as soft as she, she was to me, she, she was tough as nails uh, on the streets. Um, but I also am obviously a black woman raising three black children that are, I can hear them running around upstairs. They just got in, two of whom are boys. And one of whom, you know, I'm, I'm very concerned about. He's only eight. He looks like he should be in middle school. And he could be threatening, you know, just to, to a smaller, skinny white officer who, who thinks he's older than he is and doesn't understand um, his mental state because he is young, just as, you know, I personally don't think that uh, the officer uh, that in Wisconsin that just shot uh, Jacob, murdered him in the back, uh, understood how to handle that situation. And we all saw how that played out on um, TV. So with that being said, I think, you know, this is the beginning of a dialogue. I'm disappointed that your recommendations don't suggest any changes. What they say to me is we like the status quo and we don't want any oversight. Um, so I, I have a, a couple of questions starting off with um, the law enforcement officers bill of rights uh, and then I'll move into body cameras and then let a couple other members ask some questions. Um, so I'm not sure who to address these two. I, th I guess my first questions could go to um, Ms. Kruger since you uh, walked us through, through, through this and I, I appreciate it. Um, but so unless I'm wrong and it's, it's my understanding. So under the current process, a citizen that Leobra is kicked off because a citizen makes a complaint against a police officer at a police agency. Um, and then it's the chief. The chief mm -hmm. investigates the allegations. It's the chief who determines whether to administratively charge an officer or sustain a violation. And then if charged, it's the agency that determines the offer of discipline to the officer. And then if that's not accepted, the agency, appoint, the agency appoints members of the trial board um, from within the chain of command. And then if the officer is found guilty of violating, violating a policy of the department, the chief has the final say, except for I think in a couple of counties, um, Montgomery County and Baltimore County, um, there may be, may be others. So it sounds to me, um, well, in addition, the police get to say who, um, 
goes to internal affairs and, and how to staff internal affairs. Police chiefs oversee the training of the detectives and the training of the trial board members. So I don't see in any of these recommendations any structural change for any type of civilian oversight or for any type of civilian participation. And I, I hope that um, your group hasn't, you know, completely misread the movement that's going on across America. I hope you haven't misread the tea leaves, um, but change is a coming. I can't sit here and say how change is coming because I, I don't know that, but change is a coming. So I hope that we can continue to have a dialogue and work together on what that change should be um, and, and how it should be. And so I guess my questions would be, uh, do you support authorizing civilians to conduct investigations? Um, do you support civilians sitting on a charging committee? Um, do you support um, utilizing uh, citizens and community members to have subpoena power, opening trial boards to the public, videotaping them so they can be posted online for people um, to see. It's those types of things that I think we are looking for to see what is it that you support so that the community feels like they are involved, so that the community feels like they understand what's going on and this isn't a, a, a hidden process. Um, Chief uh, Barry said that uh, there is civilian oversight. No, there is not. You have the state's attorney. That isn't your average everyday citizen. And um, going to the grand jury, you have the state's attorney and independent investigations. That's 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 a whole another separate discussion. But right now, we don't have citizens that feel like that they are involved, like that that the the police, quite frankly, whether it's you, whether all of you on the on this um, briefing right now feel this way or not, but the community members don't feel that they can trust the police like they are valued by the police. I have had more conversations since the murder of George Floyd with my children about racial injustice and what they have to look, what, how they have to look and how they have to dress as they walk down the street. Just last night, I had to have a conversation. We love basketball in this house. Why were there no basketball games on last night? Because, you know, the NBA players are fed up with everything that's going on right now, you know, and today I, they voted to continue playing, which I appreciate because they want to use their platform to get the message out about what's going on. And so I just want to know if you can speak to whether or not there is any opportunity for you to agree to any type of civilian participation in a meaningful way that will make the citizens of Maryland you know, feel feel more trusting of of the police. Um, and then my my uh, next question, I guess, would go to Chief Morris about the use of force. Um, and and I, I I have to say this because it's been bothering me. It's been bothering me actually ever since I read it. But the former chief of police for Anne Arundel County, who I I don't know and I have never met. But he was quoted, I read about his resignation, and he was quoted as saying, this conversation is not about racist, race, race to me. That means it was time for him to go. He completely is off page, does not empathize, and has no understanding about what is going on with brown and black people today in America, in his community, and let alone in Maryland. He said, quote, systemic racism has been absent in the Anne Arundel County Police Department. And I would challenge anybody to talk to those police officers in that department to see if, you know, black and brown police officers, female police officers, if they've had a problem dealing with the chain of command, I would challenge you to talk, you know, to the people over there who historically in Highland Park and Arundel on the Bay and all those other lower income places, how they get treated uh, by the police in, 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 in Anne Arundel County. So it was it was absolutely time uh, for him to go because he does not understand what is going on right now in the United States of America. Uh, as it comes to um, the use of force specifically, I agree with Chief Morris that we did some great things in that bill in, in, in uh, 2016, but what did not happen is that it was not placed into law. So we have all 140 some departments with different 
uh, policies with different standards. Some may be going above and beyond, some may be not up to par. So my question would be, what is your feeling about having a uniform standard use of force across the state so that our citizens for more transparency know what to expect when they, you know, I drive to Prince George's, I drive to Montgomery County, I drive to Baltimore City, I was just out on the shore. Am, do I need to know uh, all the different standards that I should expect from a police officer when I encounter them walking down the street or should we just have one standard which seems to make more sense to me? So that was, I threw a lot out there because it's difficult when we're in this uh, virtual setting, but if I guess Ms. Kruger, if you could respond and then um, uh, 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 Chief Morris, if you could respond, I would appreciate that. Well, thank you, ma'am. I would um, like to remind the committee that in 2016 in House Bill 1016, um, which enacted a number of different police reforms, it was mandated that LEOBR hearing boards be made open to the public and they have been since then. Um, it was already in the law that the board should be recorded. And um, it also provided for citizen members to sit on hearing boards if a community um, voted in favor of that for its community. So um, it isn't as if the citizenry are shut out completely. They certainly are not. Um, I don't think we prepared today um, to provide any other specific recommendations um, such as you suggest, but of course we will discuss that and be open-minded as possible. Um, again, trying to bear in mind that we don't want to make the process more complicated or more cumbersome um, while still respecting uh, the interests of citizens to be involved. Thank you. And I just, we, we learned earlier, um, I think at our very first briefing, that there has been no civilian participation on any trial boards in the state of Maryland, um, which is concerning. So, you know, I think we all need to get our heads together. However, we're going to figure that out and how, and, 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 you know, why is that so? Is it not advertised? Is the word not getting out? I mean, if, if, if people don't know it's open to the public, then it really, it's, it's kind of a meaningless um, you know, wave the banner, we're doing a great thing here. Um, uh, Chief Morris, do you have any comments for me? Uh, yes, ma'am, and, th and thank you. And y yes, this this is a conversation and it, is, and it is a dialogue. And I think that it's uh, fair to say that the chiefs and sheriffs have been at the table and worked with you and Chairman Clippinger, as well as Senator Smith and uh, many of the others in leadership as we've worked through these issues. And is it perfect? Absolutely not. Do we have work to do? Yes, we do. Uh, I, I have to uh, take a slight issue with regards to the recommendations that the chiefs and sheriffs have offered both back in 2015 and uh, that did not uh, or were not acted upon uh, with regards to uh, House Bill 1016, uh, we, we feel strongly that chiefs and sheriffs have to have final authority. And that is not the case. And, that, and as I indicated in my testimony earlier, that that is driven in large part in some jurisdictions by collective bargaining agreements. And it's the collective bargaining agreements that have created a variety of processes depending upon the jurisdiction in which an officer is serving. And that in and of itself, we would certainly submit, create some of the confusion for our citizens because they don't, they don't distinguish the difference between Montgomery County or Prince George's County or uh, the Eastern Shore. And that's where we, we su support the move to ensure the consistency in the application of the LEOBR across the board. Uh, we're not going to hide behind the Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights. We never have, but we do think that we need to educate and demystify. The recommendations that we provided uh, take it uh, considerably further as it, as it pertains to uh, convictions of serious misdemeanors and chiefs or sheriffs being able to dismiss an individual without an administrative hearing board if there's a conviction of a serious misdemeanor crime. That does not currently exist in the LEOBR. Uh, we, we do support uh, investigative subpoena authority. Uh, we, that we need a reciprocal disclosure of evidence when it comes to witnesses. Uh, you have that in a courtroom. Why wouldn't we have that in the LEOBR? 
um, the uh, the authority to challenge uh, internal investigative um, uh, actions and administrative disciplinary actions has to be eliminated on the front end because it creates a, a, a barrier to the timeliness of an adjudication of these matters of misconduct. So I do think that the recommendations that the chiefs and sheriffs are, are far and above what, uh, what, what have been considered in the past, and we stand by those recommendations. The, uh, in Prince George's County, we have had a uh, citizen oversight since the early 90s. The Citizens Complaint Oversight Panel, commonly referred to as the CCOP, reviews all investigations involving the Prince George's County Police Department as it relates to use of force and those serious incidents. And they do have certain powers that uh, enable them to make recommendations and refer back. The chief is the chief executive officer of the Prince George County Police Department has the ultimate, uh, has the final say as well it should be. We would want our CEOs to be held responsible for their decisions. Uh, but it is a, what I would submit is, is could be used as a model across the state that does provide that citizen oversight. And again, that, that evolved back in the early 90s uh, as a result of the Blue Ribbon Commission and has been very successful here in Prince George's County. So uh, there are best practices out there that we can capitalize on. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say this, and, and, I, and I will respectfully, ma'am, I do know Chief Tim Altamari, and I'm not here to defend him. I don't have to. His record defends itself. Chief Tim Altamari served for two and a half decades as a Anne Arundel County police officer. He earned every day of his retirement, and he's enjoying that retirement. And I, and I think we need to be, uh, you know, we, we can agree to disagree on his comments. Uh, I did not see the comments that you're referring to, uh, but I do know that he is a good man. He's an educated man. Uh, he's well-respected among Maryland law enforcement as, as well as nationally. And I, I, I'll close with those remarks. And, and I have to apologize because you threw a lot out at us. So if there's another question in there that I missed, please remind me and I'm happy to respond to it. Thank you, Chief Morris. And I do appreciate the fact that you uh, have always been willing to sit down uh, with us and work these issues out. So I'm sure we will continue to do so. Uh, I will just say about body cameras, just so I can let some other folks ask questions. So this is more of a rhetorical question because my chair is texting me, isn't that so, <laughs> after I speak. Um, you know, thank God that the uh, there were cell phones out uh, the other night uh, in Kenesha, Wisconsin, you know, because they, they needed body cameras. So I've, I've had the police come since I've been elected in 2014 and seen you all advocate for more money to hire more officers, more money for more technology. So I think what the, the better approach would be to come and say, yes, we need body cameras and advocate for how to get more money. Um, what I'm reading is, is kind of like a uh, it's an unfunded mandate, so we, we don't know if we want them, we can't have them. We need body cameras. Everybody needs body cameras. It protects you um, and it, it protects the citizens as well. Um, so with that, I will, uh, Delegate Barnes has a question, I believe, for um, Chief Hyatt. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. And um, let me just say that, you know, I um, uh, want to echo some of the same sentiments as our chairwoman. Uh, these are some really trying times here in our country. And as a 55 year old black man, I am outraged by what I see and what's going on in this country. Uh, as the chairman of the Maryland Legislative Black Caucus, I am frightened for my members uh, as they come to me and tell me how afraid they are of the police. Uh, looking at what we see around the country right now uh, and our athletes and, and everyone taking a stand on where we are, I think it's high time that we here in the state of Maryland uh, lead by example and uh, put certain things in place. And one of the questions I had for Chief Morris, you know, when you had said that uh, you guys were upset uh, by the shooting, I mean, by the uh, killing of uh, George Floyd uh, and how that made you feel. And then we turn around a couple of days later and we see another unarmed black man uh, get shot seven times in the back, seven times. 
uh, with his children in the back of the car. Uh, and still to this day, there has not been no arrest. There has not been anything to lead to any type of prosecution. But yet there was a shooting by uh, a white man with a long gun uh, running down the street in, in Wisconsin. And the news reported, we need to move quickly and swiftly and make it an arrest. Uh, and then one has to wonder why there is an outcry for the repeal of the Maryland Law Enforcement Bill of Rights. So I think, you know, there is something that has to be said that when, I don't know if you guys were on the call for our last meeting, but 90% of the citizens from around the state of Maryland are all calling for the removal or the repeal of the L-E-O-B-R. Uh, so Chief, I would ask you to address that. But secondly, uh, you had also stated, uh, you and, uh, Chief Hyatt, that there are good officers that are leaving uh, the police off, but the police force because of budgetary cuts, policy changes, uh, that they are now fed up with the changes that they want to retire, they want to leave. And I would say that this is the time that we need those good officers to hang in there, to stay true to what they believe in. Because as a black man in my community, I can't run. I can't quit. Uh, as soon as I walk out the door, I am a target. Uh, that is a fact. Uh, there are certain places in uh, the state of Maryland uh, that is getting it right. And there are other places in the state of Maryland where we know that systemic racism is at an all time high uh, and that we need to address those things, uh, especially when you start talking about uh, use of force, uh, body cameras, and more importantly, the Public Information Act uh, and making sure that those internal records are open to the public. So I just think, you know, Chief, you know, if you can address the, that incident. And then lastly, I would ask you, uh, Chief Morris and all the chiefs, uh, what would you tell your family as a black man uh, when you walk out and I have a 14 year old and a 15 year old black boys uh, who also come to me and say, Daddy, I am tetrified uh, by what I see. Daddy, make sure you have your seatbelt on. Daddy, do you have your driver's license in the car uh, to make sure if you're pulled over, uh, nothing happens to you? These are the conversations that we're having in our community, in our family. And I'm sure uh, you guys are doing the best that you possibly can. Uh, but I must say right now, it's just some trying times where uh, Black America is fed up, uh, where we're, we're scared, and we want some results because I agree with the chairwoman. The things that I heard right now, we've heard these things repeatedly over and over again for many years. Uh, but I do say that, uh, Sheriff Barry, uh, I like your comments because you challenged us with some things that we need to think about. Should we repeal uh, the Maryland Law Enforcement Bill of Rights? So I think your comments were on point, but I do believe that there are some things that we must do. We must have these courageous conversations and sometimes we must have unapologetic conversations as we talk about uh, things that uh, affect the African-American and the uh, Hispanic community that is being targeted uh, at a greater length. So uh, Delegate, you... Uh... <laughs> You have thrown a lot at me. And again, it's, it's, it's always good to see you and work with you. And, and, and we've worked very closely in the past and we will continue to do so. As it relates to the LEOBR, if it's okay with you, I would defer to, to Ms. Kruger. She is uh, an expert in the LEOBR and can perhaps answer some of the questions that you've posed. And then we'll come back to those other issues if it's okay, sir. Yes, sir. I would be happy to answer questions, but I'm not sure I clearly heard specific questions. Could you help me out with that? Yeah, well, I, I, I think the question is centered around what we just saw in Wisconsin and how uh, I think there was a, a separation where there has not still been any uh, arrest or anything with the, the police officer that shot Jacob, uh, Jacob in the back seven times but yet, because of those protections of the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights, there was a separate incident where a 
uh, white gentleman with a long gun killed or shot two people, but yet they want to move as quickly as possible in an arrest and indictment on him. So there's a separation. That's why there is an outcry for the removal of the law enforcement bill of rights here in the state of Maryland. Right. And I would point out that our law is just limited to the state of Maryland. So I'm not sure in Wisconsin what the procedures actually are, but it is my um, understanding that there is an, an independent investigative agency in the state of Wisconsin um, that is managing that investigation. And it's really only been a couple of days. So it's still early on in both the investigation of the officers and the investigation of the young men who allegedly shot other people. So it's it's not quite parallel um, in terms of what we have in Maryland with respect to the LEOBR. Um, but these but at the end of the day, there is a protection for those officers that is no protection for civilians. Well, I would disagree with you, sir. Um, uh, well, well, I think that's a conversation that we can have. Okay. I would disagree as well. But we can have another conversation on that. Uh, Chief Morris, if you can answer my other question, so uh, the chair can move on. Yes, sir. So uh, I, I will say that, uh, you know, and I'm not going to try and draw a parallel between uh, what happened in Wisconsin. And, and <coughs> well, I want to be clear in what my remarks were as it relates to to what happened to Mr. Floyd. I didn't suggest we were upset. I said we were in, we were appalled. What I said was that the actions of those officers were indefensible and inexcusable and inexplicable. Uh, uh, so I, I don't know how much more strongly I can express our consternation as law enforcement professionals when we witnessed what occurred. Uh, I've seen only the video, the snippet of the video of what happened in Wisconsin. Uh, I was not there. Uh, there's a, a significant difference between that event and eight and a half or nine minutes involving the situation with Mr. Floyd. And again, I don't mean to draw a parallel because they are completely different situations. Um, the uh, likewise, I understand that the Justice Department has already opened an investigation into the incident up in Wisconsin. So as they move forward, they will uh, uh, look for the facts and the evidence. The video is one piece and there's I'm sure there are other uh, other mitigating factors. But I do want to state that back in January in Prince George's County, when a Prince George's County police officer shot and killed an individual sitting in his police car, and I'm not compromising anything here because I wasn't on the scene and I don't know all the facts of that. But what I do know is that uh, retired Chief Stowinski took the absolute unprecedented action and had that officer criminally charged by his special investigative response team. He did not wait for a grand jury investigation. He did not wait for the approval of the, of the state's attorney. Uh, I, I'm sure there was consultation there, but he did something that is absolutely un precedented. And I think we have to give credit where credit is due. And now that officer still has the same constitutional rights as any other citizen, but he was charged and he's sitting in the Department of Corrections today awaiting trial. So I think when we, if, if we're going to bring up Wisconsin, we, we need to look at what we did right here in the state of Maryland and in Prince George's County. And even the Washington Post in their headlines uh, uh, commented uh, favorably about what Chief Stowinski did in, in regards to that. So I, I, I do think it's important to recognize we're distinguishing the differences between a, a situation that uh, clearly rose to the level of a, of a crime, uh, a felony offense, and the chief did uh, what he felt was the appropriate thing to do uh, in that situation. And that has nothing to do with the Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights, which is solely an administrative process. Um, you know, Delegate, uh, you, have, you, you ask me to put myself in your shoes. And uh, the, the reality is I cannot, and I would never insult your intelligence by suggesting that I can. Uh, but I will tell you, you say that black America is angry. Well, I'll tell you that America is angry. When, when me and my colleagues look at what happened, uh, particularly in, in some of these, um, not, just, not just the George Floyd, but some of these other cases, we have these conversations. We talk about what we need to do here in Maryland to make sure that we're 
taking appropriate measures to ensure the trust of our communities and the accountability of our officers. Uh, I don't believe in throwing uh, the proverbial baby out with the bathwater, but you have my promise uh, as, as a gentleman and as a chief of police representing the Maryland Chiefs, and in this case, the Maryland Sheriff's Association, we will continue to work with you, with uh, Delegate Atterbury, with this committee, and with our elected officials. We too recognize that th this isn't, this is a, a tipping point in, in history. And we can either uh, uh, ascend or we can collectively go down in flames as, in a, as a society. And I would hope that uh, that cooler heads prevail. I know that they will and that we will rise to the occasion and that the leadership that, that I'm looking at on the screen, as well as our leadership in law enforcement across the state of Maryland and our communities will, uh, will, will uh, evolve in such a way that we are proud to be Marylanders and uh, we feel safe in the communities and the uh, men and women that wear these uniforms can go out and do their job every day, do it safely, do it well, do it professionally. We are going to falter. Make no mistake about it, we're human. We cannot expect every encounter to have a perfect outcome when we're dealing with imperfect people and almost improbable situations. But you have my commitment. We're trying and we look forward to continuing to work with you. So, so thank you, Delegate, for what you do every day to, uh, to, to, to help us move this along. Delegate Rosenberg had a question, I believe for Chief Harrison. Well, I have a, a different question, if I may, in light of oh. the dialogue we've just had. Okay. And that is to whoever among the chiefs wants to answer. We had the same set of factual circumstances in Maryland that is the death of Mr. Floyd, the apparent paralysis of Mr. Blake at the hand of an officer. How would the LEOBR, as currently written, affect both on the civil side, the authority of the commissioner or whoever was the authority for that officer to take any action? And how would it affect the prosecution uh, of, by the state's attorney? of the officer involved, whoever wants to answer that. I guess I'm in the best position to answer that. And typically, Delegate, what would happen is that a criminal investigation would ensue immediately. And an internal investigation can also be done simultaneously with that criminal investigation. But they remain on separate investigative mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and the criminal investigation would be supervised by criminal investigators and overseen by the state's attorney's office. And really, the LEOBR would have no impact on how that investigation is done or a prosecution accomplished. Um, the LEOBR would only affect the administrative internal investigation um, and the only sort of intersection is when the officer is required to give a statement to the agency, which is part of the administrative investigation, but because of the Fifth Amendment cannot be part of the criminal investigation. Mm -hmm. so that would be the case whether the LEOBR existed or not, um, that no one can be compelled to incriminate him or herself in a criminal right. matter because of the Fifth Amendment. Commissioner, if I may, Madam Chair. Yes. Commissioner Harrison, I believe you've commented on concerns you may have with the LEOBR in situations like this. Is that correct? Or what are your concerns about the LEOBR? Well, that is correct. There, there are, and thank you for that, and thank you uh, for the question. Uh, I have concerns that even when we have scenarios that uh, have investigations that either go through criminal proceedings and then trial boards. You know, there is there is some ability I have to overturn maybe some discipline, but in a trial board, when an officer is found after even after a conviction in court, if the trial board decides to find the officer not sustained, you know, I can't overturn that. Number two, the citizens and the residents of Baltimore have an expectation of me as the chief executive of a major organization, just like any executive of any organization in any discipline to take swift and decisive action against a member of our organization when there is such compelling evidence 
to support that I should take that SWIP and decisive action. Right now, I can't do that. LAOBR and uh, bind, uh, contractual agreements don't allow me to do that. So there are concerns that I have in being able to manage such a large organization where the needs are just very, very different and profound and the expectations of our stakeholders demand that I have that authority, autonomy, uh, authority and autonomy. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, next, uh, Speaker Pro Tem, Shree Sample Hughes has a question, I believe, for Chief Hyatt. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you all for here today to have this discussion and provide additional insight. Um, I did um, have that particular question for um, Chief Hyatt, and I still do, but I also have one for Ms. Kruger, if I could begin there. Um, Ms. Kruger, you had indicated that through this uh, process, the community has uh, the ability to participate, or the citizen has the ability to participate, um, but it depends on whether or not their uh, community agrees to that. Um, and for the in the spirit of education, because um, judiciary area is not my area of expertise and I don't serve on that committee, but I just really want to understand, and certainly on the public probably wants to understand as well, what does that mean? Is that through a ballot process or is that through a petition within your community to help you as a citizen have this framework and participate in that process? That's my question for Ms. Kruger. I hope I have been clear in trying to seek what the answer is for that. Um, Chief Hyatt, you had mentioned very early on um, that you have national best practices that you're recently looking at and will be implementing some of those. I want to understand how does that come to pass? And it's in the sense of, is it for your department based on cost factors, the landscape or your population or just the mere demographics of Baltimore County? And I'm asking because um, in my own uh, district, I represent 37A, which is why I'm from Dorchester counties. But I've heard different things, the different national best practices that are being used and de-escalation policies that are great and some that are not. I'm just trying to clearly understand how we naturally as the state of Maryland can come to, to some consensus as to what is that great national best practice. But what are some of the factors that led you to um, adopt some of the ones that you're taking on right now that you're proposing, I should say, in Baltimore County? So those are my two questions for Ms. Kruger and for the chief. Um, Hyatt. And I can provide a pretty quick answer. Um, under House Bill 1016, which was passed um, several years ago, um, it created the option for the chief of police or sheriff to appoint citizen members to hearing boards. So that was the first time that citizens um, were authorized under law to be appointed, but it also has to be authorized by local law. So the locality, either the county or the municipality, would pass some kind of ordinance giving the chief the authority to make these appointments. So the county council or county commissioners, I should say, in some jurisdictions, they have to pass a specific law that then would allow citizens to participate in this process. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, really what the law does is authorize the chief to appoint citizen members. But your, your basic understanding is correct, yes. Okay, so I would expect the chief or the sheriff in my jurisdiction to go to the county council and put this on their, um, their agenda, if you will, to vote on it and whether or not the citizens will participate. Because I don't think it's very, very clear for our citizens because um, I've seen it happen in, in various ways of concern. So I just wanted to get clarity on that piece. Thank you. They have to they have to work through the local legislative body. Okay. Good afternoon, Delegate. In terms of best practices, um, the majority of those we get from organizations, national organizations like International Association of Chiefs of Police, Police Executive Research Forum, um, Maryland Chiefs. Uh, that there are, there's a list of those. I would say the the biggest prohibitive factor when I look at since even I've been in my position, unfortunately, it always comes down to funding. Um, a couple of the initiatives that we are launching, for example, fair and impartial policing training for everyone in the agency, which is really top of the line implicit bias training. 
um, incredible training, but it comes at a significant cost. And, um, you know, while these are things that, that I think that most every chief wants to implement in their organization, um, fairly often they're, they're difficult to find funding for. Body-worn cameras, of course, and, and we spoke about that before in a bit of detail, is another piece that is very, very, it, there's a lot of cost to it, not just purchasing the equipment, ongoing costs, storage costs, um, the, the technology pieces that go along with it. But, um, you know, these are things that as we, we learn from our peers, um, you know, one of the pieces that I brought in are diversity and inclusion director. That's a pretty new concept for law enforcement. I learned about it when I was in the private sector and saw just how critical it is to the work that we do. And again, I think this is another piece that everyone could agree is a best practice in, in any type of organization, whether it's, whether it's public or private sector. But, um, you know, unfortunately, there, there are costs associated with these things. And for, for many of us, we have to work up to those costs. And sometimes it takes longer than we'd like. Okay. So I appreciate that uh, no cost is a factor naturally in our body worn cameras and things of that nature. But when it comes to your de-escalation training as a chief, have you learned anything that you could implement that is so, uh, that is so um, not cost prohibitive that's gonna really pull your budget out of whack? I mean, something that we can adhere our, or assure our citizens that de-escalation is something that is necessary, but that can very well be um, something that's not going to put your budget out of whack, for lack of better word. But I'm just curious. Absolutely. And there are a lot of different versions of de-escalation training. Um, you know, one that I have had a lot of experience with, both when I was in my last organization and now in Baltimore County, is Police Executive Research Forum's ICAT, which is Integrating Communication Assessment and Tactics. And uh, you know it's an outstanding it's an outstanding program, and certainly anybody that's interested in in taking a look at it, you know, I'll even offer up my training academy to be able to provide some insight to be able to kind of give a crash course on what we're teaching our officers. It really focuses on everything from communication, um, space, and distance, just just teaching officers about giving them different tools. But again, it comes with a cost. Now there are different versions of de-escalation training. Um, what a lot of us tend to do is we send some of our trainers to become essentially experts and then it becomes a train the trainer that we can then bring back to our organization. But there are really a lot of different versions of this and, and that's just the one that, that personally I have found to be just outstanding. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate Fisher. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, I really appreciate um, all that you've done. And thank you for all of you for coming um, and speaking to us with today. I just wanted to be really, really clear about uh, my perspective before I ask the questions. I think that Marylanders and especially this Marylander is not willing to sacrifice any more black lives for the status quo. And I think, I think you really have to digest what that means. I heard several of you say you make mistakes and that mistakes are made, but you're making mistakes with my brothers and sisters that equals death, especially in a state that repealed the death penalty. It, it, it is just so counterintuitive. It's just, it literally, my skin was crawling through a half of the testimony that was given here today. So I just, I really feel that um, you all have to know that. I'm gonna ask two questions, one about, um, collective bargaining agreements, and then one about the LELBR, and then I will, I will type up my questions for Madam Chair whenever she finds appropriate to, to send, because I this is just a lot of questions. Um, so the first one is, I keep hearing this um, contention about blaming collecting collective bargaining agreements, and that that's why you don't have civilian on trial boards, but you negotiate those agreements. So the question really is, why don't you, why don't you ask that they negotiate that point in a way that citizens are on your trial boards and how to vote. That's the first one. The second one is with, you know, when I think about William Green who died in Prince George's County, Chief, you brought that up before, um, Robert White in Montgomery County, Fanon Berhe in, in Montgomery County, there are black men that have been killed in the last year, two years here in Maryland. And since 2005, we only have six six, since 2005, six officers who have been charged. If that is not a wake up call that we need help, we need a lot of help. And we want you to be a part of that process. And to, in my perspective, and I think a lot of Maryland's perspectives, the LEOBR 
is not helping us get to a better place. There might be things in it that might be worthy that can be in other sections of the code, but there are states around this nation that don't have a law enforcement bill of officers rights that are doing fine that have better rates than we do. So I really want you all to take the second to explain why should we keep something in codified law for this particular public service. As a lawyer, if I am charged with malpractice or anything else, I have the same, I don't have a special bill of rights for attorneys. We don't have a special, like that is not, I don't understand why you're so attached to the concept that it might be time for us to undo something that's not really serving us. You know, I feel so bad for my committee members because they hear me all the time. But you know, something I, I, I do say is that, you know, we appreciate officers who want you to do your jobs, but you're not the jury judge and executioner. We pay a whole lot of other people to do that. That is not your job. I'm, I just got to be a hundred with you. It's just not. So I really want to understand why you're not negotiating out or, or renegotiating your collective ar bargaining agreements to have civilians on the trial board. And what is this fixation with the LEOBR and that we can't change it? Because if you really remove it, a lot of it's going to be with the regular laws we have on the books for unions and what you're already negotiating um, with your contracts with every municipality or county anyway. So those are my two questions. I will type up the rest of this. Uh, for Madam Chair. Thank you. I will um, do my best in answering your questions, Delegate Fisher. First off, um, I know that the Baltimore Police Department has negotiated this issue with its union. Um, in fact, just a few weeks ago, I provided training to um, people who, who have applied to sit as citizen members on hearing boards in Baltimore. So that is being done. Um, and I want to make sure you know about that. Um, secondly, with respect to the impact of the LEOBR on um, police encounters that end in tragedy, I'm not sure we could really establish a nexus between those two things. Um, and, and probably in part because we don't have enough information, but also in part because the LEOBR is, is sort of a distant administrative process from the training and deployment of police officers um, in situations that may have turned out poorly. Um, the the LEOBR is called a bill of rights, but really, again, as I mentioned in my opening comments, it sets up procedures. And you noted yourself that as an attorney, um, you know, if you are facing discipline, you face that disciplinary action by other attorneys. And part of the value of the LEOBR is that those who are managing it know what the standards in the profession are and what they should be, what the level of training is and what it should be. Um, we see that also in the Board of Physicians Quality Assurance. We even see it in the Maryland Home Improvement Contractors Board, that people with knowledge of the profession are called upon um, to make judgments about their peer professionals. Um, I don't know if Commissioner Harrison wanted to add anything to my comment, but I, I think I got that information correct, Commissioner. Yes, you were correct. Thank you. Delegate Fisher? You're muted, hold on one second. I'm sorry, Madam Chair, and I'll be short. And I think, you know, um, Ms. Kruger, I, I appreciate those comments, but I think the connection I was making, though, your self-regulation isn't working when 2005, we only have six officers. When people that have records of sustained or unsustained complaints aren't then followed up with and then taken out of the force or whatever actions you think is necessary. In the committee, we are constantly talking about there is no transparency because there's no record keeping. There's no record keeping in your departments for me to even know what officers are good and bad. So I think it's time to really question yourself. Can you self-regulate when only six officers in the state of Maryland have been held accountable since 2005? And I don't really think you can, especially when your agency is dealing with life or death. And a lot of other professions are not dealing with that. And I think that takes a greater responsibility and a greater civilian and citizen input. Because like I said in the beginning of my statement, I'm not willing to sacrifice any more black lives for this status quo. Delegate Moon has a question. Oh, 
Oh, we still can't hear you. You're not muted, but we can't hear you. Okay, I'll circle back to you. There's a couple more questions and I'll come back to you. So try to work out your technical difficulties <laughs> or you can text me your question. Wait, uh, I think I got it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so one difficulty in listening to all of this is that you're centering this conversation on a particular aspect here. You're saying, let's, let's empower the chiefs. Don't worry, they're gonna fire officers who engage in improper use of force. And let's just say that's all true. Um, one thing I'm also hearing from you is that it seems we disagree on what improper use of force is. And so that's uh, fundamental to this whole conversation. I think one of the reasons why I hope this um, work group is going to lead to a change in law. And so um, let me just remind folks that it, in my uh, neck of the woods, the last few police shootings have all been mentally ill residents. They've all been black. Um, and these types of shootings um, are not typically classified as misconduct, um, and they always seem to be legally justified. And so I would say LEOBR or not, whatever it looks like, um, there will rarely be the type of consequence in those cases that the public seems to want. And this is a fundamental disconnect that I'm hoping um, lies at the heart of what we're going to do. Um, try and address. So here's my question. Previous presenters, um, non-law enforcement admittedly, but previous presenters suggested um, two specific things. And if you could just say yes or no um, to these things. One is um, simply narrowing the use of force uh, to uh, when it's necessary for um, uh, fleeing felons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, public safety reasons, but basically minimizing use of force. And the other, and this is the key, is narrowing uh, the use of police, in essence, uh, narrowing the role of police. Um, I I'm hoping you might see that there's some room for agreement, at least on this part of the discussion. But that's the question. Um, do you see a role in narrowing the use of force in uh, getting better outcomes for the public? and narrowing the role of police. And specifically, the previous presenters were talking about mental health calls um, and the large volume of non-criminal calls um, that we currently send armed police officers out to. So um, narrowing use of force and narrowing the role. Those are my two questions. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you, Chiefs. If I can, I'll start and then defer to, to Ms. Kruger from the legal perspective. Uh, and Delegate Moon, thank you. And it's, again, even if it's virtual, it's always good to see you, sir. You speak about some incidents in Montgomery County, specifically Montgomery County in your jurisdiction. And I'm mindful of the fact that in those situations, keep in mind that uh, when police officers are involved in a deadly force encounter or a serious use of force encounter, and the, those cases, specifically those resulting in the use of deadly force, they are ultimately reviewed by the state's attorney. And in your jurisdiction, I know that uh, you, while you have an absolutely outstanding state's attorney in John McCarthy, uh, Mr. McCarthy has taken the uh, position of having the state's attorney from an adjacent jurisdiction review those cases. So those cases, when they come back with the findings of the, the justifiable use of force, uh, we, we need to keep in mind that it's not just the police that are involved in this, that there are many agencies, many investigators, and we rely very heavily uh, as, as citizens on our state's attorneys to look at these cases and, and look at them objectively. You talk about the use of force of, of objective, uh, of objective reasonableness versus necessary. And I'll, I'll share this, that uh, objective reasonableness is defined in the, uh, in, in the, by the Supreme Court. The, any use of force by a police officer falls first and foremost under the Fourth Amendment. So we go back to the Constitution. The Constitution protects against unreasonable searches and seizures, and we tend to forget that seizure piece. And the application of a use of force uh, and an arrest constitutes a seizure. And so that's the starting point for the statutory language that we use. And in prior to uh, Tennessee versus Garner, a police officer could use deadly force on a fleeing felon, period. 
It didn't matter what the level of felony was. It didn't matter what the imminent threat was to the community or to the officer or, or to others. It solely rested on the fact that it was a felon and it's a fleeing felon. Tennessee versus Garner, it's case law changed that changed that practice and, and, and imposed a statutory, through case law anyway, uh, requirement on law enforcement as it relates to the use of deadly force. Likewise, under Graham versus Connor, a later court decision, they stipulated very clearly that we have to evaluate any use of force based upon objective reasonableness. We cannot look at it from a perspective of 2020 hindsight. It matters only what the officer knew or should reasonably have known at the time. When we talk about changing the standard from objective reasonableness to necessary, I would argue that our courts have defined and, and have a standard legal definition of what is objectively reasonable, and there is no standard definition of necessary. So I simply use this as an analogy. It's not necessary that I eat and I'll suffer the consequences of malnutrition, but it's certainly reasonable that I eat. It's not necessary that an officer engage an active shooter situation, but as a, as a chief of police, I have an expectation of reasonable expectation that our officers will do their job. So I, th I think there's a very real uh, difference when we look at changing the standards from what is, is defined by case law in our courts, starting with the Constitution of the United States and moving forward. As it relates to the, uh, uh, your, your other question, and I'm gonna, I, I have to beg your I have to beg your pardon if you wouldn't mind repeating the second part of that. I just lost my train of thought. I apologize. I, you know, and, and I can jump in for the second part of that if you'd like, Chief. Um, the, the second part of that question um, revolved around circumstances where um, entities besides police officers should be responding to, to certain circumstances. And you know, a, a lot of our jurisdictions have co-responder models through um, crisis intervention teams to be able to send out mental health experts in conjunction with police officers to, to a lot of these scenes. And you know, a, a lot of these, these situations, um, having those experts with us is critically important. Um, you know, we currently train all of our police officers in a, a crisis, crisis intervention, but really having those professionals with us is, is really important. Um, unfortunately, completely replacing our role and removing us from certain circumstances that could ultimately be very dangerous for, um, you know, for, for some civilians that are not equipped to handle the most dangerous of situations, sometimes puts people in, in a, a dangerous position. The co-responder model has been something that is very, has worked very well for us. Um, it's something that we certainly seek to expand because we would like to have the ability to always have those um, clinicians that are working and available. And, um, you know, I think that there are other examples of that. A lot of the, the issues that we're discussing um, have to do with other social issues that we're dealing with in society that we're looking at resolutions for. And um, whether it's having more community mediators that are immediately available to our police departments, having more social workers that are immediately available to co-respond with us when we're going out to um, you know, visit homes where there may be abuse. There are a lot of examples, but under many of these circumstances, they're not a replacement for police officers, but really an augmentation to, with us for the work that we do. Um, but Madam Chair, if I, if I may just quickly, um, I guess one, one very brief response to that is that we have a lot of these programs um, around the state, but they're minimal. They're pilot programs, they're not 24 seven. And where I've seen other jurisdictions act, they have maximized um, how much at least co-response from, um, again, someone whose job isn't um, serving an armed law enforcement capacity um, to be there. And the, the percentage of calls that appear to be of the variety that could fit in this category, not requiring armed police seems to be very high. So if you're serious about this, what I would ask is if you're going to commit to maximize um, how many calls we can handle in this manner, not just have a program, maximize it. The next question is from Delegate Acevedo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I 
I hear a number of uh, my elected colleagues um, mention a phrase, uh, reimagining public safety. Um, and when I think of that, um, uh, I think of public safety as the way uh, it should be and the way that uh, communities that I belong to imagine it, which is um, if communities do not have oversight and control uh, on the way public safety is administered in their communities, we cannot build trust. Uh, and that would, as I'm sure um, some of the folks from law enforcement would agree, uh, that lack of trust makes uh, the job of police and sheriff's departments uh, even more difficult because what you have is a community that isn't willing to uh, cooperate and to work with uh, the very people who are sworn to protect and serve them. Um, and I think we've cited a number of incidents nationally when there are incidents right here in Maryland that um, point to the inadequacy of our state laws, whether it's Freddie Gray in Baltimore City or um, Robert White and Fernand Burr here in my county to uh, Diamante Ward Blake in Prince George's County to Rakia Boyd in Baltimore County, um, where the county is still dealing with uh, a, a, a suit, as I understand it, um, a, a payment um, to Anton Black on the Eastern Shore, where, you know, uh, the officer that was uh, involved in his uh, death not only uh, was protected, um, but was allowed to drive across state lines and to be hired by another law enforcement department uh, despite concerns from the community. And so what all these debts are showing me is not just the inadequacy of our state laws, but the need for us to make really big, bold and impactful change. And so what's concerning to me is to hear testimony that in essence uh, says things uh, like, you know, uh, we should be keeping the LEOVR in place, um, that um, it in no way, and let's be clear, this is not a bill of rights, this is special privileges that we give to law enforcement officers and procedural protections that ordinary citizens that you like you and I do not enjoy. Well, some folks on this call. And it's really disturbing to not only hear things like this, but to hear things like we should be commending a former police chief for taking unprecedented action of bringing charges against an officer, which I think is an indictment, not just of the department, but the system that we would think that we would need to uh, give him credit for taking uh, action in a case of where it's blatant, unnecessary use of force. So what we're dealing with here and what we're grappling with here is testimony that in essence is telling us that the system that we have in place right now, which clearly through evidence, data, and our communities complaining is not working. And I'm deeply disturbed when I hear something like this, and I, I don't want us to focus too much on the LEOBR because yes, it is a big part of the solution, but there are also other areas of state law like the Maryland Public Information Act and um, use of force, uh, which I was also disturbed to hear some comments about from Chief Morris, um, uh, where we are in a state where we do not have statewide use of force standards. And so my question, um, you know, after listening um, to all of these comments that was largely centered around the LEOBR, and I wanted to uh, make sure that I, as well as folks tune into this committee meeting are clear. So I'm going to pose it to Sheriff Barry, as well as to uh, Sheriff Morris, I believe. Um, and that question is regarding the LEOBR. And this is a question that I've asked previous panels. If the LEOBR was repealed, would law enforcement officers still be entitled to the same due process rights that other state and local government employees have when facing discipline or disciplinary action? Right. Um, it's, it's just a pretty straightforward question that I like to find out. In addition to that, I'll ask um, Sheriff Barry a question I asked him on a previous panel, which is, as a state, do we have a statute, something codified into state law that establishes use of force standards? And the reason why I'm asking that, because again, I was quite disturbed listening to everyone's comments because it made it seem like the system that we have in place is fine. And what's clear is that's not because as was pointed out by Ms. Kruger, Maryland has 
the very unique distinction of providing America with the blueprint on how to protect corrupt and racist cops. And we provided that blueprint by passing the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights that other states have followed suit, like Wisconsin, which the chair of the Legislative Black Caucus was referring to. He was talking about Wisconsin following the lead of Maryland and being one of the 16 states that has an LEOBR that provides these kind of procedural protections that in cases where someone is blatantly shot and killed and unnecessary forces used, that officer or officers aren't arrested, no charges have been brought, no kind of a community oversight in terms of investigation. So I wanted to center the conversation back, but more importantly, to ask those two questions. One, would law enforcement, if we were to repeal the LEOBR, would law enforcement officers still have due process uh, rights as all other state and local uh, government employees when facing disciplinary action? And do we as a state have a law, a statute, that establishes use of force standards with criminal implications for officers who do not um, uh, uh, follow those standards. And, and I know some folks were talking about, you know, folks in the profession creating standards. We are the folks, the legislators, that establish those standards through legislation. So that responsibility rests with us, and that's what we're trying to do here. Establish what is a standard that would allow for the cases where we see disproportionate use of force used against black and brown people be ended. So if y'all could add, um, answer those questions, uh, those two questions regarding the LEOBR and use of force, I would appreciate that. Thank um, you, Del. Oh, I can, Karen, did you want to go or I can go? Uh, go ahead, Chief. You uh, have me. Uh, thank you, Delegate. I really appreciate uh, your time being on the call. In reference to that's why I frame my remarks in reference to the repealing or replacing of the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights in forms of questions. Uh, as I said in my remarks earlier, that all government employees are entitled to due process when it comes to discipline and termination. And my, in, in an open statement, if you're going to repeal or replace it as the sheriff, you know, how am I going to go about managing my, my agency in reference to discipline or removal of officers? So I really don't, if we take away the law enforcement bill of rights where it stands, I don't know what we're moving towards. Uh, Delegate Barnes had some conversation about what was going on in, um, in other jurisdiction in regards to Mr. Jacob Blakes. But if you do research on the particular incident, uh, that particular governing body, that agency is not investigating that officer involved situation. That has been deferred to a state entity. So that particular chief, it cannot be held accountable or give insight to what's going on with that shooting and investigation because through legislative process, the state entity is now doing the investigation. So uh, those are some of, my, some of my concerns in reference to repealing some of these things that we're talking about. As a sheriff, I'm held accountable of what criminally happens in our community. And I, I, I think I will, be, I will feel uh, it would be very difficult for me to sit idly by and let an outside organization do the, do the investigation. So, so looking at that situation with Mr. Blakes, that is being held up and investigated by the state. And the answers that cannot come from a law enforcement entity that was involved. Those answers have to come by either the state prosecutor, the attorney general, or whatever state entity is looking into that. So that's, those, those why, that's why my questions in reference to the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights were placed in questions. What are we moving towards? So to, that, to know what we're transitioning to is going to be very hard for me to say, is the process going to meet the ends of the General Assembly and equally meets the ends of uh, allow me to manage a, a law enforcement organization? In reference to the Law Enforcement Office of Bill of Rights, and you're talking specifically about use of force, it's this all-encompassing uh, case law establishes is a, a use of force reasonable or necessary. Uh, Chief Morris talked about uh, for amendment, uh, fourth, the Fourth uh, Amendment of the U.S. Constitution talking about seizure of an individual. Also, the 26th Article of the Maryland Delegate, uh, uh, Declaration of Rights talks about seizing and, and also talks about use of force. And if you look at federal standards, uh, 42 U.S. Code 
subsection 183, 28 United States Code, subsection 220, uh, 242, those incidents outlined if uh, actions of an individual, particularly law enforcement officers, or just individuals using force to protect them or, or someone else or, or, or to ward off or attack, those through case law, through the law of the land has established a framework of how we go about creating policy within the sheriff's offices in the state of Maryland, within our police departments in the state of Maryland, to be able to codify policies, to be able to hold our staff members accountability when they use force in the performance of the duties. So it is not we arbitrarily coming up with policies, rules and procedures. We're doing them in conjunction with state law and also federal law. Uh, if I just may, I want to follow up, uh, Sheriff Barry. What do you say when we, when we talk about independent investigations? What is your response in terms of transparency to the community when there has been a police shooting and handing that over? We're just we'll just keep it simple for this conversation. There's been a, a shooting and there's been a murder by a police officer. Well, I should take away the, the word murder, but there's been a shooting and somebody has died. What do you say to the community that's calling for transparency? Uh, you know, you want to hold on to the investigation, but they don't, we, and I'm going to put myself in there too. We don't yep. trust you to hold on to that investigation. We are good. We expect you to take care of your own, whether you say we don't do that, we do the right thing and, and all of that, I get it, but that is not the perception out there. So what do you, do you have a problem with handing just, where there's been a, a shooting and a killing by a police officer of a citizen handing that over to an independent agency sitting right here. I don't know what that would be, whether that would be the attorney general, whether some you know brand new agency would be set up, I don't know. But what do you say in term, in that specific situation? Well, I think in that particular situation, Delegate Atterbury, I, I, again, it's I've been elected to, to address this particular issue. But the problem is, is that I have to live with the outcome of whatever state agency or whatever organization is. And I may not agree with that outcome. And, and the thing is, it's hard for me to be held accountable for something, for a process that I uh, didn't agree with initially, because I think that through the elected sheriff under this, under my circumstances, also through the elected state's attorneys, it's just through processes that we have here in Charles County. If there's a death, not just not talking about law enforcement, just a death in general, those conversations are happening between our two organizations to address that particular issue. But moving forward, we would just have to see how how that particular process will play out. As I outlined in my opening remarks, who's going to fund it? Who's going who's going to do the prosecution? You know, because I, I would I would imagine that some of the uh, local state's attorneys will have some exception of potentially removing the, that particular investigation if we choose to have a statewide investigatory body uh, to look at that case. So there's a lot of nuances in that. And that's why in your opening remarks we talked about uh, earlier, those are continued discussions that we're working through the work group to have uh, to see these particular process, but just on the surface, not know what we're transitioning to. It's hard for me to give a blanket and full throat agreement about a process that hasn't been codified and no one knows what that process looks like. I can, I can appreciate that response. Um, I, I, you know, never been an elected sheriff, but I would suggest you all have been elected to protect yes, and serve. And, and one of those, what, one of those duties, you know, your constituents might want you to hand something like that off uh, to, to another uh, body. But uh, next delegate McComas had a question and then delegate uh, Buckle. Chair, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I just want to say, I think that as we go forward, this is getting more complicated instead of simple, to, to my mind. All right. Uh, so I kind of want to back the truck up a little bit and ask either um, uh, Ms. Kruger or uh, the sheriff the question. As, as I see it, um, the laws that are in play here is the Constitution of the United States takes precedent, then the federal law, and then probably the Maryland Constitution. And then because of Baltimore City, I would say the consent order. And, and then 
um, then the collective bargaining, and then the LEOBR. And I mean, is that kind of how the, is that sort of the pecking order um, as far as, as the different layers of laws and the priority of those laws? I guess the only way, uh, the only place I would disagree with you, Delegate McComas, is that I think the LEOBR as a statewide law would override the collective bargaining agreements. So those are individually negotiated agreements within different municipalities. So they would sort of have, have the lowest rank, so to speak, if that's helpful. So you feel, okay, so the LEOBR has priority over any collective bargaining agreements at the county level, or the, let's say hypothetically the state level or the city level, the municipal level. level. Yes, we could describe okay. that. But otherwise that's kind of the pecking order. Uh, yes, that's a fair. Yeah, and the consent order for the city takes precedence over the um, LEOBR and the collective bargaining, because the Baltimore City consent order by the courts? Well, except for the fact that the consent order can't direct the Baltimore Police Department to violate state law. Oh, okay. All right. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Uh, my question then goes to, all right, now I know that a lot of, a lot of, um, youth groups are being kind of educated as if you are stopped by the police, you know, this is how you should proceed and everything. Do we have any idea how successful those, those, those um, educational uh, techniques and ideas are for the kids? Uh, does any, can anybody comment on that for, for children of color or, or white children, you know, any, 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 any new drivers or, or teenagers, uh, adolescents? Delegate here in Charles County, we had a program that we work with the local chapter of the NAACP. Uh, I've been sheriff six years and we worked on uh, a campaign uh, through our school systems was called Comply and Complain. Uh, educating our young people uh, about the interactions with law enforcement. What are your rights? Uh, what uh, you can do to make these, uh, these uh, encounters uh, to get a desire in where you, the officer is able to achieve the objective to, and, and we hope and pray everything goes well and the young people can go home safely. So to your point, it was about uh, things to do and not do in reference to driving. Make sure that uh, if you're pulled over, you pull all the way over, keep your hands on the steering wheel. Uh, once the officer approaches the car, you explain to them, I'm going to be going to reach for my driver's license and wherever the driver's license was. Uh, if they're in fact that they're going to the glove box to get the registration card, you have a conversation with them, to, with the officers and explain to them, I'm going to my registration is in a glove box and ask permission to do so. So, and also the street encounters uh, about the do's and don'ts of street encounters. So we, we did an initiative, which I thought worked very well here in Charles County. Again, it was comply, complain, uh, comply with the officer's request. But if they, in fact, believe that something went wrong, they could ask for a supervisor to come to the scene of the incident. Uh, if they were having a disagreement with the officer, which was there, uh, which is not codified in our policy here in Charles County. And in, in the event that there was some formalized effort that they want to make a formalized complaint, explain to them the complaint procedures, how you go about it, complaining to internal affairs, and those matters will be investigated at a later time. So it was a significant initiative that we did in Charles County and it worked very well. And again, it was called Comply and Complain. Okay, just one other question. And, and I know uh, I, I know that the one incident, I believe it was in Montgomery County where the person was handcuffed and, sh and killed uh, you know, in the police car, that, that was horrific. But do you feel that, um, do, do you feel what's gone on in, in Wisconsin with, with Mr. Blake and with Mr. Floyd, do you feel, at least you can only probably speak for Charles County, but the, the but but the education by the uh, training academy and everything. Do you feel that those things would have happened? Do you think that I mean, the, obviously, what's happening in Wisconsin and and throughout the country is is sort of what's upsetting everybody. And I'm just asking if. Um, are we really in that bad a shape that we need to, to make massive changes, you know, like throw out the LEOBR and, and things like that? Um, I mean, is, in other words, is that really necessary that we have to kind of upend the whole system here? Well, delegate, that's why we're it's delicate. And, and delegate. It, you know, do one thing, it's going to affect something else. <laughs> it's like, it's like, um, 
you know, taken taken out the foundation and the building might crumble is what I'm concerned about, you know, because there's gonna there's pluses and minuses and in legislation there's always unintended consequences and you can never you you can never crystal ball happen. It you know it's the unintended consequences and they're they're always there in everything you do because you know we can't think of everything and we don't have a crystal ball. So I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on that. Well, what I will say that it, it has been echoed by Chief Morris. And we've had conversation with sheriffs and chiefs and even our staff members. What we're seeing nationally is very troubling. And uh, as we have always been, Maryland sheriffs and chiefs are, want to be at the table with our General Assembly members to see how we can come about and do things more transparent and, and bring ease to uh, the people in the great state of Maryland. But I, I want to go back to my remarks, my open remarks. There are certain things as, as a sheriff that I have been pushing for here in Charles County, but as an elected sheriff, I go to other elected individuals for budget items. I think that we should have been had body worn cameras in Charles County, but unfortunately it wasn't funded. And I hear that from other law enforcement to create that transparency and, and also uh, bring about confidence in our law enforcement entities. And I haven't heard of a chief or sheriff in the state of Maryland that doesn't want body worn cameras, but we just don't, some of us just don't have the budget to do it at this time to create that transparency that the general assembly is looking for. So we're partners in you in, in that regard. Uh, for example, things I talked about problem solving courts, delegate moon was talking about mental health and substance abuse issues. We see the same people on our streets, whether it's petty kind of crimes or issues breaking into cars and we know that they suffer from mental health issues or we know that the reason why they're committing these particular crimes is in order to support their put their habit their drug habit but our problem is is that i'm trying to bring these particular amenities in charles county to address the issues because the symptom is when they end up in, in having a contact with law enforcement end up in my jail it's because of mental health. It's because of substance abuse issues. So we are able to bring those mitigating those, uh, bring those amenities to our community to address those issues. And hopefully they will not be in the criminal justice system. Hopefully they will not have those negative encounters. So this is where we can partner with some of these initiatives to do things on a statewide basis to address those particular things in our community, whether it's body worn cameras, whether it's enhance our roles in, in, in uh, uh, substance abuse uh, centers or, or mental health facilities. So we need some additional tools on the ground to be able to help our officers better uh, uh, better manage the situations in our, in our community. Because again, we do have a number of individuals that have substance abuse issues. We do have a number of individuals in our community that suffer from mental health. But if we had those particular centers, if we had those particular uh, dollars allocated where where we could have a co-response with our law enforcement officers. I don't have those particular things on my budget, but these are things that we can offer and work together to hopefully mitigate some of these issues that we're seeing on a national level. Madam Chair, if I may, uh, I think part of the, the delegates questions was talking about how we're doing here in Maryland and uh, my colleague from uh, the commissioner from Baltimore City, uh, as well as Chief Hyatt sit on several national panels and I, I think that they could uh, offer some insight, if you will, and not to prolong this, but I think it's important to recognize where Maryland is when we're looking at this nationally, if I may. Next, Delegate Buckle has a question and then Delegate Davis. Oh, wait till you're unmuted. Look at that, I can zoom. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, I, I had a question or two about an hour, an hour ago as we worked through this. So I just have one or two points. Some of it has been addressed. Uh, I did want to say that I think everyone on this call is coming from a perspective of goodwill and that's important. It's important whether you're uh, black, whether you're white, whether you're Hispanic, whatever your background is, pro-police, suspicious or concerned about police, we're not gonna solve these problems unless we all work together in goodwill. We, we can't, we, we have to bring more light to the situation and heat to the situation. And so I appreciate everyone's comments to that. Um, I've heard some interesting things. The most interesting thing I've heard in the last two hours is that Daryl Barnes is 55 years old. 
Uh, who, who would have thunk it? You know, who would have thought that? I thought you were 39, Daryl. Uh, that's what you tell everyone on our committee every year. So it's working out for you. In, in, substantively, honestly, citizen input on uh, uh, hearing boards or, or law enforcement officer bill of rights entities. I, I support that in, in concept. I think that that makes some sense. But my question to the professionals in the field who, who really work with these hearing boards on a day to day basis, it seems that one of the number one stumbling blocks to getting that done is you have to identify civilian, civilians who really have a background and substantive knowledge in law, in policing standards, and also have the willingness to come and do this probably for no or very little pay, and also don't have bias. We don't want anyone on these boards to be biased. We don't want the police officers to be biased and I'm just gonna protect this guy because he's my friend or he's my department or he's a police officer. And we don't want people to get put on here as civilian uh, participants who have a bias that are looking to hammer them. So that's a hard thing to do. My first question is do, with that preamble, do any of you have any suggestions as to how we can begin a system of identifying qualified civilians, getting them trained, getting them participatory, and eliminating any perceived biases in their uh, quasi-judicial capacity. Well, um, Delegate Buckle, I think I can speak to that, and I don't mean to cut the commissioner off if he has something to add, because um, I am aware that the Baltimore Police Department has under undergone this process, and it has been um, an elaborate and challenging process to seek applicants um, to set standards for those applicants, um, to screen applicants for um, the issues that you mentioned. And then there is um, a 40 hour training program um, in which they must participate uh, so that they are educated on areas of the law, areas of policing, areas of first aid and all the plethora of subjects that law enforcement officers are trained in um, and then additionally, they are asked to um, essentially donate their time. I believe Baltimore provides some compensation, um, but it's minimal. And it's a pretty um, demanding duty, frankly, to sit on a hearing board. Um, and I admire the commitment of these people, um, but it has yet to be put into practice um, as to whether it will work. Um, the issue of bias, of course, is an important one and it's difficult to measure that uh, ahead of time. Um, but I know that's something that the Baltimore Police Department has. Well, that seemed to me that would have to be one of the concerns is I hear and, and I, I empathize with the, the position that some of my colleagues have taken of, you know, you have these hearing boards and it's all, it's all blue. It's all police officers. Um, of course, whether the reality is there's some bias there or whether the public just perceives it is, but we also probably can't have civilian participants who have self-identified themselves as activists in this field for one reason or another. Uh, I want to work. I hope that our commission works. I hope that's the direction we go next month as we go or two months as we, well, yeah, two months as we come up with recommendations to work with all of you to come up with a way to create a statewide group of individuals who have the requisite skills and backgrounds to do this so that my colleagues and, and communities that they care very much about feel like they're getting a fair shake uh, when these uh, hearing boards are commenced. And also at the same time, we're not just throwing officers to the wolves of, you know, we have somebody on here who did the 40 hours of training, but they're clearly uh, from a particular standpoint. So anything you guys can think about in the coming weeks as we work towards our conclusion on that issue, I'd be very appreciative. I, I had a second question. Can I add just one more comment? Sure. Buckle, I'm sorry. You know, in the 1980s, there was a large, very important commission established to investigate the New York City Police Department called the Mullen Commission. Mm -hmm. And the chair of that commission was Judge Mullen. And one of, um, one of the most meaningful things he said in the course of that commission's work was that the greatest enemy of a good cop is a crooked cop. Right. And I would suggest that's a sentiment worth bearing in mind um, when we ask questions about whether officers are 
fairly sitting in judgment of their fellow officers. And, so and that brings up a good yeah. point when you mentioned the judge. We have a lot of retired judges in Maryland. 70 years old is our automatic retirement age for the judiciary. And of course, we all know now that a lot of people are still very physically and mentally active in, in their 70s. Maybe that's something for us just all as an aside to think about. Maybe you get some retired judges who have kind of the background and some of this training and can more easily pick up the concepts and have spent their entire careers trying to be impartial. Maybe plug them into some of these roles is just an idea. My, my second question really is the use of force question. I, I looked at a document from the Maryland Police Training and Standards Commission, which says that they've adopted some of these best practices for use of force. And I think the language says officers may use force that is objectively, that's a key word, objectively, reasonable, that's a key word, reasonable, uh, and appears to be necessary, that's key, under the circumstances. Is that your guys' understanding of what the, the Maryland Training Commission's standard or guideline for use of force is? Is, is that that formulation? I believe, did you obtain that from the website? Uh, I, I got it. I don't know if it's from their website. I got it from a, from a, a, a document from the Police Training and Standards Commission. I don't know okay. if it came off of their website or was something that they had promulgated previously. Right. Well, um, I had served for two years as the executive director of the Maryland Police Stand Training and Standards Commission. And um, we worked on that document, worked on those um, principles based on the direction provided in House Bill 1016. Um, and it is the expectation that every law enforcement agency in Maryland consult those principles while drafting their individual use of force policies. So if we mandated those, because I've heard a concern that makes some sense to me, if we have a hundred and some different police agencies, and sometimes, you know, you drive in a two mile distance and you go through three or four different jurisdictions for who's, who's got law enforcement responsibility, would that be something law enforcement would consider, okay, if we're going to mandate a universal standard, that would be a basis for the language so that everybody is following that standard. I think that is something that could be fairly well considered because, um, you know, as the executive director, I had the opportunity to review many, many policies from many different agencies. And they, the variations are very small because everyone is seeking to comply with the state and, con and federal constitutional standards. So the variations are, are so small there in terms of format or choosing one small word over another. Um, so I think that there, there could certainly be the possibility of there being a voluntary acceptance of a statewide policy. And I, I say that without having consulted my clients, the okay. chief sheriffs. And, and I just sort of a final question for the, about that for the, for the sheriffs, for the active duty officers who are on here. Um, I'm very candid about it. My, my father was a police officer 35 years ago, briefly for a period of time. In my professional capacity as an attorney, I've, I've represented a wide variety of police officers in, in non-disciplinary criminal type matters, but in other fields of their lives. And one thing that I've heard from a lot of them is you can't specifically legislate a fight. Mm -hmm. And as we've seen in some of these terrible, tragic situations where people lose lives, where officers have been shot, where officers have taken the lives of others, a lot of it starts with a fight with, with someone doesn't want to comply or something happens and you have a physical altercation. I've been lucky to be in very few physical altercations as an adult, but, but a couple, I used to own a bar and in bars you have bar fights. And sometimes if you're there and you own it, you have to participate. What is your thoughts on as, as active officers, supervisors of active officers, how do you specifically legislate things like what they call, you know, chokeholds. I don't know exactly what that means, but I've been in a fight before where if an individual is bigger than you or stronger than you or more aggressive than you, and you think they might have a weapon or they might hurt you, you have to be able to restrain them in whatever means necessary. Mm -hmm. um, what's the law enforcement perspective on these very specific, we're going to legislate that you can do this, but you can't do that. And I want to just finish by prefacing it. I'm all for the objective standard. I'm all for reasonableness. I'm all for, you know, what happened to George Floyd. You have a man handcuffed. He's laying on the ground. You have five officers, four officers around him. That man's not a threat. He's not a threat to anyone anymore. There's no need to restrain him the way that he was restrained. 
but I'm talking about individuals in the middle of an active situation. What are your guys' thoughts on how we possibly could uh, legislate the specifics of that and where would be the pitfalls? Can I touch on that just for a minute? Absolutely, Chief. Thank you. I want to go back. Thank you for that. I want to go back to your first point first about the civilians on the hearing boards. And certainly okay. what is in the process of that. But I wanted to just add that not only do we do the 40-hour course, but we, we compel all of the civilians to do ride-alongs with officers on all three shifts so that they can get a clear understanding and a bird's eye view of what we go through on a daily basis, on an evening basis, and throughout the middle of the night uh, so that they can have a clear perspective. But we have a wide range of applicants from all walks of life. I will say the vast majority, if not all of them, are highly educated. Um, and we will be happy to share with you the criteria by which we use to select these individuals. And, and certainly Ms. Kruger, can, Ms. Kruger can talk about the training that went into training them. But they're, they're very, I don't know that any of them are, uh, you know, are too far to the left or too far to the right, but they're very highly educated and have a lot of capacity to understand what it is we do. And they have the will to learn. And through the training and the ride along, many of them have had very enlightened perspectives now because they got to see firsthand. So we'll be happy to share that with you. Thank you. And you can see if anybody's interested in that, we'll make it available to everybody. Number two, the work I'm doing with the U.S. Conference of Mayors made up of 1,400 cities and in essence, 1,400 police departments across the country about use of force is that our recommendations were about departments establishing their own set of standards that meet community expectations. Now, we did suggest that some states might be right to to have some level of legislation, the by and, by and large, we talked about it was better to regulate the standards rather than to legislate the standards. What I mean by that is when it comes to de-escalation, peer intervention, all those things that go into use of force, it's all about training. Uh, and you were right, how do you legislate a fight? So to that point, you're right. But it's impossible to create a complicated policy, policy and have everyone memorize every word because part of it is the muscle memory we have to learn into dealing with the use of force. To be successful, we want those officers to have that muscle memory to be able to make the right decision in a split second decision so that they won't miscalculate it and cause someone some injury or life. That's always the goal. What we're recommending is that Maryland Standards and Training Commission is probably most uniquely qualified to establish the standards by which they approve or regulate every department standards to make sure the standards meet that regulation as opposed to the legislation, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you. And I don't know if anybody else had anything to add to that or we can move on, Madam Chair. I don't have any more questions. Okay, thank you. I, I think one of the most interesting things I learned was you owned a bar and participated in bar fights. I, I did, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> Not participate, I helped break them up. That's a good one. Delegate uh, Davis, and then we will have Delegate Anderson. One second. There you go. Okay, I am enjoying the conversation, and I um, I have some input and question. Um, if we're going to have the conversation, we all have to understand that we come from different places, different parts of the state. We have different backgrounds. We have different cultural backgrounds. So we bring all of us bring that to this conversation. But there's some things that we can't avoid. And that is this fact that Maryland leads the nation in incarcerating young black men. We cannot have the discussion without at least in a vacuum. That has to be part of our discussion. And, you know, and, and thank you, Madam Chair, for bringing out the elephant in the room. We're here now because the citizenry of our state and the country are demanding change. So all this leave things alone is not working. Um, so I challenge us, when we talk about LEOBR, I got a lot to talk about, but I'm gonna narrow it down. LEOBR is a employment right, and we're talking about civil rights. And, I, and so I think we can draw a balance somewhere, somewhere there. And back to the sheriff from Charles County, um, and I want to talk to my, my, my colleague, Delegate McComas. Um, institutional racism exists, and it exists in Maryland also. Um, and um, back to, my, to the sheriff in Charles County, isn't it true that every 
police car in Charles County has a dashboard camera. I would submit that it's not knowing what's happening, it's enforcing what's happening, that's the issue. Um, and you know, I get calls all the time that, and I think the concern with us now is that the records, the cameras, the recordings aren't being used to enforce disciplinary procedures and they aren't being transparent. So if, if um, Sheriff Barry could address that, I'd appreciate it. Well, thank you, Delegate, and I appreciate you being part of the work group, but this issue that you're bringing up is the first that I've heard of it. And what we do in our, we have an internal affairs section who does audits of our audio and video cameras that our officers, this is just independent audits in reference to making sure that our staff members are one, using the cameras, two, that the recording mics are uh, being used on the cameras. So hopefully we can have an independent witness in reference to any issue that has been brought up to uh, uh, in reference to our staff members. Uh, I'm, I'm open for more transparency. That's why I have been pushing for additional cameras, particularly body-worn cameras for our staff members, because it's critically important, as you has already articulated and as many of the legislators have already articulated, that it's important to be able to have that additional assurance from uh, uh, with those cameras to bring about some confidence and transparency to people in the community. So as we already articulate, and I don't want to beat a dead horse, it's just going to come with a significant financial commitment from our, our local uh, delegation. If I may, Madam Chair, yes. um, you, you didn't answer the question. All units currently have dashboard cameras, correct? All of our patrol units have dashboard cameras, yes, ma'am. Right. Thank you. Okay. Next, Delegate Anderson. Yeah, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, my question also is of Chief Barry, and that is... Uh, the last time we heard from you uh, was about a month and a half ago when you were representing the Maryland Police Training and Standards Commission. And I think I asked you then uh, to take a look at the uh, Baltimore City uh, use of force protocol. I believe uh, Chief Harrison uh, announced it uh, several months ago, maybe even last year. Uh, it's a 15, 16 page document. It's extremely, um, it was uh, vetted by the uh, I guess the Baltimore City Police, the police officers, the FOP, uh, the Justice Department, the United States District Court, as well as citizens of the, of the city of Baltimore. And I know that you, you got that message and, and you said you transferred the information or you at least you're asking the chiefs and sheriffs to look into that. What's the status of that now? Those conversations and reference use of force policies, as you already know, uh, Delegate Anderson, uh, uh, the repository from the Police Training and Standards Commission, set out the best practices. You know that you know through the process that the Police Training and Standards Commission is uh, just a best practices. Uh, uh, we we compile these uh, policies and rules, but we but do. I'm, excuse me for interrupting. Is that last time we talked? I I said, take a look at uh, Baltimore City's use of force policy that is in place right now. Uh, have the stand have the commission take a look at it and get back to us as to whether or not, um, whether it would be, you know, whether we could try to use that policy as a statewide policy. And we will meet next month to address that particular issue, what you're talking about. You know that we meet uh, quarterly and we're scheduled, that's agenda item to be on there and talk to in reference to the commission specifically of that issue. Okay. Uh, the other questions regard to body cameras, uh, if we were to pass a statewide law re uh, requiring each police agency to have body cameras, um, would that mean that you would have to come up with the money from your own budget, or do you think that your county would include uh, additional funds for you in that, or would we have to put into the law uh, something re requiring the counties to do this? Well, as you know, there's very difficult in reference to unfunded mandates. We have COVID-19 issues. Just, just for my personal note, uh, my last of my uh, uh, fiscal year budget in 2020, uh, we had to take out almost a half a million dollars out of my budget to address some of the COVID-19 situations. So I, we just, the, well, we're being told from just locally, uh, our budget situation is not stable. We don't know what that's going to be and some of the other items that the county had to pay for to the point, I don't know where we are in reference to being able to fund that project. 
I have a number of requests in the pipeline and we're just working through the budgetary process to make this particular initiative happen. But we, like I said earlier, it's going in Charles County for a full complement, it's going to cost 1.5 to 1.7 for <laughs> us to do it. So I, I just don't know where we are in the budget process, but we're still working with our board of county commissioners to make it happen. Last question, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chief Harrison, how are you doing, sir? <coughs> my, my question is to Chief Harrison. Can doing you very me? well. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate. Doing very well. Thank you. You? Okay. Um, a second ago, you said that, uh, I at least perceive what you were saying, is that even though uh, the Baltimore City Police has a use of force policy in place, you don't think it should be uh, a statewide legislative mandate because of the you know how intricate it is is that correct well, it's not that i said i don't think it should be a statewide mandate uh i'm doing some work with the u.s conference of mayors who put out a national report uh to the 1400 cities in that national report our collective recommendations uh made up of three mayors and three police chiefs from around the country those collective recommendations said while there may be some uh some necessity for some states to do that by and large the, the recommendation was to, uh, to regulate it through training commissions from state to state, and that it would be a requirement of each state to come up with a use of force policy that number one meets the community needs, uh, deals with the sanctity of life, the duty to intervene, rendering first aid, all of the things we've been talking about, all of the things community members have been asking for. Uh, and so that each state would require that through its training regulation, but not necessarily legislation. Okay, who were the contributors to your use of force policy? Our use of force policy was made up by members of the BPD uh, and our compliance team that deals with consent decree, the Department of Justice and the consent decree monitoring team. But that use of force policy went out for community input for two 30 day cycles. And we got community input for 30 days and then we weighed that community input on what we uh, were looking at as a national best practice. And then it went out for a second round. And even our labor organizations um, offer input into the development of that policy. And so for two rounds of 30 days, that policy went out for community input uh, and you know, even members of our own department weighed in on it. And then it was ultimately approved by the consent decree monitoring team and the federal judge. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Um, so the uh, last uh, question is going to uh, follow up from uh, Delegate Acevedo, who, who was stuck on mute and couldn't get a follow up out. And then I'll have a wrap up comment and then we'll close this panel out. I appreciate your uh, indulgence as we're significantly over our timeline, but this is a critical, critical topic right now. So, Delegate Acevedo. Thank you so very much, Madam Chair, and I appreciate the indulgence. I'll be brief. Um, I just wanted to circle back on my question because I didn't get an answer to it. I'm uh, hoping Chief Morrissey can perhaps answer the question. Um, uh, my question was, uh, if the LEOBR was repealed, would law enforcement officers still, because what, 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 what I'm hearing is, is that the LEOBR is about due process, due process. That's a word that keeps coming up. So I'd like to know, uh, Chief Morris, that if uh, the LEOBR was repealed, would law enforcement officers still be entitled to the same due process rights that other state and local government em uh, employees have when facing disciplinary action? And then real quick to any police chief that wants to chime in and respond, um, uh, uh, there was a lot of discussion about body cameras and body cameras, and I agree with uh, uh, Chief Hyatt that uh, body cameras not only protect officers, they protect the public as well. And I'm curious in the jurisdictions that do have body cameras um, uh, or, or, or require that um, officers wear body worn cameras, do you all have policies in your respective jurisdictions um, where if an officer or officers were to uh, switch off their camera or not have their camera on while on duty or on patrol, is there kind? Um, is there any kind of a disciplinary action or action that's taken? Because yes, body worn cameras helps uh, provide the, the totality of the situation. But what we're seeing is incidents of where police officers either switch off cameras, uh, 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 they do not turn on cameras, and that's a big part of your job and a big part of 
uh, patrolling our communities. And so I'm curious if any other juris, um, if the jurisdictions that do have body worn cameras, what kind of uh, ramifications are there for officers that switch it off or don't don't turn it on uh, when you're on the clock? But again, my first question is about the LEOBR and if we were to take the action to repeal it, would law enforcement officers still be entitled to the same due process rights? So delicate, thank you for the, the questions and the opportunity. And I appreciate the fact that you uh, circled back because it is an important piece of the discussion. And in, in short, the LEOBR, while it provides certain due process rights, it also provides for measures where I, as, an, as, as the chief of police or the investigators, can compel statements from police officers. Uh, there, there are certain provisions in, in the sense that permits them to have uh, a period of time to get an attorney, to um, uh, meet with that attorney and so forth. But at the end of the day, uh, they, are, they can be compelled to give a statement administratively. And I have to emphasize administratively and keeping in mind that those administratively compelled duress statements cannot be used in a criminal proceeding. So we have to be careful in our approach. So the answer to your question is really that we're asking the police officers to do something significantly different from an employment perspective than any other employer. And that's why the LEOBR exists. And I would, I would suggest that there's not been a, a single statement from any of the law enforcement professionals on this call that suggests that there aren't provisions of the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights that can be amended, uh, that can be changed. Uh, we support those conversations and there are recommendations for change that we have proffered ourselves, similar to recommendations as it relates to the PIA, and we conceded and, and frankly testified in favor of a bill last year sponsored by, uh, sponsored by the chair uh, that would have released certain records uh, regardless of the LEOBR. So I do suggest that we are, are con continue to be open to these conversations and we, have, and we appreciate and respect the amount of work that you and, and your colleagues have done in trying to bring these matters to light. And we wanna continue to work in that regard. As it relates to the body-worn cameras, my agency does have a body-worn camera program. It did not come without a significant cost. And to Delicate Davis's point earlier, uh, my agency has dash cams as well. Uh, they're less expensive and from a process perspective. And we instituted them back in 2012. It took another six years for me to be able, not to be able to convince my uh, mayor and council of the need, but to be able to create the funding necessary to be able to fund the, the body worn cameras. Because keep in mind, the dash cam only captures all the police officer exits that vehicle. They, uh, then, then the body camera footage becomes uh, very important. And most specifically to your question, yes, my agency and the policies that I've looked at and the policy recommendations from IACP as well as the Body Worn Camera Commission here in Maryland uh, stipulate that there are penalties and disciplinary actions as it relates to officers who fail to turn on or turn off their cameras when, uh, when, when they should be either operating or not operating. And we, we will defer in lieu of leaving the camera running versus turning it off, even in those situations where uh, individuals request that we cease filming. Um, so uh, to answer your question, yes, there are disciplinary measures in place to address those concerns. And, we, and, and when we find those during audits or during reviews of, uh, for other incidents where the body camera footage was captured, then we take appropriate action. Thank you. Um, and so my question before uh, we wrap up is really um, an ask. Um, our speaker pro tem had a question in the chat. Chief Hyatt, I neglected to ask the second part of the question. In your recent research, can you provide the cost of one officer to attend implicit bias training? Um, so you don't have to answer now. We'll send um, this question to you with um, some others that Delegate Fisher had um, to the association. And then I would also ask, just as a starting point, and we're going to continue these conversations, if you could take a look at the MPTC's best practices and, you know, 
following up on Delegate Buckle's uh, comments, which, one does, uh, which ones of these can you live with being mandates? Um, and I don't see in here actually anything there. They do have something re related to less lethal force, force training, but they don't have anything specific to um, chokeholds. Um, if you could think about that in your uh, response too, because there have been um, various states since May who have passed different legislation related to chokeholds. Um, I would appreciate that. So thank you very much. You all have stayed with us for a significant amount of time. I appreciate it. Um, and I know that the work group appreciates it. Um, and we will continue these conversations. So thank you very much to all of you. Um, next, we have a panel. Um, the FOP has a panel. And I will let them all uh, come on. Uh, Mr. Frank Boston, Vince Canales, president of the Maryland State uh, Fraternal Order of Police, and Michael Davey. And then there are uh, two, the, the members of the work group, there are a couple other uh, FOP presidents who are on, who aren't necessarily part of the panel, but who are going to be available for questions um, should, should they be needed. So uh, first, thank you very much to the FOP members uh, for your indulgence. Uh, we had a timeline that was obviously completely blown. Um, so I appreciate you uh, hanging on um, and, and being here today. So Mr. Boston, are you ready or do you need to punt to Mr. Canales? Um, I'll let you, you gotta get unmuted there. Hold on one second, Frank. Okay, there you go. Okay, I am ready. Um, okay. If you can hear me, I'm first first of all, I'm Frank Boston the third. I'm here on behalf of the Maryland Fraternal Order of Police, and we thank you for the opportunity uh, to present to the panel. I am. I, I must tell you, I apologize to the committee. I am driving my daughter back to college today, and I stopped for two and a half hours. And uh, of course, when I got back on the road. My name got called, but I will be brief. Um, and uh, in, in my testimony, as we'll save the bulk of it for Mr. Davies. Um, presenting today with us will, uh, with a few comments will be uh, our president, Vince Canales. Um, he may not be able to join in, he will attempt to. He is listening, but he is having technical difficulties. In his absence, with your permission, Madam Chair, our first Vice President, Clyde Boatwright, one of the uh, assigned speakers, will have a few words for the President in, in his absence. Okay. Um, also presenting, um, and will give a thorough but practical review of the LEOBR, will be our lawyer, Mike Davey, uh, who is our labor lawyer for the state FOP. Um, not presenting testimony, uh, we have Dave Rhodes, who's the president of Baltimore County FOP, uh, who will be just present for questions uh, at the end of the presentation. And <clears throat> on behalf of our 20,000 members, active and retired of the FOP, we certainly understand the current environment and the cry for change. You know, that said, we strongly believe that the LEOBR works well and it's a compilation of many of years of dedication to make it better for all parties involved. We look forward to working with this group to preserve the logical components of LEOBR and having a thoughtful discussion on the issues that this work group raises. Thank you. And at this point, I would like to turn it over to Clyde Boatwright. Thank you, uh, Mr. Boston and safe travels, taking your daughter back to college. And I'll just say what I said to the police chiefs uh, and sheriffs, as you all know, um, you know, our chairman's door has, has always been open. I'm always open. So um, this is a, a dialogue that we, we are happy uh, to start. So Mr. Boatwright. Thank you. Good, uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, this work group is an important work. Um, again, my name is Clyde Boatwright, and I'm the first vice president of Maryland State Fraternal Order Police. Um, and as Frank said, we represent over 20,000 members. Um, 
on behalf of those 20,000 members, we're certainly glad and excited to be a part of this process. Um, you know, being able to sit down and have these courageous conversations is important to us. Uh, I think um, I heard some of the testimony earlier today, and I think that there were some very uh, good points brought up by some of the presenters. And more importantly, I think some of the questions that were asked by the delegates um, comprised in this work group were equally as important. I think uh, we have a unique opportunity now uh, to be change uh, leaders, uh, and we have important work ahead of us but it starts with these courageous conversations. I think we need to understand why we're here. Why was the LEOBR created? And I know um, Mike Davey, who is the, the best expert that I can ever think about um, on LEOBR will address some of that. But if you look back and think back to 1974 when this document was created, you know, this law was created, it was created as a, as a stopgap to stop police chiefs that were heavy handed from not doing investigations and just firing police officers without just with without cause, without cause. That's how we got here, and it was an abuse of power by some of the people that were selected to lead police departments in order to enact some sort of uh, retribution against police officers who are out there working. I think it's also important that we look um, as to how it affected. Um, minority officers, because I heard, I heard that conversation brought up. Um, I mean, we had an issue um, that goes back into the late 1990s and 2000s in Baltimore City, where officers were unfairly targeted by their superiors, their chiefs of police, the commissioners, and, and other um, leaders. Um, so I think that it's important work uh, that we look at it. Um, but I agree that there needs to be um, accountability for police officers could be because no one likes a bad cop. I mean, nobody likes a bad, hates a bad cop more than a good cop. Uh, so we don't want them in our, in our profession. We want them out of here. Um, but we support having courageous conversations and thoughtful, if there are going to be any changes, which we, you know, feel as though that the train is coming down the track that there will be. We just want to be at the table have our voices heard and make ask that everyone be thoughtful in the changes that we all make. Uh, so without further ado, I'll be around for questioning also with um, President Dave Rose, but Mike Davey is the best expert um, that can explain the LEOBR and the other positions that we have as police officers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Davey? I guess there's no pressure on me uh, based on that. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair uh, and members of the work group. Uh, my name is uh, Mike Davey. I'm an attorney. A little bit about me uh, prior to becoming an attorney. I'm a retired captain from the Maryland State Police. Uh, I spent 20 years there working in various assignments. Uh, during the course of my career, I investigated internal investigations. I prosecuted administrative hearing boards pursuant to the LEOBR. And I also sat as the permanent trial board chairman uh, for a period of time with the Maryland State Police. Uh, during these administrative hearings. Today, uh, I'm an attorney, I'm a defense attorney. Uh, I've been representing law enforcement officers throughout the state of Maryland for the past 21 years on law enforcement uh, officers' bill of rights issues. Uh, and the firm, uh, our firm, our law firm has been, uh, is currently on retainer with approximately 53 police unions throughout the state. So we have a pretty good idea of what's going on, not only uh, locally, but statewide. So the LEOBR was created in 1974 to give officers uh, certain procedural due process rights during the investigation and adjudication of violations of their agency's policies and procedures. Today, there are 148 law enforcement agencies in the state of Maryland that employ over 16,000 sworn officers. The LEOBR was and is today necessary to prevent police chiefs from enacting discipline and terminating police officers for political and personal reasons without justifications. There's been a lot of discussion about due process and whether it's required or not. So just a little history. Uh, the United States Constitution provides that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. In the employment context, this guarantee of due process functions to protect 
certain public employees from being deprived of a certain interest in their employment. The Supreme Court has held that where public employees have a property right or a property interest in their continued employment, the employer may not terminate or discipline that employee without certain due process protections. Property rights exist where state and local charters, ordinances, policies, contracts, or agreements provide that an employee will only be disciplined or dismissed for cause, just cause, proper cause, sufficient cause, or some other similar language. Putting it in context. You froze for a minute. You're frozen. If you can hear me, Mr. Davey. So that's unfortunate. Perhaps perhaps you have to uh, hang up and call back in. And to Matt, if you can hear me. I don't know if we could do anything. Um, Michael Davey is frozen. Sure, we'll get on that. Okay. So I think he was their main presenter. So this is a good time, members. We will take a five minute break. If you need to use the restroom or something, um five minutes so please come back at five to, to four okay
Okay, everyone, welcome back. And we are going to reconnect uh, for the members with Mr. Davey, but you won't see him because apparently it, it works okay um, if we don't see his face, but we will hear him and he will be available for questions. So um, Mr. Davey, are you there? I, I am here, can you hear me? Yes, perfect, thank you. I don't know what happened and I apologize. Oh, no worries. Okay, so what I was talking about is the constitutional right to due process uh, when it comes to these hearings. As I was stating, uh, property rights exist where state or local laws, charters, ordinances, policies, contracts, or agreements provide that an employee will only be disciplined or dismissed for cause, just cause, proper cause, sufficient cause, or some other similar language. Even if the LEOVR was repealed, police officers would still be entitled to due process under the Constitution. I, and I think this has been stated before, but again, I would also like you to consider that if the LEOBR were to be repealed, there could be 148 different disciplinary systems as it comes to law enforcement officers, uh, and the General Assembly would probably have no control over any of them. Uh, so that's what could happen if the LEOBR is repealed. So at this time, I'd like to just give you an overview of the LEOBR and how it's applied. So as you know, the LEOBR is the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. It's codified in the Public Safety Article Title III, and it is the basic framework for police discipline in the state of Maryland. As I've already stated, it's based on constitutional procedural due process, and it may mandates certain procedures to be followed before an agency can discipline an officer who may have committed a violation of the agency's policies or procedure. It does not, and it's very important, it does not infringe on the right of management to run its own agency or manage its own agency. As Ms. Kruger stated in the previous panel, management has a great deal of authority and they currently have the ability to discipline their officers under the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. They simply have to follow the law. The LEOBR applies to all matters involving police discipline. It does not apply to performance issues by police officers or fitness for duty issues. It only pertains to discipline. It applies to all sworn law enforcement officers except those in a uh, probationary status. The only exception to that is a allegation of excessive force against a probationary officer and then that officer would in fact be covered by the LEOBR. It has two phases. The LEOBR is broken down into two places. One is the investigation and the other is the adjudication uh, of the allegation. Probably one of the most important parts of the LEOBR that has to be known is it only applies to the accused officer. It does not apply to an officer who may have been a witness to the incident. So while the accused officer is protected under the LEOBR or has rights under the LEOBR, an officer who was on the scene who witnessed the incident has no protection. He could be called to internal affairs. He or she could be called to internal affairs immediately after the complaint is made. They're not entitled to a lawyer and they can be ordered to give a statement. So it only, only applies to the accused officer. There are a lot, several different ways in which a complaint is initiated. They're initiated through citizens' complaints, supervisors' complaints, other officers or fellow officers making complaints against their coworkers. Uh, complaints come out of the media. Uh, a, a cell phone camera video comes out, and that can initiate an internal investigation. Uh, legal action of an arrest or a filing a civil action against a uh, police officer could trigger an internal investigation. Uh, investigations get started and initiated in numerous ways. Who currently under the LEOBR, a sworn law enforcement officer uh, is investigated either from his own office or her office or uh, agency or another if requested by the chief of police. The investigator, whoever does that investigation, must be familiar with the police officer's policies 
and procedures of the agency. Uh, one of the issues why we uh, believe that it's important that law enforcement officers uh, be involved in the investigative process is they know police work. It certainly will make the investigation more thorough and more efficient as it moves on. So when a complaint comes in, uh, one of the first steps, uh, obviously the investigation begins as it pertains to the accused officer, one of the first things that has to occur uh, is he, should re he or she should receive notice uh, of the allegation made against him. So under the law, a police officer has five business days to obtain a, an attorney or a representative prior to any interrogation. So basically under the law, what that means is a police agency does not have to tell an officer he's under investigation. They could be three, four, five, six months into this investigation and the police officer may not even know. It is only five days prior to the interrogation that they have to be notified of what they're being investigated for. As you all know, the General Assembly amended that provision of the LEOBR, I believe in 2016, when it used to be 10 days, and now that has been reduced down to five business days. And to be perfectly candid, uh, those days that are required uh, don't really mean a whole lot when it comes to an investigation. Because if an investigation is going to be done thoroughly, one of the last parts of that investigation will be to interrogate the officer. Just like any other case, if they're doing an internal investigation or they're doing a criminal investigation, they'll want to, the investigators will want to see the police reports. They'll want to interview witnesses. They'll want to look at body-worn camera. They'll want to look at any CCTV or business video that might be around. They want to look at other documents. The very last piece of the investigation is generally the interrogation of the officer. And believe me, that's not going to happen in 10 days or five days. And it's not likely to happen in 20, 30, 60, or 90, depending on uh, the in-depth investigation that's being conducted. Where there is a lot of misinformation and confusion is in the area of an administrative investigation and a criminal investigation that are being run simultaneously. And I'll give you an example of an officer is involved in a uh, discharge of his weapon, a use of force, a use of deadly force. There is actually two investigations that go on. The first one is the criminal investigation where the officer is actually an accused or a suspect of a crime. That officer is being investigated for possibly homicide, manslaughter, reckless endangerment, first degree assault, and that officer has the right not to give a voluntary statement. It has nothing to do with the law enforcement officer's bill of rights. It has to do with the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution. The secondary investigation that goes on is the administrative investigation as to whether that officer, by discharging his weapon or his actions, did that violate a policy or procedure. Some agencies will run these investigations parallel, which is the way it should be done. Other agencies will wait until the criminal investigation is done before they even start their internal investigation. Why they do that, I have no idea. I just don't know why they don't run them simultaneously. The law permits, the LEOBR does not prevent it. The only problem that ever occurs or could occur by running simultaneous, simultaneous investigations is if the officer in the criminal investigation does not give a voluntary statement, the agency has the absolute right to order that officer to give a statement. But if that ordered statement is taken, it cannot be used against the officer in a criminal investigation. And again, that does not have anything to do with the law enforcement officer's bill of rights. It has to do with the Supreme Court case of Garrity versus New Jersey, where the Supreme Court has ruled a coerced or ordered statement by an officer cannot be used against them in a criminal allegation or a criminal case. Again, that is not an LEOVR issue. 
it is a Supreme Court case or constitutional issue. There's been a lot of discussion, and I've heard it before, uh, that the police in a deadly force situation need to speak to that officer and get all that information up front. Some people claim that officers will get their stories together. A witnessing officer has to give a statement, like I said. He has to give a statement if they tell him to do it that day. He has to do it that day. But when it comes to the officer who actually committed the act, he is, has his own protections under the United States Constitution, which again, have nothing to do with the law enforcement officer's Bill of Rights. In the administrative cases, uh, if an officer is charged with a felony and he is in fact, or he or she is convicted of that felony, uh, there is no LEOBR hearing the officer can be uh, terminated without a hearing. Uh, there's no LEOBR issue there. It's in the LEOBR that says that can happen, but they are not entitled to an LEOBR hearing. It's also important to know that administrative charges, so what, if an officer gets through the criminal case and he's found not guilty, administrative charges still may be filed against the police officer if he or she is acquitted of all the criminal charges. So if an officer is charged, say, with first, second degree assault, and they're found not guilty by a judge or a jury, that does not prevent the police agency from administratively charging that officer with violating a policy or procedure. And the rationale for that is there's a complete different standard of proof. In a criminal case, as most of you know, it's uh, proof beyond reasonable doubt. Administrative cases in Maryland uh, the standard is what's called a preponderance of evidence. Is it more likely than not the officer violated the policy? So because of that different standard, it's not unusual and it happens a lot that even if officers are found not guilty in criminal court, they are still administratively charged under their own department's policies and procedures. So once an investigation is done, a, several determinations are made by that police department. The officer uh, under investigation either has those charges sustained, and the definitions have always been confusing to a lot of people. A sustained finding is where an investigation determines by a preponderance of evidence that the alleged misconduct occurred. That is, that is the first finding that can be made by a police department. The second would be not sustained. And that is where an investigation is unable to determine by a preponderance of evidence whether the alleged misconduct occurred or not. There's not enough proof by a preponderance of evidence that it happened. The third finding is what's called unfounded, where an investigation determines by clear and convincing evidence that the alleged misconduct did not occur or did not involve the accused officer. And the fourth finding could be exonerated. And that is where the investigation determines by a preponderance of evidence that the alleged conduct did occur, but it did not violate a policy, procedure, or training. And just so you know, those are not Mike Davies' definitions of those. Those are actually taken right from the Baltimore City Consent Decree uh, that was signed off on by the Department of Justice, the Baltimore Police Department, uh, and their monitoring team. Those are the definitions that they in fact use. So when an officer is charged, uh, there a, is a statute of limitations. So from the time the incident comes to the attention of the appropriate law enforcement official, the department has 365 days to complete their investigation and administratively charge that officer. They have one year to do that. If they don't file the charges within that year, then the charges could and should be dismissed. The only two exceptions to that one year statute of limitations are allegations of excessive force and criminal conduct or criminal investigations against the officer. And in those cases, there is no statute of limitations. They can investigate that officer for a year two years, three years, and there is no statute of limitations before they can bring charges on those types of cases. 
So a charging document, if it is sustained, is given to the police officer. It has the policy that he, he or she violated. And it also has the specification or the statement of facts that it's alleged that the officer actually committed. The officer at that point has a decision to make. They can either accept the recommended disciplinary action after being charged, or they can request an administrative hearing board under the law enforcement officer's bill of rights. So a hearing board uh, is made up of three law enforcement officers. One of them has to be of equal rank of the accused officer. They are selected by the police chief of the employee who is accused. He can select them from their own police department or they can request outside members from other agencies to sit on that trial board. It's important to remember that it is the police chief that selects the members of the board. They're responsible for training them, making sure they're fair and non-biased, but it is absolutely the chief's responsibility to pick those individuals. Uh, as of 2016, as you know, this section of the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights was amendment, amended excuse me, to add one non-voting civilian member, or in the alternative, if authorized by law, two voting civilian members. So I think it's already been discussed. Uh, since this uh, section of the LEOBR was in fact amended, there has not been an administrative trial board in the state of Maryland with any civilian members. Uh, to my knowledge, the only agency that has acted upon this has been the Baltimore Police Department. In December of 2018, after lengthy negotiations between the FOP and the Police Department, they actually negotiated a procedure and it's in their memorandum of understanding or their labor contract. It lays out the training, it lays out how the individuals are selected, uh, the FOP did have uh, of the ability to review the applications and make our own recommendations as to whether they are uh, qualified or not. Uh, there are a list of qualifications as to how they can even apply. Uh, I think it's important that we know that even though this law passed when it did and the Baltimore Police Department uh, agreed with the FOP to this procedure in December of 2018, it took until the summer of this year, 2020, for this even to get off the ground. Uh, it wasn't the issue, it wasn't an issue for the turn order of police. The department was completely in control of this process. I don't know what took so long, uh, but it did. Uh, they're in the process of doing training now. It's been a little difficult. I'll give them that with uh, COVID-19. Most of the uh, instruction has been through Zoom. I have participated in it. I participated in a uh, mock trial board uh, just last week uh, and assisted them in their training. Uh, and as stated by Commissioner Harrison, they are required also along with the 40 hours of training to do five ride alongs during different shifts uh, in Baltimore with police officers to give them a little better of the full understanding uh, of what a police officer faces on a day-to-day -day basis, which I think is extremely uh, important. When are we gonna have our first trial boards with civilians? I don't know. Uh, again, the Baltimore Police Department is the one that sets those schedules uh, and we will go from there. I, I can tell you from the FOP standpoint, we are not afraid of the transparency. We're not afraid of having the civilians on trial boards. Uh, I think with the training that they received and the ride-alongs uh, and their pre-qualifications, I think they'll have an understanding of what's happening. And I think the best part is there still will be three other sworn law enforcement members on that board to give them uh, guidance and advice as it pertains to policy procedure and what actually happens uh, out on the street. So I, I think having a five person board uh, is very important, keeping a majority of those uh, members on that board being sworn law enforcement officers. So as I stated earlier, the board is appointed by the chief and chosen from law enforcement officers within law enforcement or from a law enforcement officer of another law enforcement agency with approval of that chief. 
Those decisions and selections should be without regard to race, gender, rank, assignment in an effort to preserve objectivity. The chairperson is usually the highest ranking person. And as I stated, one member of the board must be of equal rank of the accused officer. Uh, the decision-making in this case is based on a majority rule. It does not have to be unanimous. It is a simple majority. And I stated about the civilian trial board members already. Um, so in, as I stated, the administrative hearings uh, with the agency, the burden of proof is on the department and the standard is a preponderance of evidence. The rules of evidence are relaxed. Uh, I can tell you from my experience in 21 years, if it looks like evidence, it's coming into that trial board and they're gonna discuss it. Hearsay evidence is permitted. Both sides are represented by counsel. Evidence presented by witnesses, testimony, documents, tangible evidence and recordings. Uh, the administrative hearings must be recorded. Uh, the board has the right to have its own advisory council. So if they have a question or a legal question about the admissibility of evidence or any legal question as to how this works, they have the opportunity to seek an independent counsel for uh, information. And uh, since 2016, these hearing boards have been open to the public. Uh, I can tell you from my experience, very few cases uh, have public uh, witnesses. Uh, when the law first passed, probably the first one or two trial boards that are hearing boards that I did, a couple of members of the press or media showed up. Uh, when they found out it wasn't a high profile case, it was just a minor incident, they left pretty quickly and never came back. Uh, probably the one case that I uh, handled was the Freddie Gray administrative cases uh, in which there were a number of people there who witnessed that uh, hearing. But other than that, very few, if any, witnesses ever uh, actually uh, attend these hearings. So after hearing all the evidence at a hearing board, uh, a decision is made by that board, as I stated, by a majority. They have to find the office either guilty or not guilty on each and every one of the charges. If the officer is found not guilty of all the charges, it concludes the entire process. Uh, if the, the officer is found guilty, there is a second stage to this hearing called the mitigation phase in which evidence is presented as to the officer's record, prior record, prior training, awards, commendations, uh, and prior disciplinary action. Uh, and then the board will make a recommendation to the police chief or commissioner uh, as to the recommended disciplinary action in that case. The hearing board actually has to write its own report and submit that to the chief as to how they came to their conclusions. Once the chief gets that hearing board uh, report, he or she has 30 days to make a decision. They can either sign off on the recommended disciplinary action of the board, they can reduce the recommended disciplinary action, or they can increase it. However, they cannot change the finding of the board. They cannot reverse a not guilty finding of the board to a guilty finding, and they cannot find a uh, guilty finding as not guilty. In every jurisdiction but two, the chief has the final authority, which basically means at the end of the day, whatever the chief decides as it pertains to the recommended disciplinary action, it's final. The only two exceptions are Baltimore County and Montgomery County. The reasons for those being different were uh, occurred as a result of uh, detailed collective bargaining agreements uh, and negotiation between the FOP and the counties as to whether that should be in included in their uh, memorandum of understanding or the collective bargaining agreement. And I think it's very important to remember that these are bargained. This is not a one side proposition. If the FOP offers that uh, as an issue that they would like to discuss, the department could say no, but they didn't in these two jurisdictions. They agreed to it. It was a two way negotiation. And I would tell you, I wasn't involved in those negotiations, but I think it would be pretty, I, I'm very sure that the FOP gave up a lot to get those decisions or those final order in their contract. Uh, they wasn't just handed to them by the counties. 
I'm sure they either gave up working conditions, pay raises, or something in order to get uh, final order uh, removed from the chief. But they are the only two agencies that uh, have final order resting with the administrative hearings. As I stated, the chief has the right to increase any guilty finding and recommendation uh, of the hearing board. It's not a difficult -ish thing to do. It's not difficult requirements to fulfill. The chief simply has to review the record, meet with the officer and his representative. The chief has to provide any oral or written information they relied on outside of the record. And the chief has to state the substantial evidence relied on to support the increase of the action. And substantial evidence is basically defined as that which a reasonable mind might accept as adequate to support the conclusion. It's not a big hurdle for a chief to do as far as increasing a disciplinary uh, record. The LEOBR does not limit the authority of the chief to regulate the competent and efficient operation of management and management of the law enforcement agency by any reasonable means, including transfer and reassignment, if the action is not punitive in nature and the chief determines that the action is in the best agency or best interest of the agency. I just wanna clear up some misinformation that's out there uh, as it pertains to the LEOBR. The LEOBR does not have any impact on who a police department hires. That is not an LEOBR issue. That is a management issue of the police department. The LEOBR does have no impact on the training an officer receives. That is a management issue. It does not have any effect or the LEOBR does not affect it in any way. The promotion of officers has, the LEOBR has no effect on promotions. Again, that's a management issue. Where officers are assigned, again, prerogative of management, the LEOBR plays no role in that issue. The dissemination of disciplinary records, the LEOBR plays no role in that. In fact, in the LEOBR, the only issue about the disclosure of records is basically that the officer himself or herself has to sign a confidentiality statement that when they receive the investigative file prior to their trial board, they have to agree that they will only use those documents to defend themselves in that trial board or that hearing board. They cannot use it to file a civil lawsuit against the complaint. They cannot use it to file a complaint against their supervisor or file a lawsuit against their department. They are prevented from any disclosure. The LEOBR has no effect on due process. As I spoke to you earlier, that's the United States Constitution. I know there is a lot of information and in certain groups uh, and honestly, even some chiefs would like to blame the law enforcement officers bill of rights for their inability to discipline their officers. And it's not true. I believe Chief Morris himself said they can work with it the way it is. It's not a problem for them. We are not naive. We know changes are coming. The FOP knows changes are coming to the LEOBR. We just want the opportunity to sit at the table and be part of those discussions. Uh, once we see the legislative bill that comes out, we'll have a better understanding of where your committee and uh, where the uh, house is coming from. Uh, and we'd like to be able to sit down uh, and discuss uh, those issues. Uh, I know this is a hot topic for a lot of organizations in a group. The reason I went through the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights the way I did is just to make sure that your committee or your work group understands how it works and really that the, any real true issues involving the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights don't really per, don't really have or pertain to the individual officer. Management has the requirement to follow these rules and that's all they are is rules. They need to follow them. And if they don't follow them, uh, there are, in some cases there are consequences and some there are not. Uh, in, uh, when I discussed the 365 day uh, statute of limitations. So in the LEOBR, 365 days to investigate it and charge the officer. There's nothing in the LEOBR, and I think there actually should be, 
to say how long that agency now has to take this individual to a hearing board. I have cases sitting in my filing cabinet right now where the officer was charged two years ago and we haven't had a scheduled trial board yet. That's not an LEOBR issue. That's something that should be in the LEOBR. Management should be held to a standard as to when these hearings should be done by. Waiting two, three years kind of defeats the purpose of discipline. Discipline is designed to correct, cor excuse me, correct behavior. It's really hard to correct someone's behavior three years after the behavior occurred. So I, I think there should be additional language requiring management to bring these trials uh, to a much quicker conclusion. Uh, I know I just provided a lot of information. Uh, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that I can and be available at any time if any member of your work group uh, has any questions for me. Thank you. Thank you. That was incredibly informative, um, kind of doing a LEOBR 101 for our work group. Um, I have a couple of questions and if any of the other members have any questions, please let me know. And, um, and Delegate Davis has a question, so, um, and so does uh, Delegate Acevedo. So I'll just start really quickly here. And if uh, Mr. Navy, if you want someone else to answer or Mr. Boatwright, just jump right in. I don't yes, know who's muted and who, who's not muted. Um, so one, um, would you be opposed, and I don't know if you all have to, you know, kind of powwow to talk about this, but would you be opposed to um, a charging committee um, that would include a civilian so that once the investigation is complete, um, the investigation would go to a charging committee uh, on which a civilian um, sat and some other members um, to determine what the charges would be. Um, and kind of in connection with that, would you be opposed to um, civilians participating um, in the investigations, um, in interrogations, um, being able to subpoena? Um, if you could comment on that, I would appreciate it. Sure. Uh, as it pertains to the charging committee, uh, some of the agencies, the Baltimore Police Department, the Maryland State Police, and Baltimore County that I know of have what are called either a disciplinary review committee, they have a penalty review committee, one's called DRC, one's called PARC, uh, the Maryland Transportation Authority is another one, they already have it, and it's usually made up of their command staff. Uh, I, I am not the spokesman for the uh, fraternal order of police, but I could tell you to me that would be a management issue. Uh, how an officer gets charged or who charges them or who reviews the charges, uh, I don't think we would have an issue with that uh, as long as the civilian, like any other person involved in the process, signed a confidentiality agreement as to the individual's issues. Uh, but again, I, I think that's more of a management issue that they should have to make that decision on. But I don't think that we would be opposed to it. Uh, I, it does bring in a level of transparency that uh, I don't think would have a major impact on how the FOP or how I defend officers. Um, okay. The What was the second one? I'm sorry. Well, the second one related to investigations and having civilians participate in um, investigations. Sure. Um, obviously, that's always been a concern of the FOP in the past uh, due to the fact that we feel it's important that the individuals doing inv the investigation have the background to know uh, the agency's policies, how police work actually works on the street. Uh, I don't think, and again, I'm speaking for Mike Davey, not the FOP. I don't think there would be a big issue with civilians as long as they worked in conjunction with a law enforcement officer, had the prerequisite training or experience, whether it be a retired police officer, something of that nature. Uh, I don't think that one that issue uh, would be overly concerning if we could work out the details. Okay, uh, another quick question. Uh, do you believe, or what are your thoughts about officers being on paid leave or administrative leave or desk duty still getting paid following a police shooting um, or other use of force uh, that ended in um, the death of an individual? Um, so basically, do you, would you agree that they should not be paid 
um, and uh, on paid leave or they should not be given desk duty. Um, and would you agree to termination of a police officer immediately following um, the shooting of an individual that ended up in their death? I would totally disagree with the ability to discharge an officer who's involved in a use of force uh, just on the mere fact that he was involved in the use of force. Uh, there have been a lot of cases, as, as was discussed earlier, that are hope very high profile. And based on the video we've seen, they look bad. They honestly they look bad. I'm not going to deny that. Uh, but there is a state's attorney who has coined the phrase, especially when it comes to police work, it looks awful, but it's lawful. So I don't think any officer should be terminated on the mere fact that they were involved in the incident without a thorough investigation being done by either the police agency, the state's attorney's office, or someone uh, to say that, yes, this officer's actions either violated the law or violated a policy. Uh, I don't think any officer should have his due process taken away uh, on the mere fact uh, that they did something in the performance of their duties uh, without a full and thorough and unbiased investigation. As it pertains to sitting the desk when that happens, uh, I, I think there should be a limit. Uh, you know, these, there sh I understand the need to put the officers on administrative duties. Not only is it good for the department, but it's actually good for the officer. He should be taken, he or she should be taken out of the game. Uh, and I call it that, that's my words. They should be taken out of the enforcement at this time. They needed their own time to cool down, figure out what happened, you know, relax. I mean, they are very, very stressful uh, situations. I've represented probably close to 300 officers in 21 years involved in police involved shootings, uh, in custody deaths, or serious use of deadly force. Uh, and, and not every officer handles it the same way. Uh, and no department should be given the task to pick and choose which ones are okay to go back to the street and not. Every officer should come off the street for a while. They should go uh, see, uh, have a, what's called a fitness for duty to make sure they're uh, mentally, mentally, mentally and physically able to go back. However, I don't think they should be sitting the desk for a year or 16 months. Uh, that happens in some cases. And so just to follow up on that, um, so what about a scenario when uh, you have someone and, and you mentioned that there was an issue with the timing of the investigate, investigations and people actually getting to a trial board so it could take, you know, 18 months or, or a long time. Um, what about the scenario where that individual is on paid leave or desk duty still getting paid and then they ultimately are found to be guilty um, of, of what of you know violating policy and they shot that individual uh, or use some other use of force and that and and they've still gotten paid that that whole time and they're still on the police force that's supposed to be protecting uh, the community so we have you know the situation now where we're, we're dealing with the community and trust in police and transparency. And so I think one of the issues for the community is that we do have maintained officers who have ultimately been found guilty of violating uh, policies of their various police departments and have still been on the payroll um, and assigned whatever duty. Um, and then, you know, say they're terminated two years later. How is that just for the community? And how would you resolve that issue? I would like to take a shot at that. Go ahead, Clyde. Uh, so one of the factors that you have to take into consideration, if you have a um, police officer that's involved in a shooting and the shooting is being investigated by the local uh, district attorney, state's attorney's office, and that officer is ultimately charged with a felony, the police chief has the authority at that point to place the officer on non-paid leave. Uh, that happens. Um, and then that all you have also we have a history where the officer is determined to have not violated violated the law, and so the criminal uh, case is now dismissed. And in some cases, you can have the officer either cleared of any wrongdoing departmentally, or they could be found guilty departmentally. Just because they you know go through a process of a criminal case does not necessarily mean that they are also innocent um, of in a in a civilian. I mean in a administrative case as well. And Dave, you and want to chime in? 
Yes, if, on the administrative end, uh, again, it's the management of the department that is responsible for conducting these internal investigations, charging the officers if they believe they violated some policy or procedure, and taking them to a trial board. The mere fact that the LEOBR gives them 365 days to charge an officer doesn't mean they should take 365 days to charge that officer. They should be able to do it, depending on the size of the department, in 90 days or 120 days. And again, once the officer is charged, the LEOBR today uh, basically states that the they own, departments only have to give the accused officer 10 days notice prior to scheduling their hearing and uh, giving the defense, the, either the accused or his attorney, their investigative file. So the department has 365 days to conduct their investigation. Under the current law, they can take them to a trial board in 10 days. I think that is wholly unfair that they've had a year to conduct their investigation and then only give us 10 days. <clears throat> but again, that is a management problem or a mismanagement problem for those individual officers. The, op the Again, the departments should be held more accountable for what they're doing. What I would like to see a change to the LEOBR is mm -hmm. from the moment the officer is charged, when they receive those charging documents, that the police department cannot take that officer to a hearing board for 60 days. But they have to have that hearing board within 120 days. Give the department a cutoff. Give them a time that says, you've got to do this trial board by this time. Because right now they don't have that. They take for as long as they want, which I understand is criticism by the citizens. Why is this officer still here? If they get fired, they get fired, but it shouldn't take three years to do it. I want to, I know, Dave Rose, you want to make a comment and you're unmuted, but I'm going to add this into the, the question. Um, what about expanding, if, if, if the chief has the ability, if, if the officer is charged with a felony to terminate that officer, what about expanding that to include certain misdemeanors or other non-criminal violations that um, could lead to termination? So expanding that that category and giving the police chief uh, the abil ability if they're charged to terminate um, up front as well. I would obviously like to see the list of those certain misdemeanors as to what they would be. Uh, mm -hmm. But I also would remind everyone that they have a due process right in their criminal case also. Um, I, I mean, there's a lot of factors to consider what those misdemeanors might be, whether the charge that they've been placed against them, whether it was on duty for something that happened while they were working, or was this something happened in their personal life while off duty? Uh, I think those are some issues that have to be resolved. And again, just using the word certain misdemeanors, uh, I guess there may be some, but I, I'd have to see any kind of list uh, to be able to give you a definitive answer. Okay, Mr. Rose. We had about a decade ago, we were having an issue here in Baltimore County where Minor cases that were in internal affairs would drag on for months. Uh, Mike talked about it earlier. The LEOBR gives the department a year. In some cases, we were taking that long and it was becoming you know, aggravating towards our members. And I pushed for cases to be done faster uh, with several internal affairs commanders. And after a while, we did have a goal at internal affairs to get those cases done within six months and then get them done within uh, four months. I think now we have a goal that we're trying to hit of 90 to 120 days to get most cases done. There are more complex cases that are going to take longer, of course, because you have, you know, witnesses all over the place. <clears throat> but officers who are involved in the more serious incidents that you were talking about earlier, who sit on the desk or on administrative duties for being involved in a shooting, if, if that officer is then charged with a felony, are charged with a crime. So you say you use deadly force and a state's attorney or a grand jury decided they were going to initiate charges. They would be felony charges. The officer would then be suspended without pay and, and sent home until those uh, felony charges were adjudicated. If the officer was found guilty, the officer wouldn't be entitled to a hearing or anything. The chief could just, you know, outright fire the officer because the officer is found guilty of, of a felony. So uh, we have worked with the police department over the years. We are better. 
Uh, I've had some communications with the administration over the last few weeks. We even have a uh, more stringent goal of 90 days if we can get there for most cases. I think that is a, a very good goal. Uh, there's no reason to take one year for matters of discourtesy or simple cases. I used to coin the phrase, if the detectives at that time that were doing some of the investigations were in homicide, robbery, or burglary, we wouldn't get anything solved. And I know it's kind of tongue in cheek a little bit, but it has gotten a lot better. And we push for them to be thorough and fair, but also expeditious. And I think there is a balance that, that, that must be reached. Thank you. Uh, next question, uh, Delegate Davis. Hey, um, thank you, Mr. Davey. I, I have two questions. Um, the first one is you mentioned that probationary employees are not protected by LEOBR, except when um, they've been accused of excessive force. Could you address the rationale behind that? And my second question is, um, uh, Mr. Boatwright mentioned that um, the entire purpose of LEOBR was to fix the abuse of power of the chiefs of police. Um, and we've left all the power with the chiefs of police, um, except we've added some boards. Now, you've been trying these cases for many years, as, as you said. Have you seen cases that have been like the ones that have been alleged by the ACLU and Prince George's, where black and brown officers have gotten disparate treatment? And lastly, if you don't feel you were treated with in front of the board, um, is there another place to go, an EEOC case? Thank you. Sure. So I, I believe the the idea of allowing probationary officers uh, to have LEOBR rights on, on an excessive force case is just due to the nature of that complaint. Those are very serious complaints. Uh, many times that if found guilty or having a sustained finding against them would lead to termination. Uh, and it, it just gives that officer the opportunity uh, to have a representative with them uh, due to the just due to the serious nature of the complaint. Uh, it's the only uh, exception to the probationary status uh, that there is. So if an officer, a young officer is accused, they do have the right to have a representative with them during the interrogation uh, at that time. However, if that officer is simply charged or simply being investigated for using discourtesy or not turning on their body worn camera, they go to internal affairs and they go by themselves without an attorney. I just think it's due to the serious nature of uh, the issue. Um, as it pertains to officers who, uh, black and brown officers being treated differently, uh, it's hard to say that I've actually seen it, uh, but would it surprise me if it was being done in some cases? No, it wouldn't. Uh, I have seen, I have seen some officers, whether it's because of the color of their skin or that certain supervisors don't like them, they seem to show up in my office a whole lot more often. Uh, and a lot of them, frankly, are kind of ridiculous complaints. Uh, whether it's because of the color of the skin or the supervisor just has an issue with that officer, uh, I, I couldn't tell you whether that is the case. Uh, and your last question, at an administrative hearing, if the officer is found guilty, they do have the right to appeal that finding to the circuit court very difficult to win an appeal uh, on the in the circuit court level. However, nothing prevents the officer at any time from filing an EEOC complaint, either through the state, through the federal or their local jurisdiction. They can do that at any time during the process uh, whatsoever. One follow up, Madam Chair. But does, does a positive finding with the EEOC overcome uh, the other findings? No, it will not. The LEOBR, the, the hearing board would be final. So and again, that's a hearing board where the members are selected by the police chief. Delegate Davis, it, here in Baltimore County, when we have a hearing board, and I can tell you that in the last 10 years, we may have had a dozen. We went four years, over four years without one. Um, when we select a hearing board, what we try to do is we have a, a trial board chairperson that's selected by the chief, and that's either a major or a captain. And then we have an officer of equal rank. We make every effort, and I can't remember one where it failed, to make the officer of equal rank to be of the same sex and or race as the accused officer. So there is um, 
some representation and diversity on the board. So a lot of times we have it in our, in our MOU where the chairperson is a major or a captain, and then the other person is a lieutenant, and the other person is an officer of equal rank. A lot of times we try to match up gender and ethnicity as best we can for every hearing board, just so there is some sort of representation. Alec Davis, does that suffice? Are you good? Yeah, thank you. Yes, you're, okay. Delegate Acevedo. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you, Mr. Davy, for your uh, presentation. I couldn't help but um, but notice that your remarks, um, two words, uh, were were very much peppered in your remarks, and that is uh, due process. And I'm hoping you can. Uh, give me a straightforward answer as the LEOBR expert. Um, and my question is, and it's pretty much a yes or no, um, is uh, whether if, if, if we were to repeal the LEOBR, would law enforcement officers uh, still be entitled to the same due process rights uh, that other state and local government employees have when facing discipline, that, that due process rights that your remarks were uh, very much peppered with. Um, and, and, and again, that's, that's just a yes or no answer because I've asked it previously and I, for some reason, well, I, I can make a couple of uh, guesses. Um, I couldn't get a straightforward answer, but I also wanna bring it back to my county. And, and, and this is um, in addition to, to, to that question. In Montgomery County, uh, one, of the, one of the things that we hear often from uh, folks, uh, uh, leadership of uh, the MoCo PD at council hearings, and it's why the uh, the county council is, as I understand it, considering uh, a bill that would look at uh, the disciplinary process. But one of the things that we hear quite often um, from those in leadership in MoCo PD is that the fraternal order of police uh, stalls at choosing arbitrators uh, so that hearing boards cannot go forward. And so as a result, officers who are on admin leave uh, pending their hearing board um, after having charges sustained um, are on admin leave for years. Um, and oftentimes uh, that's not talked about, um, uh, that officers are getting paid um, while being on admin leave for years. And by the time that they get to a hearing board, you know, you have the issue of witnesses either forgetting details or just tired. And um, as the department testified, uh, what that uh, uh, leads to is MoCo PD then uh, negotiating a lesser punishment for an officer who uh, may have abused public trust or department policy. Uh, and so I'm curious as to what role does the FOP see itself in, in this process? Um, and in terms of uh, hearing boards, those being stalled, um, uh, those concerns that have been shared by, and, 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 and just like you're sharing your concerns, um, as we're discussing this, you would certainly agree that we should be considering the legitimate concerns also of those in leadership at, um, at these police departments who are saying, look, this is also what is part of holding up that process. But if you could answer my first question, the yes or no question first, I would appreciate that before delving into responding to, 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 to this concern that is so often shared by MoCo PD leadership. Sure. Uh, I, I wish I could give you a yes or no, but it's gonna be very short. So if the LEOBR was repealed, there would be due process rights for law enforcement officers consistent with the civil service policies of each jurisdiction. So everyone would have their own policy based on the civil service uh, policies that their jurisdiction has. It, it, it would not be a straight state uh, policy. It would be whatever, whatever is in place at that jurisdiction. Hopefully that is as good as a yes or no answer. Delegate Acevedo, do you have a follow-up? Uh, I just got unmuted. Thank you, Madam Chair. So what I'm hearing is, is that if the LEOBR was repealed, 
the answer is yes, that law enforcement officers will have due process rights, the same due process that, again, your, your, your remarks were peppered with earlier. They would have due process rights similar to other state and local government employees in disciplinary actions proceedings. That's what I'm hearing, correct? Yeah, whatever is in place already in the jurisdiction where the officer is employed, that's what they likely would get. Right. Or, so they would have due process rights. OK. Um, yeah. And then the, the, the other thing is um, uh, the, 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 the concerns that have been shared by um, uh, those in leadership uh, 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 in my county. And I know you can't speak too much to that. I'm not sure where you live. Um, but these are some of the concerns that have been shared in terms of uh, the, the, the current process of disciplining and holding um, officers accountable. It's well, you know, there's the role that the FOP plays in that process in terms of stalling arbitrations, in terms of, you know, whether they find an arbitrator, then um, uh, 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 complaining about the choice of the arbitrator. And, 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 and in essence, what, what they were saying was that, you know, it appears to be a stalling tactic that leads to an officer being uh, on unpaid administrative leave for years, no kind of an accountability no kind of a justice and really what kind of a message are we sending to the department as a whole that if uh, uh, department policies or uh, public trust were to be breached, that there would be some form of accountability, right? To, to, to what was said earlier, I think by Ms. Kruger, the biggest threat to uh, a good cop is a crooked cop. And I would agree with that. And the goal of this, this work group here is how do we bring about trust by rooting out corrupt and racist, because we, we tend to not acknowledge that there is white supremacy within police and sheriff's departments across this country. Um, and that's our goal here, right? How do we root out the corrupt and racist cops so that we are keeping the dignity of the profession for those quote unquote good cops? Sure. So I don't do a lot of work in Montgomery County. I have done some cases there. I know that the Fraternal Order of Police and the Montgomery County have a very very detailed collective bargaining agreement. And in that agreement there, uh, it contains a number of processes within the collective, uh, excuse me, within the disciplinary process. Again, management controls the hearings. The management controls when an officer is charged. Management controls when they schedule the hearings. And even if there are provisions in the MOU that the FOP has a say in, Again, management controls when it's going to occur. And in all honesty, management has to make discipline a priority. They can't put it on the back burner. They have to make it a priority. And if they want to take officers to their hearing boards that they're required to do, they simply need to do it in a more timely manner and work through their issues with the FOP as quickly as possible. Uh, and I agree with what Ms. Kruger said. Uh, there are no good police officers that want to work side by side with a bad police officer. They just don't. The LEOBR does not protect those officers. If a good, thorough, unbiased investigation is done by the law enforcement agency in which they're employed by, that officer will be gone in a timely manner if they simply make it a priority. Okay, thank you. Uh, Delegate Rosenberg has a question. Just want to follow up. Thank you, Madam Chair, to your answer to Delegate Acevedo. If we were to, if we were to eliminate the LEOBR at the state level, then the local laws must be would prevail, but they must be consistent with the due process rights as articulated by the Supreme Court. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's correct. And we could still either modify or provide what is what is the floor if we were to act some legislation to take the place of the LEOBR that could establish what would be the floor for any local laws is that correct yes. consistent with supreme court cases you could you could give them the floor but just remember you're only giving them the base they have the ability to do anything else they want to Unless we said, sorry, or put it the other way, we could say this is the ceiling. You can do no more than what is required under 
the due pro as long as what we said was consistent, we could establish a, a ceiling as long as it's consistent with the Supreme Court case law. You, I, without researching it, I would say yes, you probably can, but I think you're then going down a slippery slope that every agency of you know, the 148 police agencies throughout the state is going to have something different. Mm -hmm. Thank and you. Then you then you all, excuse me, I apologize. That's okay. Sure, sure, all, go ahead. You also have collective bargaining agreements that may uh, oh, okay. apply also. But I know there's a contract right issue with a collective bargain agreement in terms of whether we could or could not intervene statutorily. But once the existing stat, once the existing collective bargaining agreement expires, then state law would prevail regarding any new collective bargaining agreement, correct? I, I, I can't give you a yes or no because I would have to research how that works, but I would also argue that in an effort to be fair to both parties, uh, whether it be Montgomery County, Baltimore County, Baltimore City, when they collectively bargained those agreements, those were agreed by, by both sides. And I would guarantee you that many of the issues that the FOP was able to get in those bargaining contracts, they gave up other things for. Uh, and then just the summer, just e just being able to take those out by the passage of law uh, would be concerning, I think, not only to the FOP, but other bargaining units such mm -hmm. as ASME and other units throughout the entire state uh, as to where that may go. Okay, thank you. Thank yes, you, sir. Very helpful. Um, Mr. Davey, I have uh, one more question. Mm -hmm. And uh, folks, if any other members have any questions, I don't see anyone else. So this could be um, the last question. So is this true or, or not true? Because um, this is complicated. So if the LEOBR is repealed and nothing is replaced with it, is it accurate that then in addition to the 148 different versions of discipline, there are some jurisdictions that have LEOBR language or parts of it actually in their um, contract. So it, it was bargained for. So even if the LE LEOBR was repealed, then those provisions would still stand. And then on top of that, there's language in some contracts, I think Mon Montgomery County, I'm not looking at it right the second, that say, should this contract, our collective bargaining agreement be um, invalidated for whatever reason, then basically the department could come up with whatever it, it wants. The department is left to its own devices to determine discipline. Is that? Yeah, I, I believe that is accurate. And, you know, from, you know, I talked to a lot of police chiefs throughout the entire state. Uh, we have police chiefs on both sides. Most of them say they will just, you know, if the LEOBR went away completely, I'm still going to follow what was what it was as of today. Um, but collective bargain agreements, some of them do have language in there consistent with the LEOBR and that they will follow it as written uh, as of today. Uh, so it, it really would become uh, a difficult process to weed through dealing with each and every law enforcement agency in the state. Okay. Uh, Delegate McComas does have a question. This is just a quick question to follow up on Delegate Rosenberg's. Uh, I guess what, what I'm kind of concerned about is, okay, you have a bargain and they get the, uh, they bargained their agreement and then you want to consideration that we have a statewide LEOBR. So then we say, okay, we're going to repeal the LEOBR. You're going to, and all these contracts have all been negotiated at different times and different, um, you know, in all of the uh, 140 some jurisdictions or folks that negotiated it. I mean, I think that it, that it could be, it, in other words, it's an intrusion into the right to contract. And um, it almost forces the state then to become a party, which the state was not a party to the contract or was ever, it was never foreseen that it would be a party. I just think that it's, it's, uh, it's gonna create a, a legal mess. Um, and I, I just wonder if you have any comment to that because I mean, I just, the right to contract is very important. And, and then to have the state come in and say, we're gonna blow this up. 
um, or we're, or we're going to prevent you from negotiating further if you wanted to renew that contract with with the uh, the bargaining contract or you wanted to tweak it. I mean, you, you'd really have to start from scratch. So could you comment on that? No, I, I think you're 100 percent correct. Uh, these are lengthy contracts that have been bargained over for years. There have been give and there's been take on both sides. Both sides have agreed to them. They both signed off on them. Now to uh, set a, well, bring in a new law that basically says certain provisions of what you negotiated over the years is no longer valid. That's simply not bargaining in good faith. And you're right, it really puts the state uh, or the General Assembly in the position to becoming a party to all of these collective bargaining agreements because they're now dictating what you can bargain for and what you can't. Okay. Our Delegate Fisher has a question. There you go. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to follow up on that line of reasoning. And, you know, this is a work group that we're trying to find good product in, in legislative bills for solutions. Um, it, I think that that what's negotiated really also speaks to the resources that are there for our municipal electeds to negotiate these kinds of contracts. I mean, when you're talking about a, a, a big county or, or Baltimore City's police contract with their police force, I mean, little municipalities and maybe you're mayor of a small town and you've got no background and you basically, you're inheriting a chief usually. And so I think that the, um, I think it's a it's a very broad statement to say they've been negotiated for years. I think they've been handed down for years. And I think local officials just sign on because they don't really know how to renegotiate or open up a police contract. And maybe there's something legislative that we can put in for actual legal support to help these um, smaller part-time elected officials on our municipal levels and our four counties and our commissioners, the legal support to really negotiate these contracts. If you're saying that if we, um, attempt to repeal or do whatever, everything's going to be left to them, um, that that might be something that we need to really look into. So just, so, just, so we're, just so we're clear, not every law enforcement agency has a collective bargaining agreement. Uh, some of the smaller agencies do not even have collective bargaining. Uh, the collective bargaining agreements are generally with the larger uh, police departments that they have through their local law to uh, allow for collective bargaining. If you look on the Eastern Shore right now, there are really only two agencies that have collective bargaining and that's the Ocean City Police Department and the uh, Lycomico County Sheriff's Department. Uh, there are some smaller state agencies that have it based on state law, but most smaller jurisdictions as you were speaking about, this isn't an issue for them because they don't have MOUs and they don't even have uh, collective bargaining. Uh, as it pertains to contracts just being passed down on these bigger agencies, they have every opportunity at the next negotiation section to bring these issues up. And if they don't bring them up, uh, the FOP shouldn't be uh, required to bring them up to help them along. Right. But it would be correct just to follow up that um, for my colleague um, on what Delegate um, 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 Sandberg was saying was that if we state in the law what we want and that it can't be part of their contract or negotiation, that can work right? Or it can. No, I think you may be able to do that going forward, but I don't think you should be able to change or you can change what's currently in the contract. Uh, unless okay. it's and, how, and how long are those contracts usually for? Did you say uh, that already? Yeah, they're anywhere from one to three years. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Delegate Rosenberg has a follow-up. Uh, thank you. Just quickly. I mean, look, our attorney general's office would be our counsel on this issue, but I'm pretty sure that the whole purpose of the Taft-Hartley Act at the federal level was to reduce the right unions had and that they gained during the New Deal. So there has been legislation uh, which has restricted uh, the rights of future contracts that unions can enter into with the private sector and the public sector. But that's just a statement. If we want to pursue this route, I think we need to consult with the Attorney General's office. Thank yeah. you. Any other questions from the members? Seeing none, thank you uh, very much, gentlemen, uh, for you know, staying and uh, with us all this time and answering our questions.
now group we are moving on um, and I just want to make sure he's on because it's been a while we are going to have a presentation um, by the state superintendent of police uh, Colonel Woodrow Jones the third so let me just verify that he is he is uh, with us I'm here madam chair oh I see you I see you there uh, thank you for your patience. We had a lengthy uh, discussion earlier with the police and chiefs that took a while. So I appreciate you being here. And with that, I'll let you take it over. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the work group. I'm Colonel Jerry Jones, Superintendent of the Maryland State Police. And thank you for the invitation to participate in today's hearing. Recently, the Maryland State Police had the opportunity to participate in a roundtable discussion with the U.S. Naval Academy Navy Football Players Council for Racial Equity. The Maryland State Police has enjoyed a long-standing relationship with the Naval Academy Administration and associated student programs for many years. The roundtable provided a platform for student athletes to communicate their thoughts and ideas on accomplishing racial equality and the actions to be taken within their sphere of influence. The athletes asked many questions about social matters and law enforcement involvement in the community. Their questions and concerns were similar to what is being discussed by this work group. It was a positive experience for all of us at the table. My point in mentioning this is that police accountability is clearly a very important issue to everyone, including the Maryland State Police. It impacts all of us in every aspect of our daily lives. It is incumbent upon police executives, legislators, citizens, and other stakeholders to work together to develop reasonable laws and policies that are fair, relevant, and provide clear guidance to the officers while providing transparency and the accountability to citizens we serve. Every time there's a change in law or an incident occurs that captures the nation's attention, law enforcement leaders should be looking at themselves to determine if policy or training modifications are needed. Let me be very clear. The Maryland State Police has a code of ethics that everything we do is built upon. It is based on the International Association of Chiefs of Police standard that is best summarized as follows. As a trooper, my fundamental duty is to serve mankind, to safeguard lives and property, to protect the innocent against deception, the weak against oppression or intimidation, and the peaceful against violence and disorder, and to respect the constitutional rights of all to liberty, quality, and justice. The Maryland State Police reviews its policies regularly or whenever an incident occurs where a person is seriously injured or killed by law enforcement actions to make sure that our policy complies with or exceeds federal and state law, as well as national best practices. The Maryland State Police also actively participates in the National State Police and Provincial Planners, International Association of Chiefs of Police, and the Maryland Association of Police Planners. These groups discuss and share information about cutting edge best practices, relevant court decisions, and policy to keep our agencies at the forefront in providing professional policing services. The Maryland State Police is nationally accredited by the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies, CALEA. This credentialing authority was created through the joint efforts of law enforcement's leading professional associations, which include the International Association of Chiefs of Police, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, the National Sheriff's Association, and the Police Executive Research Forum. This independent review process focuses on a set of national best practice standards that cover a wide range of public safety disciplines. To receive and maintain accreditation, the department must consistently assess and prove compliance with policies and procedures. In the advanced law enforcement accreditation pro process, there are 459 standards that must be met. Communication and training standards are included in that process. This third party validation process helps us ensure that we are delivering high quality public safety services to the citizens of Maryland. With regard to our use of force policies, the Maryland State Police has a number of processes in place to ensure our personnel are properly trained and are following the laws and policies. These policies also ensure our training is duplicated by a trooper's actions in the field. We have a use of force committee that reviews every use of force by our troopers. And if you would like further information on our annual use of force analysis, our 2018 and 2019 reports can be found on the public online at the Maryland State Police website. 
I'd also like to make a quick statement about training. Previous internal review processes of use of force incidents have revealed the need for focused de-escalation training. As such, the Maryland State Police provides that training at entry level and once every two years. Implicit bias training is also provided at entry level and is required annually, exceeding the Maryland Police Training Commission standards. By law, every trooper must live in the state of Maryland. There are 1,462 state troopers who live and work in every county in Baltimore City. Each and every one of us are Marylanders whom you represent. And according to the Maryland Police Training and Standards Commission, there are over 16,000 certified police officers in the state of Maryland. The men and women testifying before you today are responsible for providing these law enforcement officers with a work environment where they may com competently and confidently offer the public safety services they are sworn to provide. As public servants, we must work together to accomplish this responsibility. It is our joint obligation to provide the best possible public safety services to all citizens in a safe, consistent manner with integrity, honor, and fairness. On behalf of the Maryland State Police, I am willing to meet with any members of this work group at any time to discuss ideas and provide input that would assist this group in formulating an improvement plan. Communication is critical to ensure that any ideas when put into practice do not create unintended consequences that undermine the vision for improved accountability for policing. I look forward to this collaboration for the sake of public safety and on behalf of those who provide the services and those whom receive them. Ma'am, at this point, I'd be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will start. I have a question for you and I don't know if you are aware but back in June, uh, June 16th, the Speaker of the House sent a letter to the governor, uh, it was signed by, I think, 98 members of the House, and asked that he sign an executive order um, because he could do that over all state-controlled law enforcement agencies, which would include your purview, um, and require that some of the best practices, some of which you've, are, you've mentioned, um, uh, be followed and so they would be mandated. So some of them were require that deadly force is only used to stop an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury to the officer or citizen, require a duty to intervene for those police officers who see another officer using force beyond what is objective, objectively reasonable under the circumstances, implement an early warning system to identify excessive incidents involving use of force and immediately retrain that officer. Mm -hmm. Ban shooting at vehicles unless the vehicle is clearly being used for deadly force against an officer or another person and require that every officer within a state law enforcement agency sign an affirmative written sanctity of life pledge. Um, and finally, we, we were asking those, everyone who signed a letter uh, to ban the use of chokeholds for any state law enforcement officer. So I understand you're not looking at this right now, but if you could give your thoughts on that, um, would you have a problem if that was, those those things were mandated um, to be required by, as opposed to just having them as policies, but we put them into law and mandated that all state police agencies um, had to do those things. Yes, ma'am. Uh, many of those uh, concerns that were raised through that letter have already been addressed through policy changes uh, with the, uh, the Capitol Police, the Maryland Transit Administration, the Maryland Transportation Authority, Natural Resources Police, and the Maryland State Police. And I, I can certainly forward you a copy of those revisions if, if you need, ma'am. Yes. They are extensive. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, does anyone else have any uh, questions for the superintendent? Delegate Barnes? Oh, I see. You did tell me you had a question. I just see it. Thank you so much, uh, Colonel, and I appreciate your presentation. You know, uh, as the chair of the Maryland Legislative Black Caucus, I have had numerous conversations uh, with uh, you guys in the past uh, in regards to uh, implicit bias, uh, diversity and inclusion, and some of the things that uh, you guys were going through as far as uh, dealing with some of the black troopers or police officers there. Uh, and more importantly, I wanted to get your view on 
Uh, what are you guys doing as far as training and uh, uh, some of the mental health issues and trauma that you uh, guys are dealing with? I, I can speak specifically to use of force if that's the best place to go, sir. You have a lot of details wrapped in there. Um, but with, with use of force, you know, this was mentioned earlier where, you know, after a crisis occurs and one of our troopers is involved in a use of force incident, we automatically put them out of the workplace for a period of time. And one of the first things that's done within that first 24 hours is we have an agency physician and we make an appointment for that trooper or a number of troopers, if multiple troopers are involved, to, to see him and make sure that the appropriate psychological services are provided before any assessments made to whether that person can and will return to full duty in that immediate future. Okay, and, and can you speak on the diversity and inclusion within your agency? Uh, we can speak at, at the sense of the uh, recruiting and hiring, retention, is that is that the angle you yes, want to hear that? Okay. We have a, a very comprehensive civilian and sworn uh, recruiting plan. Uh, as you all know, uh, it's very difficult um, and it has been for some time absent what's currently going on, um, societal uh, issues that have been raised uh, to, to recruit and retain employees. Uh, they jump around a lot to other agencies and uh, we have a very comprehensive plan that starts at the recruiting level. There's, there's mentorships that are associated with that. And we are in the process right now of building a comprehensive wellness program to try to bring these folks in. Uh, just this past weekend, uh, we, we had a, a women's uh, event out in Sykesville and had 23 young ladies to come out and get them interested. And that's a, a program we're gonna do as we do the move, move around to the different underrepresented groups to try to build our, our uh, diversity within our ranks. Colonel, if you can get a copy of that recruiting plan over to the chairwoman, along with your ranking structure, it will be greatly appreciated. Yes, sir. I can provide that for sworn and civilians. They are very comprehensive and I'll get that, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, seeing no more questions. Thank you very much, Superintendent. We appreciate your time today. My pleasure, thank you. Next uh, work group, we are gonna have a presentation by retired uh, Captain Sonia Pruitt. She was with Montgomery County Police Department and the past chair of the National uh, Black Police Association. And I know you've been on since one too, so I appreciate <laughs> your patience um, with the work group uh, on this important issue and we thank you for being here. So with that, I will let you um, take it over. Thank you. Um, are you all able to hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, it's my pleasure to be here and, uh, and it's okay that I had to wait because this is a, an important discussion that we're having today. I usually am one of those people who speaks extemporaneously. You know, I can just talk about anything. But this was so, so important to me that I actually wrote it down because I did not want to miss any of the really important thoughts that I had and, and the thoughts of my peers that I've discussed this really critical topic with. So here we go. First, I want to thank everyone for having us again and uh, Madam Chair for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to speak to you today from a professional as well as a professional lens. And it's really unfortunate that we're having to have these conversations in the midst of some really turbulent times in our country. But you know, I always think that sometimes it's just an opportunity it's not just something negative, there's an opportunity. And so we're gonna see this as an opportunity to finally address some ills that affect the relationship between the police and the community in this country and, this, and particularly in the state of Maryland. Again, my name is Sonia Pruitt. I'm a retired captain from Montgomery County Police. My last assignment was as a sworn, as a sworn officer was as captain of um, and director of community engagement. That's where my heart lies which is in service to the community. I speak having worn many hats as a sworn officer. My experience includes criminal investigations, background investigations and hiring, public information, internal affairs, and commanding a police district. I'm also currently a professor at Montgomery College in Maryland in the field of criminal justice. My bachelor's degree is in criminal justice and my graduate degree is in forensic psychology which is the study of psychology as it relates to criminal law and justice. So you can probably tell that I'm really into this whole law enforcement and policing thing and public safety. 
and the general welfare of the police and the community. But now I've thrown my hat after, well, since retirement into this social justice realm. Because like many community members and other police officers, I am exhausted about the abuses of poor, vulnerable, black and brown people in this country. Many times in the company of and at the hands of police. So I never say to anyone, but you know, there are good police officers, but that's a given, right? Those officers and their attempts to uphold the goodness of law enforcement are not why I am here today. My experience here today is that I have witnessed defensiveness from some of my peers that have testified earlier and not an acknowledgement or embrace of the needs of the public for whom the police work. I have not witnessed an understanding of what we are truly dealing with here. And I'm not here to paint a glowing picture of policing, nor am I here to talk about what are termed a few bad apples. Because in my opinion, there's a whole police apple cart out there. <laughs> and the apple cart has a bunch of apples in it, many at the bottom that are decayed and they've got worms. And if you turn over the apple cart, you'll find some good apples, but they are overwhelmed by the rot and the decay. And that rot and that decay would be our systemic policing culture. The cart itself is the criminal justice system as we know it. It's the policing culture that is the spine of policing issues that we are forced to confront today. And my goal is to bring you the benefit of my experience of 28 years of law enforcement and the combined experience of several police executives and leaders in the state of Maryland. So policing is a noble profession, right? My father was a police officer, so I'm legacy. He was an MP first in the army and then he served for 25 years in Washington, DC. I believe in policing. I believe in what we were meant to do. There's a man called Sir Robert Peel who is acknowledged as the father of modern day policing. And in the 1800s, he created what you may know as the Bobbies in the UK. He's also the author of the Peelian principles described as the philosophy he developed to define an ethical police force. The principles were based on policing by consent, the public consent, meaning accountability, transparency, legitimacy, and integrity in policing were key. And principle number two says, police at all times should maintain a relationship with the public that gives reality to the historic tradition that the police are the public and the public are the police. The police are only members of the public who are paid to give full-time attention to duties which are incumbent on every citizen. In other words, we work for the public. It is not the other way around. And so when the public asks for something, we should take a look at it and say, hey, we need to find a way to make this happen as long as it's reasonable. And I think that what the public is asking for now is very reasonable. Those who are familiar with policing culture may have heard mention or talked about the thin blue line. The full reference says that it is the thin blue line between order and chaos. To indicate that the police are what stands between what sounds like heaven or hell seems misplaced during this time in 2020 when we should be standing and working for peace and unity within our communities, not against them. What we are seeing now in the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many others, and the recent injury to to Joshua in Kenosha, Wisconsin, I'm sorry, Joshua Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin, highlights some very stark realities. Two nights ago, protesters were shot and two killed by an armed white vigilante who was part of a group whose help with the protest was reportedly welcomed by the police. There is video of officers giving the shooter water and telling the group, thank you. On the shooter's page, he writes, Facebook page, duty, honor, courage, and blue lives matter. When George Floyd was murdered, officers across the country knelt and put their fists into the air also until police unions threatened actions against them and cries for Black Lives Matter became back the blue and Blue Lives Matter became a rallying cry for the disillusion in policing. The deaths and assault that I just referenced are violations of trust. They are not new. They occur in police departments and law enforcement agencies agencies all around the country and all over the world. This is not just a US issue. 
In my role as a retired police captain and now social justice engineer, I have been in contact with peers, not only in the United States, but also in the United Kingdom, in Canada, in Brazil, in South America, and the Caribbean. They report the same policing concerns of unnecessary use of force and abuses of power as we experience here in the United States. So how do you address today's policing issues, which have been issues for so long? First, by understanding where the issues originate. And that was something else that was missing in today's conversation. We don't talk about the history of policing. The negative aspects of police culture create structures that are different from society at large, such as clannishness, nepotism, favoritism, isolation from the public, cynicism, discrimination, and harassment of other officers even, and the destructive blue wall of silence. These negative characteristics are what sustains officers who police and work with bias and with a lack of ethics or integrity. And that doesn't mean all officers, again. It is a system whereby officers and executives who should handle complaints of wrongdoing with equity and fairness, sometimes instead turn a blind eye or even contribute to the wrongful treatment of the public. And even black, brown, LGBTQ and women officers because of their investment in and fear of the blue wall will sometimes participate with those who want to do to always do what is fair and just in policing, the blue culture chews them up and spits them out, much like it does policy and training. These things are at the root of the issues between police and community today. It did not just start yesterday or with a few bad apples. This culture began way back more than 400 years ago when my ancestors were oppressed as slaves. And I say my ancestors because my ancestors, ancestors hail from the coast of West Africa. They were brought to the coast of North Carolina where I grew up. More than 300 years ago, slave patrols were created to formalize the enforcement of the system of racial slavery and oppression. This mind think and way of policing has flourished, not disappeared through reconstruction, through Jim Crow and black codes, through sundown towns, through the civil rights movement, through the fake and unproductive war on drugs, through several versions of law and order that strip black and brown citizens of their rights. So where we are today in 2020, where unidentified agents can be sent into cities to violate the first and fourth amendment rights of protesters where hundreds of police officers can be bound, found venting their frustrations in white supremacist groups on social media, and where a man can lose his life at the knees of a police officer over the report of a counterfeit $20 bill while calling for his deceased mother. Where a citizen backing the blue can mean you think it's okay to help the police oversee protesters and kill a couple of them in the process where unions work outside the scope of due process and basic protections for officers to push agendas that usually only benefits the officers that represent the majority demographic in policing. Where the injured and maybe deceased suspect has their backgrounds laid bare before the public when the offending officer's background is protected from public view. This is policing culture. Being told by the nation's top lawman that if the police are not respected, Communities might find that they will go unprotected. Suggesting that compliance keeps you safe when we see time and time again that it does not. Saying blue lives matter when we say black lives matter. And saying America is appalled when we say the black community is appalled. While we talk about police reform, what we need to identify is that we have systemic issues Racism being one of the most harmful, which is a part of all the systems that should uplift the people in our country, education, finance, housing, transportation, and health care. Policing is the enforcement arm of all of these systems, which is why it's so easy for white people to call the police when black people are doing benign things like walking or jogging or, or bird watching. That's why it's called institutional racism in the police department. And it's one of the leading causes of the abuses and police brutality and excessive force that we are still seeing today. And I'm starting to wind down. 
This is an attempt to hold on to an uneven power structure that has existed for more than 400 years. So to say that we need to take it slow or wait or what's going to happen, we don't really have time for that. So we're here to talk about next steps, right? Next steps need to be swift and hard. Lives are in the balance. The health and well-being of officers who are doing their best to work in integrity are at stake and the health and well-being of our citizenry. So in my current work to address these pressing issues, I have teamed with law enforcement officials to discuss solutions and develop strategies. One of these teams is a team of high ranking black police executives and officials from the state of Maryland. We have been speaking for several weeks now because we recognize that we needed to have a body of professionals and experts who have actual buy-in in police reform and completely understand law enforcement and what is at stake. We call ourselves the Conscious Leaders Group and we are dedicated to police reform and accountability in Maryland. We represent the Vanguard Justice Society of Baltimore, the Blue Guardians of Baltimore, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives Maryland Chapter, and the National Black Police Association Baltimore Chapter. I am humbled to represent them today and hope we can come back for you to meet all of us. It would take hours to share with you our concepts that we develop, and since we don't have time, I'm going to share with you the more critical ones that we have for police reform. And, and please understand that these are not all inclusive. Number one, we would like to see auditing of police records by an independent source for all law enforcement agencies in the state of Maryland. And what would they audit? They would audit the review of use of force reporting to understand in Maryland, what type of force is being used most and the demographics of all involved. Legislators, you may consider standardizing use of force statutes across the state so that we can have some consistency. We would all also like to see a, an audit of hiring, promotion, retention, training, assignment, and discipline of police officers so that we will know when and why officers are not succeeding, as well as why black, brown, and female officers at all ranks are not representative of the communities of Maryland, because they are not. It is a myth that these recruits are not available for hiring. It is that they are being removed from the process unfairly. You don't need an expert to see that it is happening. People just need to be willing to accept that it is happening. And finally, an audit of the processes, results of, and discipline as a result of internal affairs complaints. A second ask is a line-by-line -line review of the LEOBR, as we've been talking about today, to identify where changes can be made that will instill public trust, but still off offer officers sufficient due process. We also contend that, that abolishing the LEOBR would likely give chiefs and sheriffs more power to hand down discipline, not less. Three, a detailed examination of the processes and staffing of the Maryland Police Training and Standards Commission including its demographic makeup, hiring, appointment processes, and standards. Number four, a mandatory, a mandatory use of consistent early warning systems for officer complaints for all of the state's law enforcement agencies. Some officers will have a pile of complaints. This is not just in Maryland, but across the country. And we want to know, well, why are they still the police? Number five, a review of the psychological assessment used to determine bias and implicit association for all police employees at hiring. And in addition, a request that that psychological testing and implicit bias training be consistently conducted at intervals, but no more than every three years. I'm on my last page. Number six, elected and high ranking officials, both civilian and law enforcement, should be held accountable for all of the asks, our asks, your asks, <laughs> by state mandate. For all of these asks, we would also ask that the power of the legislature can connect failure to achieve goals or benchmarks in police reform be tied to state funding for those law enforcement agencies. Number seven, the creation of a statewide task force of accountability through the state's office of the inspector general for police involved shootings in custody deaths and use of force. Number eight, civilian oversight with subpoena power well-publicized public hearing boards, and more participation for citizens in a transparent investigative process. Number nine, 
an ability for citizens to be advised of the rationale behind decisions for and appeal internal affairs complaints. And number 10, every law enforcement agency should be required to abide by whistleblower mandates so that officers can feel empowered and protected to address and report misconduct, not have actions against them for, for reporting. So as you can see, we have taken this work seriously and we hope that you took some copious notes. We look forward to feedback and the ability to continue to contribute to the work of the work group. Police officers tend to look for and depend upon the justification after a deadly situation. But justify doesn't mean necessary and justify almost never means justice for a whole people. We think justice is reasonable when lives are at stake. And I contend we stop talking and get to action because as Frederick Douglass stated, power concedes nothing without a demand. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Captain Pruitt. Um, and thank you again for being here. I my one ask of you, um, I tried to take copious notes, but I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't keep up. So if you don't mind, could you, the list that um, you and the Conscious Leaders Group came up with, do you mind sending that to me and I can get it out to the group? I know you have my Absolutely. email. Thank you. Um, I just had a couple of quick questions and if anybody else has any questions, please let me know. Um, so are the members of your group current law enforcement folks, um, retired law enforcement folks or a mixture? I'm the only retired person. Okay. So then this probably answers my next question, which <laughs> is, are there black and brown officers? And I suspect female officers who in this movement that we're in today and in the past feel that they can't speak up for changes that they believe are necessary within the police, police department because they fear of retaliation or um, you know they could be put up on a trial board for some minor infraction um, as retribution by the chief or is, is that, does that happen? It happens quite a bit and, and more than we like. Um, if I can speak personally, it took me 20, 27 years to make captain. I'm the first African-American uh, woman captain for the Montgomery County Police Department. Um, the struggle wasn't because I was not qualified. I was way qualified. The struggle was because I was also very outspoken. And so when you are outspoken as a police officer, you get to pay for that. You get to pay for it in lack of promotion, a lack of assignment, isolation, um, you're labeled any number of things. I couldn't even get my foot out, out, of, out of the retirement door before uh, there were rumors flying that I must have committed a criminal act in, because I was retiring. Those are the things that we deal with on a constant basis and every day. Um, and my last question is, so, where the police department suffers along with other uh, places in society from systemic racism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I could be optimistic on one hand and say, we can put all these policies and procedures and new way of doing things. We could, we could you know, de-escalation training, uh, you know, sensitivity training, cultural training, and all these things. And, and that will help. But in your opinion, are there just some folks where, you know, this is me being pessimist, that, you know, all the training in the world, all the cultural diversity and sense of training, sensitivity training in the world is not going to change their opinion about brown and black people. And I say that because <clears throat> I attended, when I was in college, I attended the College of William Mary, and I, I recall vividly in a small summer, because uh, I didn't want to come home for the summer, I stayed and took <laughs> one class, and uh, we, it was some sociology class, and I recall, and I was shocked, and this is, you know, part of my, I guess, naivete at the time growing up here, and, and where I wasn't exposed to this, thankfully, you know, just all of the white students were like, you know, my, my grandfather, my father, they call black people the M word, just, that's just how they, they talk about us. And they thought, you know, a, just a long laundry list of, of negative things about us. And so I'm wondering, you know, 
do you think that we can actually through what we're trying to do with some of this training fix systemic racism or just or regardless of collective bargaining agreement if some people are just racist they just need to go mm. um that was kind wow. of a long yeah. rant <laughs> it's okay <laughs> Uh, I get where you're going, though. And, and so I think I hear you saying, is this a hopeless situation? And neither neither myself nor any of the people that I team with think that this is a hopeless situation or we would never sit down at the table. We, I think when I began speaking, I talked about there always being opportunity. Here is an opportunity now. The George Floyd death, as a matter of fact, as, as horrific as that, that was a murder, as horrific as that was, it's an opportunity because it opened the eyes of a lot of people. Unfortunately, in policing, the culture is so deeply ingrained and, and so well entrenched. And, you know, it's like the, I always liken it to the claws on a, a predator bird hanging on a branch. You just ain't gonna let go. I think that with uh, the right uh, pressure, changes in laws, uh, looking at our hiring, because, you know, you're right. You can't change what's inside of a person. They have to want to change that themselves. But the, but the thing that you can do is you get them out of that apple cart I talked about, or you don't hire them at all. And so when we talk, when we asked for demographics surrounding hiring, that also includes who are the people hiring? Do they have biases? Mm -hmm. Why can't we get black people or brown people or women into the door? What's happening in it, at the point of hiring, at the point of training, uh, 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 at the point of, of just going through the background process? That's how we're losing people. And it's not always because they deserve to be lost. It's because someone does not want them there. And I, I would- But yes, I am hopeful to answer your question. <laughs> uh, one more thing, and I see Delegate Barnes has uh, something to say, right? Is that correct, Barn? Okay, I didn't know if that was old or not. <laughs> um, but I will say um, that, well, I just lost my train of thought trying to read the chat, so never mind. <laughs> um, but so I'll let uh, Delegate Barnes go. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Ms. Pruitt, for being here today and hanging in there with us. So now you know what we go through on a <laughs> on a day to day basis. Uh, but I, 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 my, I guess my comment is really more of a, a statement and that's just to say thank you for your willingness to speak up. Uh, I always say there's two sides to every story or two sides to a coin. And we heard one side today that said, you know, we need to stick with the status quo. Uh, things are not as bad as we may think they are, uh, but it's always good to have a different perspective uh, to say that, you know, you guys may want to look in this direction here. And if you heard my, my comments or question to uh, Colonel Jones at the uh, state troopers uh, police was because the Black uh, Police Association has come to me as the chair of the Black Caucus and said there are some systemic racism uh, that is plaguing our police departments. Uh, there are implicit bias in which our police officers are not getting trained or promoted. Uh, there are things that are going on with our police department, which then leads back to the trauma and mental health issues in which once performs at a different level uh, when they are out patrolling. And all of those things have an adverse effect when that trooper or that police officer pulls up to someone that may be having a bad day along with that police officer that then triggers something inside them to act a certain way. Uh, and all of those things are holistic in what we're trying to get accomplished here. Part of that is yes, the police accountability, I mean, the uh, law enforcement bill of rights, but there are so many issues and so many layers uh, that we need to drill down to really get our arms around. How do we fix this problem uh, that we have uh, within our, uh, the black community and the community at large? Uh, as I indicated, you know, as a black man, you know, I should not have to fear the police. I should not have to cringe when that siren goes off behind me and I automatically have to put two hands on the wheel and make sure that I'm buckled up tight and, and everybody else in the car is doing what they're supposed to. And I got to say yes, sir, or, or yes, ma'am, uh, when they come in and hoping that they're having a wonderful day 
uh, so what, it does not trigger them uh, to do certain things. So I mm -hmm. applaud you for your, your comments and your bravery. Uh, and I would love for you to come speak uh, before the Black Caucus uh, on some of these issues and your experiences, uh, which would give some greater insight uh, to us as we start to deliberate on our 2021 legislative priorities as it centers around police accountability. Along with, I will be inviting uh, Karen Kruger uh, to also come and speak on some of the same issues as it relates to uh, the Maryland Law Enforcement Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I don't see any other questions. So again, thank you very much, Captain Freud, and thank you uh, for your time. I know it was thank a little you. long, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, work group members, next we have a presentation by the Maryland Troopers Association, who I see is present, uh, Byron Warnkin and Rebecca Smith. Uh, welcome, and you all have been waiting a long time too, so thank you very much uh, for your patience. And with that, I think, uh, Mr. Warnkin, you're going to go first. Yes, yes, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak here today. I'm going to be relatively brief because the hour is getting late. Um, the Maryland Troopers Association is over 2,500 retired and active Maryland State Troopers, the largest labor organization within the Maryland State Troopers. We do not do the collective bargaining for the troopers, however. Um, my law firm, myself, my partner, Rebecca Smith, we have represented the, um, the troopers since 1998 and have done quite a few, um, over a thousand um, investigations per, um, under the LEOBR. So we've got some, we got some experience here. I, I, my initial plan had been to uh, kind of give you the history and the nuts and bolts, the X's and O's, the way that Mike Davey did. Um, but Mike's already done that. So I don't think that's necessary. I think what might be a little more helpful is for me to just kind of speak um, pretty freely on kind of what I, the, the world that I see um, without LEOBR, because we've had to do some, you know, a lot of thinking about that based on the conversation that's happening um, in this state and nationally. Um, and and I, I understand the perspective of many of your constituents, my friends, my colleagues, you say, okay, with, with everything going on in society, this is the profession that has a Bill of Rights. I mean, I understand that perspective. And I think, it's number one, it's an unfortunate name. Number two, um, it, it, it wouldn't, it would never be a Bill of Rights passed in this day and age. So I think it's important to look at the, the 1970s and 1960s and why it happened and why it's called a Bill of Rights. And it really does, and, and, and Mike Davey touched on this, I, I won't belabor the point, but it really does relate to Garrity. Um, what was happening was troopers, uh, law enforcement generally, in the 60s were being told, um, yes, you have the right to remain silent, but if you do, you're getting canned. And so that, and that was the climate. And, if, and anecdotally, when you talk to um, law enforcement members who were on the job then, um, that was kind of, they'll tell you that, that no procedures were followed, they, you know, um, they didn't, they didn't have rights. And that's why Garrity paved the way for the LEOBR. Garrity paved the way for, um, for, for, um, for basically the codification of some of the rights that exist with or without LEOBR. So, you know, we've been doing this since 1998. We have never operated in a world without LEOBR. So we just had a very blank slate discussion of, okay, well, if LEOBR was repealed, where, are the, where, where does this due process live? And what would we tell someone? Because we're still gonna get, the, the, the trooper's still gonna call us and they're gonna say, they're not gonna say, I have an interrogation upcoming. What are my rights? Talk, you know, help me talk through this. Um, they're gonna say, well, I've just been told that I need to be in my commander's office in five minutes. And what do I do? What do I do? And, and we don't know what they're being accused of. They don't know what they're being accused of. 
my my best advice, I mean, I'm an attorney, I've got an obligation to these clients. My best advice is remain silent because you can be charged with a crime based on everything, based on anything that you say. So remain silent. Um, and I think, I don't believe, and, and, and look, I'm here on behalf of the Maryland Troopers Association because so I can say that I'm, I'm um, biased in this, but I don't believe that repealing LEOBR actually does, it, it doesn't capitalize on this opportunity that, um, that, that uh, Captain Pruitt talked about. I mean, and Captain Pruitt's a tough act to follow here. I mean, uh, you know, that, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, it, it's, it, it's, it, it, in some ways, I think it wastes an opportunity because there are, it, it's not going to produce real change. It's going to produce lowly lawyers like me saying, remain silent because your rights can be violated. Um, and, and I don't think less rights, generally speaking, um, is ever the way to um, taking away things is, is, is not the way to, to get what we want here. I think so, a lot of the, the, the transparency um, elements that Captain Pruitt talked about, that would produce some actual real change. It would take some time, but that would produce real change. Um, with that, generally speaking, I'm, just, I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to my colleague, Ms. Mo Ms. Smith, so that she can tell you exactly what she's seeing day to day as she's out there in interrogations and and uh, hearing boards with the with specifically with the Maryland State Police. Thank you. My name's Rebecca Smith. I handle the day to day operations for the Maryland Troopers Association with respect to interrogations and trial boards and things of that nature under LEOBR. So in my experience, the Maryland State Police is by the book and tough on its officers. The state police has a lot of things already in place that they're not required to have in place under LEOBR to try to help with some of the issues that we're dealing with this session coming up. One of which is, I think Mr. Davey mentioned this earlier, is the Penalty Assessment and Review Committee, which is nicknamed PARC. So what this committee does, is it ensures discipline is just and fair across all troopers in the Maryland State Police. It is made up of the Chief of Staff, who is a civilian, all Lieutenant Colonels, the Commander of Fair Practice, who is a civilian employee of the Maryland State Police, the Commander of the Personnel Command, and the Director of Human Resources, who is also a civilian member of the Maryland State Police. PARC meets to discuss and determine what a proposed disciplinary recommendation should be once a trooper is charged with misconduct or a violation of policy. PARC considers such things as transparency, fair and consistent application of discipline, motivation behind the alleged violation of misconduct, the degree of harm of the misconduct, an employee's experience within the agency, intentional versus unintentional errors, and the trooper's past disciplinary record. It is also my belief that there is a misconception that trial boards favor police officers. This is simply not my experience with the Maryland State Police. In my experience, it is infinitely easier to win a criminal case than to win a trial board at the Maryland State Police. Trial boards conducted under LEOBR means I have a fight on my hands. The burden of proof is the preponderance of the evidence standard, which means it's more likely than not that the violation of policy occurred. So 51%, which is a, it's, a, it's not a tough burden for them to meet, being the prosecutors. As Mr. Davey also mentioned, the rules of evidence are also relaxed making it easier for the state police to find troopers guilty and hold them accountable for violations of policy. With respect to trial boards, the state police have had open trial boards since before the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights required them to be open. As Mr. Davey stated in my experience, um, the colonel can increase, decrease, or approve a punishment from the trial board. I've been doing this work through four colonels. And in my experience, I have never seen the colonel decrease a punishment that was recommended by the trial board. Some smaller things I wanted to point out based on my experience is that if a supervisor in the Maryland State Police fails to take a complaint that's coming in from a citizen, that supervisor will then be put under investigation for that failure. And again, if 
a, a, a law enforcement officer is charged with a felony criminally, the colonel of the Maryland State Police has the discretion and usually takes this discretion to suspend that person without pay. Also, if that person's found guilty of a felony, there is no LEOBR. The colonel will terminate without that. Um, so based on that, if there's any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Uh, Thank we you. do have uh, a couple questions. Delegate Barnes. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chair. And I, I guess, Mr. Warkin, uh, I was listening to your, your, your remarks and I understand that you are an attorney representing the troopers uh, and you have a job to do uh, and so do we. So I, I'm, I'm just trying to understand if the uh, law enforcement bill of rights was repealed in the state of Maryland, uh, would you not uh, learn some of the lessons of other states that do not have a law enforcement bill of rights? A good question, and I and I think it relates a little bit to the the question that uh, Delegate Acevedo has asked a couple people, um, because you'd say, well, aren't aren't the rights still there? Isn't the due process still there? And isn't that due process doesn't that live in other states where there is no codified LEOBR? And the answer is, and, and you know, typical lawyer answer, but the answer is, I don't know because we don't know exactly the way it will occur. We don't know how these rights will be upheld. But one thing that we do know is just because they're, people are entitled to, to rights doesn't mean they get them. So uh, there's no way to, you know, there, there's no way to answer it. Uh, I know that um, states without LEOBR are, there's somehow these due process protections still exist. But, and, I, and, and, and you know, you said you have a job to do, and um, I don't mean to tell you how to do your job, <laughs> any members of the work group. Um, I wouldn't tell you how to do yours. <laughs> um, but at, at the same time, I guess I, I, guess I will. <laughs> like, why, wh I would use this time to take control of the matter and not have to see how 150 different agencies do it and then, and then codify something so that abuses on the other side stop, because there would be abuses on the other side because you'd be taking away rights. So, you know, and that's the complex problem, right? That's why I don't envy you guys because that figuring out that balance is is, is up to us here, but I, or up to you here. But I, you know, I, I I can't know the answer to that. I, I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, it, it doesn't, but I, I think that. Uh, looking at the civil unrest around the country today uh, and looking at what Marylanders are asking us to do, and that is to really look at the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights. And in some cases, they are asking that we repeal the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights. Uh, and in a lot of cases, we will take the lessons learned from other states that do not have a Law Enforcement Bill of Rights to try to figure out what we can learn from what they have done to what we may be able to implement here in the state of Maryland. Your job would be, uh, as far as representing them, would be to look at whatever or help us provide some intel, some, some, some uh, to have a seat at the table to say, here are some thoughts, should or if you guys repeal that, here are some things that we would really think is important that we keep in that, in that, in that, in law. Uh, that way we can have a more holistic conversation to ensure that we are moving in the right direction, whether we keep it or we do not, whether we, whether we make some changes or we don't. But I think it's a conversation based on your experience, based on your knowledge, that I think that you could help us to say, here is a direction that I think you guys should go, right? But I don't want to tell you how to do your job. I just want to make sure that we're moving in the right direction that makes sense. I understand. And thank and you. Thank you. Uh, Delegate Fisher. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, this is directly for um, Ms. Smith. I was sharing, um, there was recently 
um, in the news. Um, yeah, so I'm sorry, um, Trooper Sullen, who's still being paid by Maryland State Police for making up six different cases with, with a non-existent defendant. So I think, you know, the rhetoric around that the troopers are, you know, they are well-trained. I've had trials with troopers, but to act like every agency is perfect and there's nothing that needs to be changed. I mean, this is someone who has the public trust who literally made up defendants, right? To issue tickets for. And, um, and thank God he didn't use actual real people's lives, but made up a defendant. And this is what our, the public and to, to echo the concerns of, um, Mr. Chair, Chair Barnes of the Black Caucus, you know, this is where the public trust stays. Why should someone like that, who's really making up tickets, who's, a, who's employed by uh, the Maryland State Police, still be collecting a salary from the taxpayer? And that's really the questions that the public wants us to ask you. So while I can't comment on Trooper Sullen directly, I will say that I think that Byron and I are fortunate dealing with the Maryland Troopers Association that we deal with a colonel who I think, you, as you've heard him say, he, he, he is open to having this conversation um, and making changes. And of course, no agency is perfect. Um, but I think that the state police at least sets a, a, a high standard that bringing the state police to the table can be helpful and useful to this conversation moving forward. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. If, I, if I can just expand briefly on that, uh, yeah. Delegate Fisher, we'd love to be able to talk further. But we, we cannot. We cannot. We are bound by law that we cannot. Do you have a follow up, Delegate Fisher? Do you need to be unmuted? Okay. Can we unmute Delegate Fisher? And I understand that's an individual pending case and you can't, but it's also in the Washington Post. And every person here that is elected is representing the people of Maryland. And that's what the people of Maryland are seeing. So I appreciate being open. But honestly, for me, the first remarks from Ms. Smith were troopers are perfect. Troopers are super trained. That's not you weren't saying we make mistakes and we all have room for improvement. And we're here on the table to find ways to improve. So that's why I highlighted that this this entire hearing is is on YouTube right now is being viewed by the public. And I think the public would be astonished if we sat here and didn't question you and tell you about the public's hearing about your agency and where their taxpayer money, their money is going. So that's why. I understand you can't talk about an individual case, but I'm saying that to you about the mentality of the public and that they're watching you right now. And for us to sit here and not mention that case, not question you on what's going on. Why is he still being paid? He's still, be he's still being paid. Right. He's probably not on the road. Obviously, whatever contract you all have in the terms, we get that. But we also have to explain this to the public so we can get the best policy. Understood. Uh, we do have two more questions. Delegate Acevedo and then Delegate McComas. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to just uh, circle back on. Um, Oh, you're muted. Somehow you got muted. Can we, oh, there you go. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Um, so I wanted to still go back on the comment made by the, uh, the gentleman with the Troopers Association about the LEOBR. Um, and I guess the difficulty that I and others are having with uh, this, this, this rationale, this excuse that um, if we were to uh, repeal the LEOBR, that somehow the sky would fall when we are looking at 30 something other jurisdictions that do not have an LEOBR, that somehow is managing to ensure that due process rights, particularly for law enforcement officers, uh, are being upheld. And I think the question now is not, uh, you know, whether or not to repeal the LEOBR, in my opinion, because those closest to the pain are closest to the solution. And what our communities are saying is that this fundamentally flawed law that provides procedural protections uh, well above what the public has uh, should go. Um, what we sh are here to discuss or, or, or how I see the work group is, well, what should that be uh, replaced with? If we're saying this is a fundamentally flawed law, if we're saying 
um, that, you know, uh, 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 we should repeal it. What we're trying to ensure is that we're having a discussion about what uh, that is replaced with. And I think that, like every other issue, um, we can certainly um, meet that challenge and figure out what it is, but it shouldn't be an excuse uh, as to why we shouldn't act when communities are asking us to act because they recognize that this law um, provides these undue pro procedural protections. They're not rights, they are procedural protections that the, the regular public do not have. And so I guess, what, 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 how, how do you reconcile it when you're looking at 30 something other jurisdictions that are functioning just fine, jurisdictions that are larger than ours without an LEOBR? Yeah, it makes sense. And, and I, I guess th there may be some, there, the, the question may be fundamentally flawed in some ways, I don't know, because I don't know that those jurisdictions, number one, are functioning fine. That said, absolutely the sky will not fall. I guess my point about the LAOBR is you've got these rights that are given via interpretation uh, by the Supreme Court and Garrity and all the cases that followed Garrity and use of force standards um, that can't, they come out of the Supreme Court. Those rights are 90% of the rights that troopers have in a, in a meaningful day-to-day -day context. LEOBR is, is something that is layered on top of that that provides, frankly, compared to those rights, very few rights compared to those rights. Delegate Acevedo, do you have a follow-up or? Uh, I, I, I don't, um, but you know, I, Again, I, I think that's that's what we're discussing here, right? If we were to take this action, what we're replacing it with, um, uh, and I think that's that's because what's what's wrong here is that we 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 have a system that in essence Im, Im, impedes, right? We all recognize that impedes. Well, speaking for myself, that we that that I recognize impedes uh, uh, a certain um, uh, actions from being taken. And the question is, what do we do to ensure that we're implementing a system that is much more better that would allow for us to root out crooked cops, as was mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. so that we're actually saving the profession? Because that's the, the, the job that we're trying to do here. If we're saying we want to build trust, you're not going to get trust without transparency, oversight, and accountability. And part of that is uh, uh, repealing and changing laws not just the LEOBR, but the MPI and others that prevent that kind of oversight, accountability. And in this case, that is the LEOBR. So I'm, I'm just having a difficult time understanding how other jurisdictions, it seems to me, um, are able to have various proceedings and whatnot uh, and not have an LEOBR. Uh, and I think we could look beyond that and figure out what that system looks like post repeal of an LEOBR. Okay, hey, Delegate McComas and then Delegate Rosenberg. One second, uh, Delegate McComas. Now, can you hear me? Yes, but we can't see you. Oh, uh, well, that, that's okay. Um, I, have, I have a question. Um, the, this is for either uh, Ms. Smith or Mr. Warkin. Um, is the LEOBR is really a procedural. It does not really add any rights that they wouldn't have without it. What it did was, is it basically laid out um, a, uh, a guide a roadmap as to how these cases and uh, the employee, um, when he gets, uh, what do I want to say, when, when his employment is questioned and his, he, whether he followed uh, policy and procedures in, the, in his duties, correct? Yes. Yes, that's correct. All right. So the so really um, so this so we really can't say well we need to throw it out because thirty some other states don't have it when we really don't know what they've done without it. Um, Maryland decided that it's a good idea to have it. So could it be that the public doesn't really understand what the law officer's bill of rights really is that they think it's something 
something magical that gives them a, a, a pass so they can be jerks and, and bastards and be, you know, discriminatory and be really obnoxious when they stop people. I mean, if the public really understood what it did, would they really be that upset? Do you think? I mean, I, I think that people don't, I mean, because because we're getting educated on this and it and it obviously has taken time and it's it's, you know, there's all these different steps and everything. And it has really nothing to do with the bucket of rights that they have. It just lays out the plan, how, how to proceed through the, through the hearing and, um, you know, what happens when. So because they're still responsible, if they, if they violate, they can get sued civilly. Um, they can be, be charged criminally, which are much more important for the serious things that we've seen with, with Mr. Floyd and with Mr. Blake and, and all the other folks that have been seriously impacted by police brutality. Um, so can you answer that for me? I know it's I, rambling, but I the, the point is, is if the public understood what the LEOBR does, um, they would understand that that's not the panacea and the solution. Uh, I mean, it's gonna look like, oh yeah, we all did something. We threw, we got rid of the LEOBR, but did we really do anything? Probably not. I, I largely agree with that, Delegate. Um, there are provisions in the LAOBR that may not follow that, and chiefs may have too much power. Um, but we're, I mean, we're talking tweaks, and, and I only know it from my perspective of advise, advising law enforcement officers. Um, so I, I do agree, and I, and I do think this would be a different conversation if a couple of those provisions didn't exist and if it was called police officer accountability. I mean, there's more, it, it's ways to make the officer talk in, in a lot. I mean, when it's read from that perspective, it's not, um, I don't know, it's, yeah. Well, well, the General Assembly is pretty good at, at uh, uh, fluffing up names and stuff and, and putting, putting a bow on, on, on something. So we, we do that all the time. And, and, and 50 years ago, um, that's probably where that, where that came from. Um, but it doesn't mean that there's a substantial amount of rights. Like I said to Delegate Acevedo, I, I really think most of the rights live in case law, not in um, these codifications. Delegate Rosenberg. Well. We can't hear you. Oh, there you go. There you go. Okay. I think Mr. Warnkin just answered my question by saying that the, the rights live in the case law, which we cannot affect because that's federal constitutional law, but that there's a procedural process that currently exists in LEOBR, which we could modify or do away with, looking at how it's done in other states. I mean, you're not advocating that we do away with it, but the constitutional rights are there regardless, and police officers, if there were no procedure, to find their way through in a more difficult way, shall we say. They might have to go to court to make sure their rights are protected if there isn't a procedure. Is that fair? Yes, that's fair. And also they, they may have to, I mean, they may have to be terminated um, for the exercise of their constitutional right to remain silent and then you know, pursue legal action against the state or against the municipality for the Afterwards, case. right. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, this question is for either Mr. Warkin or Ms. Smith. I mean, whether or not we're, we're debating repealing the LEOBR, um, I think the majority of folks on, on this work group, I, I'm, I'll speak for myself, are calling that we need to do something, whether we're talking about repealing it or strengthening it. And I think my colleague, you know, she kind of threw on there, you know, all of these other folks that have been impacted by police brutality 
don't know what the LEOBR means. So she's saying, therefore, we should do nothing. The fact that she can say all of the other folks impacted by police brutality means she at least knows it's a lot and it's significant. <laughs> and so that we have to do something. And I think what is being called for at the very least is to increase transparency and increase civilian participation in the process and do some things to strengthen the process so that civilians know what the process is, so that the public knows what the process is. Are, is there anything um, that, that you all think can be done to, to strengthen the process, uh, the procedural process for LEOBR, or you're, you're saying that you think it's fine the way it is, which if, if that's your view, that's your view. I'm not trying to, you know, push you in a direction or the other. I, I just want to get your, your, your take on it. I, I guess my, um, my, my take on that is that Captain Pruitt had a pretty impressive list of elements that, you know, of, of reforms that could make real progress. And from my perspective, any one of those things is going to do more than a repeal of, of LEOBR. I, th I think as a practical matter, I mean, auditing police records, standardized use of force, po I mean, it, it was an impressive list. And, you know, and I think that that is the kind of list that could bring about real change. So I, I'm not saying that there's no problems generally at all. I don't, I don't think that anyone's saying that. Um, well, I, I don't know. I don't want to speak for other people, but we're, we're certainly not saying that. What we're saying is that uh, repeal of LEOBR or, you know, it, you know, the um, previous reforms took it from 10 days to five days for the interrogation or, or you know, take it down to two days. I, I just don't, I don't think those are, eliminate that period entirely. I don't think those are real reforms. I don't think that's going to produce actual substantial results. I think that um, the list that I'll, that, that Captain Pruitt uh, put forth is far more likely to produce actual results. So again, not that there's no problem, just that LEOBR isn't the solution that, that people think that it is one way or the other. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Did I miss anyone? Okay, thank you. I know you two have been waiting a very long time as well. Thank you, we appreciate your time. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, work group to wrap it up and he has been waiting a long time too. So we appreciate uh, that is um, Mr. Brian Gill, who is the president of the State Law Enforcement Officers Labor Alliance. And as soon as he is unmuted, I will let him take it away. There you go. Oh. Uh, good evening, uh, Chair and Committee. My name is Brian Gill. I'm the president of the uh, State Law Enforcement Officers Labor Alliance, which um, is a bargaining unit for nine state law enforcement agencies. Um, I took over in July of this year. Um, we represent about 1,800 uh, police officers throughout the state of Maryland. Um, I'm also currently a proud member of the uh, Maryland State Police. I'm where I'm a first sergeant. I've been with the state police for approximately 22 and a half, a little more, half years. I am currently the assistant barrack commander at the uh, Center for Barrack, um, which is on the eastern shore of Queen Anne's and Kent County. This is where we work. Um, I firmly believe and support law enforcement officers bill right is as it current stands. It's a statute that provides police officers with due process um, prior to their discipline um, by the police agency they serve. It does not shield bad police officers from discipline or termination. It does not hinder um, the retraining officers. It does not prevent the prosecution or of for criminal actions, despite some of the claims that it does. Um, uh, LEOBR does, however, protect uh, police officers from politically uh, expedient decisions that were made re with no regard to facts or incidents, ensuring that the officers are provided a proper hearing and prior to disciplinary, prior to the disciplinary action. Uh, it was enacted due to fundamental understanding that police work is complex. Instantaneous decisions affecting public safety are required under stressful scenarios and should not be second guessed without careful deliberation. Um, false complaints are routinely filed against honest, 
effective officers um, because the criminal element understands that a complaint against an officer can remove them um, from the case that they are uh, working and ultimately affect the officer's career. Um, the, law, the law also recognizes and protects officers from decisions by elected officials seeking to appease an angry public, regardless of the facts or of the evidence that's in, being displayed. It does not shield or prevent officers from being sued civilly or charged criminally. Nothing in LEOBR prevents an agency from thoroughly investigating an allegation, interrogating, attaining accused officer statements, or charging an officer and scheduling a prompt uh, trial board. Most agencies in Maryland effectively discipline errant officers in full compliance with this statute. Investigations performed in a timely and professional manner often negate the need for a trial board hearing by uncovering facts which fully exonerate the officer with irrefutable um, and wrongdoing. In conclusion, the Maryland um, Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights is essential to stay in place as it provides much needed due process to law enforcement officers who must be judged when the facts and evidence of the matter. Law enforcement officers should still be held to the same level of innocence until proven guilty as those me members of the public they serve and protect, protect they have. Um, that's pretty much all I know most of LEOBR has been covered and uh, so I uh, that was our stance and I guess I can open a question. Do you have any? Thank you. Yes, Delegate Davis has a question. Officer Gill, um, or Trooper Gill, how would, how would you address um, the allegations of disparate treatment by, by the chiefs or commanders or whoever's in charge? Could, could you give me an example of what you're... The, the disparate punishment. Since, since there's no one who can, um, who, since the final arbiter is, um, the, uh, the, is the chief, I don't know what you call your, your guy. Superintendent. Superintendent. Since the final arbiter is the superintendent, when there are allegations of disparate treatment, maybe some officer, a female officer, was disciplined more harsh for the same incident, or a black or brown person was, was disciplined more harsh because of... Um, for different reasons. How do you address that? It has to be addressed if, if what you're saying is the purpose of LEOBR is to make sure that officers are protected. When you're protecting some officers and not others, you got to fix it. Well, first I would say that we, we, Maryland State Police has a committee that meets to talk about the discipline of officers. It's made up of um, our three lieutenant colonels, and there may be some more that are involved in it, but our, and they, that consists of a, a female lieutenant colonel, a black lieutenant colonel, and a white male lieutenant colonel. So I, I have not seen discipline being, um, being served in different ways. Um, being a black, brown, or a female officer being more harshly treated than anybody else. But there is also, uh, we have a, the state police has a, um, a fair practices bureau, which there is a sworn officer there, a uh, black female that she currently there that will, can help them process those, those complaints. And that's her sole job is to make sure that, that discipline and treatment of officers is all done fair across the board. I, I, I haven't seen, um, personally in my barrack, we have, a mixture between, um, uh, I have a black male, couple, couple black males, couple black, fe uh, couple females, and the, the, the discipline is not um, treated any differently. Um, Maryland State Police does really um, focus on fairness, integrity um, across the board. I don't know if that answered your question or you want me to expand more? You know, we, you don't have to ex expand more, but one of the previous presenters did say that there, he could see a problem. He could see that in his experience in trying these cases that there were, he could see some dis disparate treatment. And I'm just, at, you know, everybody has say, don't do something. Tell us how to fix this problem. Because there are, are minority officers who are complaining. So, I mean, if you have anything to offer to that, you know, you can, we can talk offline, but it's important that we not leave um, leave this unchecked. 
Well, well, what you're what you're talking about and in racial disparity, I, I would disagree. It has anything to do with LEOBR. If there is, um, again, most of the people that most of the commanders, most of the things that I've dealt with in my career in 22 years are not. They, you know, it, it is. We're all the same. We're all the same group. It's. I don't feel that I treat a, a black male or female officer any differently than anybody else. Um, and and that actually doesn't have anything to do with the rights LABR. I do think LABR will protect them so that they're they're not being charged unduly with something that you know they didn't get. And we also have the the, the ability to go back. And if there is um, an officer being treated poorly, they can, there, there is a complaint process and it's not, it's, it's not something I, like if someone was complaining on myself, I wouldn't know about it. It, it goes, so it's not something that they can say, you know, once I found out that uh, a particular officer is complaining on me that I can go and attack them. It's, uh, it, it is a secret process, I guess would be a better word that, you know, if there is a complaint on me that, and then, and, and the Maryland State Police will remove those people. If, if a female officer is complaining on me, I will be removed from being her supervisor and put in that place. Rip, rip. It has happened relatively quickly. The, the cases that you're discussing, I wouldn't, I'm not familiar. So I'd have to know a little bit more to say, hey, th- th- you know, this is the avenue they could have or should have took, but they have rights and protections. But I don't think that has much to do with LAOBR. All right, and just finally, um, so some of your colleagues believe it's a problem. So that's where we are. Okay. Um, I guess I'll have the last couple questions here. One, the um, local FOP folks indicated that there was a severe um, problem with timeliness of trial boards. Is that an issue at the state level? So I, I don't get the I, I don't see how how fast they 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 process them. I would say it probably is, um, they, and I'm sure that they could. I don't know. Like I'm not involved in that process where they um, like the case that we were hearing earlier. I, when you, you discussed earlier, I I was under the impression that that person you were discussing uh, wasn't being paid by the state, and I don't know any any differently. I'm not involved in it. Um, so I guess in my opinion, sure, they could, they could do things quicker, um, but okay. I'm not in that position to, to know how fast they're doing things. I think they want to do a good job and thorough job, and that's why they do it the way they do it. Okay, and just to kind of piggyback on um, the conversation you were having with Delegate Davis, do you know um, what the racial makeup of the state police is and the gender percentage? Uh, or- I, I, I truly don't know. I know um, we go above the Maryland average. Um, I believe as I heard a statistic the other day that about 8% of, or six, between 6 and 8% of uh, Maryland state troopers were females. Um, but I, I have not, I don't have those. I don't have that data. Okay. Are there any other questions for Mr. Gill? Thank you for your time. It was a long day. I appreciate it, Mr. Gill. Uh, Members of that concludes, I should say, the briefing today that began at 1 uh, (laughs) p.m. And I appreciate the work group and all of you um, staying on today uh, to discuss this important issue. Our next meeting will be on September the 17th at 1 p.m. It will not be five hours long. We will be hearing from the public defenders and from the state's attorneys. And I will circulate uh, the position of the state's attorneys that they are taking on um, the issues that we are taking a look at. So with that, thank you everyone, have a good evening. And thank you to our staff 